Bom dia, bom dia a todos, pessoal. É, vou falar em português, que é a língua que a maior parte de nós fala aqui. É, Good morning, I'll speak Portuguese. It's a pleasure to be chairing this uh, Brazilian histoplasmosis meeting uh, here in Porto Alegre. Um, é, é, como vocês sabem, esse evento está sendo transmitido pelo YouTube. As you all know, this meeting is being transmitted to YouTube in English, Spanish. People are asking me why I got interested in this for plasmosis. I have a training with a candidate and I went to the UK studying aspergillosis. My father had a histoplasma infection and he almost died. He had lymphedema chronic. His thigh was huge and his scrotum was huge too. And he would be losing lymph all the time and he had recurrent problems and then he started losing weight he had some skin lesions and nobody knew what he had nobody realized that that lymphatic loss led to very low cd4 levels his cd4 count was 200 but he had no aids curious isn't it then he was admitted to a hospital in the state of santa catarina and he was almost dying he was severely ill he had a miliary infiltrate mucosal lesions his skin lesions, but nobody had looked at his mucosa that went unnoticed so they did open lung uh, biopsy he had histoplasmosis but uh, back then nobody thought about that biopsy showed sarcoidosis they gave him a lot of steroids he was discharged he was happy and three days later he was in shock then i brought his lung fragment to Porto Alegre, we look at it and the pathologist told me, you know, there's histoplasma in his lung. By then, histoplasma was infiltrated into his bone marrow. He was the first uh, patient in the state of Santa Catarina to use ambisome and classical diagnosis. Then I said, that's a very serious disease. It's very lethal, late diagnosis. And that's the reason why I'm putting together this meeting. Without further ado, I'd like to thank our supporters and sponsors, CDC in Atlanta, GAFI, In Focus Latin America, Santa Casa de Porto Alegre, PAHO, the Brazilian Society of Infectious Diseases, Rio Grande do Sul Infectious Diseases Society, Natural Magical. The visionary aspect of really believing in this. I'd like to thank the sponsors, thank Imi, William Vista, and Isham. Without further ado, I'd like to call the first speaker, Dr. Chiller. Division at the CDC. Yeah, he's going to talk about the CDC view on histoplasmosis or the global. Uh, perception on uh, of histoplasmosis. Tom, please. Obrigado. Um, bom dia, bom dia. Uh, yo... Morning. Tá bom? Tá bom? Okay. Um, mejor que inglês. Portanto. I'll speak a mixture of Portuguese and Spanish. Welcome. It's nice to be back to Brazil. We haven't traveled for two years now. This is my first trip in more than two years. It's a pleasure to be in Brazil for this first trip. And it's a pleasure to talk about histoplasmosis, which is a disease we still have to struggle a lot against in order to prevent it. So the title is histoplasmosis, a global problem, searching for leaders. Where is histoplasmosis? We start with cases. These are three people with histoplasmosis and in common they have advanced HIV, skin lesions, reticular endothelial system issues, bone marrow 
problems, but the thing that is not common is that they live in different places. They have people from Colombia, Africa, and from Asia. So histoplasmosis is a global issue. We know that in the Americas where we are, it's really an endemic. And we have studied this. And in the Americas, we are known to have this as an endemic disease. Now, when we look at the number of cases, we conducted a study uh, 10 years ago, and they estimated that in HIV, maybe over 11,000 cases a year, mortality rate around 30%, and almost 5,000 deaths a year only in uh, HIV-related histoplasmosis. This is a Brazilian study. They found it everywhere in the country. And today, you're going to be listening about that. So this is not a problem only in Brazil or not only in the Americas. It affects many different places. In Africa, for example, few cases have been reported but they don't have many diagnoses either. So I think that we will find much more histoplasmosis cases in Africa. Very important is the way you diagnose this disease with rapid diagnosis and start treatment very quickly. You are all aware of that. That's why we are here. This is from a lab in Colombia, where you can see when they had quick tests, so they could have a quick histoplasma or histoplasmosis diagnosis, and you see when they had quick testing, the number of diagnosed patients increased significantly. This is a multicenter study conducted in Brazil. When they used antigen for diagnostic purposes, you see that over so antigen test increased diagnosis rate by over 50%. So we know that a quick test is extremely important for diagnosis and therefore also for treatment. I'll spend a few minutes talking about advocacy and awareness. <laughs> you know that I'm really into advocacy in order for us to have better outcomes. Advocacy is important. Uh, this is the International Advo Advocacy Group for Histoplasmosis that we established almost 10 years ago. And we, the last time we were all together was in Manaus in Brazil. This meeting in Manaus was great. We had many plans, and then we had this issue with the COVID-19 pandemic, and our plans couldn't be implemented, but we are back to Brazil to resume all the things we discussed in Manaus back then. And one of the things was to publish a guideline guidelines for uh, HIV and histoplasmosis together with PAHO. And we also declared that by 2025, we would have the ability to quickly diagnose and treat with the best treatment possible. So that would be done by the year 2025. We still have three ways to go, even though we had the pandemic. I think that we can still get there and achieve this goal. But for me, 
what I want out of this meeting now in Brazil is that you Brazilians who have so much knowledge about this disease and who have so many cases of this disease here can really be the leaders for the rest of the world regarding how to manage and decrease the number of deaths caused by histoplasmosis. I think that Brazil is the country you have to look at looking for this kind of leadership. So even though there are no mycosis free areas, we do have mycologists free areas. You all know that. Thank you very much. And I hope we have good discussions today in order to fight histoplasmosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. The questions will be answered at the end of every session. We have to strictly follow time because we have many lectures. Some will have just 10 minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So there will be someone here who will be taking the time, will be the boring guy because this is important. I'd like to call Roseli Zankopi. She is professor at Fiocruz and she will be talking about ecology, isn't it? The ecology of histoplasmosis. I should also say that Rita Oladeli should be speaking now from Nigeria, but she had problems with her visa. Thank you, Alessandro. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for the invitation. And I have been asked to talk about the new histoplasm uh, ecology, but there is no such a thing. So I will insist on what we already know. I cannot start, start talking about histoplasm and histoplasmosis without saying that there, it's a dimorphic fungus through, and it's acquired through inhalation of the conidia. Histoplasmosis, as has been said, is a worldwide uh, endemic. And we've seen cases in Canada and in Argentina. So we we see it in the both extremes of the world. Tom has already shown that. And what calls our attention currently is the fact that <clears throat> new endemic areas are appearing of histoplasmosis, areas in which we, which we didn't know before, and now we have described cases. This study calls my attention, and it's a relatively recent study showing that although, although we have those areas in the United States that are highly endemic, we've also had described cases in Idaho and New York showing that indeed what is happened uh, what it well it's we wonder what's happening for these new cases to be appearing so the scenario in latin america is quite incipient why because histoplasmosis at most places is not has no compulsory notification so the reality that we have of histoplasmosis cases in latin america is unknown and histoplasmosis is more frequent in argentina brazil colombia venezuela in the guayana guatemala panama and mexico tom has already shown this and i call your attention to this this was a publication of ours by our group and as you can see uh, in the past, we used to do a, uh, histo uh, a, an epidemiological inquiry to check for histoplasmosis. Now it's not permitted anymore, but we still have cases in which we do not have either description of cases, epidemiological cases, nor, and which call, it has called our attention that most cases reported in Brazil have confirmed histoplasmosis, mycologically speaking. So we have a lack of diagnosis. And what we need is uh, an alternative diagnosis. This is what we are to discuss today. This is only to uh, provide a cue to uh, what I am about to say. As I said, the infective phase is in the environment. And usually we find the histoplasm in uh, micro niches and where 
where are these? They are present in different types of soil. They like darkness. We've, we see it in the lab, by the way. They have a need for high oxygen concentration and a neutral to acid soil pH. And what we know well, uh, wet climates and and high temperatures, we have a population that is more prone to acquire histoplasmosis. And these are all these all these populations here, rural workers, uh, ecotourism has many cases described currently. And here I brought to you a little bit of what we have been doing in Rio de Janeiro. You can see here in terms of isolation, we had micro niches in the urban area. This is the Maracanã soccer stadium and we isolated histoplasm from an area quite close to Maracanã. This is a leishmaniosis, uh, the, the, the leishmaniosis area and we have isolated histoplasm there as well. And the, here we are doing a study in a cave where kids used to play in a region of Petropolis, a quite uh, wealthy region actually. And kids went to play in this area and we detected a surge of histoplasmosis in this place. So as Tom has shown you already, what calls our attention is that although most epidemic surges have to do with caves, we, ha we have histoplasm isolation of animals on soil uh, almost throughout the country. So we see that indeed human infection is mostly related to occupational areas as well, uh, such as tourism. So we see also climate change, the climate changes that exist worldwide. And we see not only histoplasmosis, but uh, fungal diseases in general have been increasing. So we wonder if indeed these changes have uh, changed the, histoplas the, the epidemiological profile of histoplasmosis. And this has been confirmed since we've seen new bat colonies in different environments, especially urban environments, tornadoes, earthquakes that have occurred in regions which were not histoplasmosis endemic areas and now are happening. Uh, Belo Horizonte, we had a beginning of an earthquake, so to speak. So these environments, these natural environments based on these occurrences have been making the histoplasm be carried over. And in histoplasmosis, it hasn't been shown so much, but in coccidiosis, it has been quite well shown in the United States in which the cocci went from Texas to California through winds. And when they did the molecular detection, they were identical profiles. So this is possibly occurring with the, with histoplasm, but it hasn't been well demonstrated yet. Well, another situation which we see that is quite interesting is the fact that many acute histoplasmosis cases have uh, appeared having to do with travelers coming to Brazil and to Europe, but we also have some other uh, cases, autochthonous cases. This is a recent paper from last year, and we see that we have autochthonous cases in seven states already. There is no uh, soil isolation, but there is an isolation of patients, and these patients have never traveled or anything. So. Indeed, histoplasm must be either in Europe, some European countries like Spain and Italy, as well as in Israel. This I thought was cute because this is an endemic surge that happened, an outbreak that happened. Uh, a group of Australians went to film in a cave in Guatemala and they all came home infected with the disease. So once again, uh, we have to think of uh, where we will uh, go and be cautious about which place you are getting into in order not to acquire the infection. 
One other piece of evidence that histoplasmosis has been disseminated everywhere is through wild animals. This otter in Australia, this was a very well-published case, and they suggested that the otter, look how cute, it could have been infected through the normal pathways. Winds that carry the spores, but could the spore be carried over by uh, ocean currents? This is a question that remains. And we noticed through in this paper in 1964, it shows that histoplasm is capable of surviving on salt water for long periods of time. So this is quite interesting. They will look for, if you look in ocean currents, probably we will find it too. And because my talk is very quick, has to be a quick one, I bring you this question. What's new in all of this? Marcus's group is doing a very beautiful work in the federal district in Braz the area of Brasilia, where there was an epidemic outbreak occurrence with firemen and uh, the Lige participated in it. And I did. And Marcus no this found he, he isolated. Actually, he detected histoplasm in several of these places, and he will talk about it. One other new situation that we have to see is how to make the detection of, how to do the detection of the histoplasm. Many times we cannot do the isolation. So we use, we need molecular tools. It is through these new molecular tools that, uh, as, as has been shown in Colombia, by the way, that histoplasm uh, can be detected. And it was present in organic fertilizers. One other situation that you have to think about is you have to think of histoplasm in uh, unhospitable areas because it could be there. The press here, the presence of one histoplasmosis case in a place that had never been suspected of having a histoplasm capsulatum. So this is what I had to say. Thank you. This is a group people that met some pay, people have left, others have retired, but they were all involved in the papers that I, in the work that I've presented here. Thank you once again. Thank you, Rosalie, for the great presentation. I'd like to call now Professor Marcos Teixeira, who is professor at the University of Brasilia. He will be talking about molecular aspects of histoplasmosis. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today in this histoplasmosis meeting. I'd like to thank Alessandro for the invitation. I'll be talking a little bit about the molecular epidemiology of histoplasmosis. We know that histoplasmosis is an infectious disease, and we know that the environment plays a key role. Rosalie has talked about that. We know that the immune condition of host is also important, but we know that the genotypes of this microorganism can also contribute to an infection leading to increased virulence and may cause more serious disease. We know that these three pillars play a key role on this disease. We know that histoplasmosis is, has a wide distribution in the globe. If we are able to detect the disease in many different places in a given continent, we expect that there is genetic diversity. We know, as Rosalie has already mentioned today, that histoplasm has already been isolated in many different mammals, many mammal hosts. There are, if there are many mammal hosts that may carry it and contribute to the development of this fungus, we also expect that there is a great genetic variability in this fungus. What else do we know about the natural variation of histoplasm? This is a study conducted by Primavera in Venezuela, where she compares gene of strains in North America and in South America. We know there is antigenic variation in different strains. 
we might consider that for diagnostic purposes. If there is antigenic variation, we may assume that there is also gene or genetic variation, not only antigenic variation, but also thermal tolerance. We know that there are different histoplasma strains that grow quicker or slower depending on the temperature. So if we have these phenotypes, a phenotypic variation, we also expect that there are genotypic variations. And this is something you are all aware of, which are the clinical variations of the disease. Do these disease variations related to the host, to the environment, or is it closely related to the pathogen? Then we have this idea of looking at the natural variation of this fungus using molecular biology. What do we do? Basically, we get the isolates, we extract the DNA, and then we sequence the genome from these isolates. Not necessarily the genome, but we may use older techniques, which is multi-local sequencing typing. But the principle is the same. Basically, what we do, we harvest or we collect the genomic data of this fungus, we identify the genera that have similar sequences among different isolates, and then we perform phylogenetic analysis in different genes. I'm giving you here the example of four genes, but we may use 10,000, 20,000 markers, doesn't matter. So we use two basic principles. So concatenation, we basically have one gene in line with other gene, different individuals performing phylogenetic analysis, or we perform individual phylogenetic analysis for each one of the genes, and we use a coalescence method so that in the end, we have a single representation of the evolution of the species. And what is important to mention here is that the more genic regions we have, this is the number of loci or genetic markers, the greater the number of molecular markers you have, the greater the phylogenetic resolution. That's why it's important to use a set of data from complete genomes because the genetic resolution is higher. And also the discriminatory power of this analysis goes up with the number of genes that are used to perform these studies. This is a pioneer work. Many of you know about it. They used four molecular genes, but they discover, but they found eight phylogenetic species back in 2003. Some restricted to Latin America, others to North America, in, a, in the African continent. And this global distribution influenced the evolution of this fungus. If we have different continents in different countries, I expect that there is genetic isolation. And later we started to investigate different research groups looking at the issue of the species in Latin America. So this is Latin American A. The Latin American A group actually was made up of many different phylogenetic species. We know that it has high incidence in Latin America, this disease. And thus we try to better understand the genetically distinct groups of phylogenetic species in our continent. For instance, in northeastern Brazil, we detected these two groups. So northeast BR1 and northeast BR2. And then we have genomics, which is used to identify histoplasma species. So we use coalescence techniques showing that actually there were many different species. What used to be called NAM2 was recalled as histoplasma by Yancey, NAM1, histoplasma missifiense, what used to be called Latin American A, was recalled Suramericano and the Panama group, they have the same name, Histoplasma capsularum, because this is where the disease was first discovered. And another group here, 
in Africa. But what I would like to highlight here is that what is called histoplasma suramericanum is made up of many different groups. So one of the ideas of my study is to try to understand a little bit better about the genetic diversity in this group, in the histoplasma suramericanum group. We started this consortium in order to sequence at least 1,000 histoplasma genomes. This was started in 2018, 2017, and we have many different collaborators spread all over the world, as you can see here on this map. And basically, the coordinators of this initiative uh, are myself, Professor Barker, and Daniel Matut, and these other uh, coordinator from the CDC. And what have we found so far with all the different genomes we have sequenced so far? One of the things I'd like to highlight here is the following. What do we call Latin American A1 histoplasma is made up of at least four different groups. We have Latin American A, strict to census, which are those distributions. So I'll be talking about each one of them. We have a very specific group of isolates from Rio de Janeiro, a very specific group which we call Northeast Brazil, as I showed you, and something new, a, a something which is unique from the Amazon biome and the other species we already knew. It's a plasma capsularum strict, strict to sensor, this African group. Something very interesting too is this Latin American B group, which is totally divergent when compared to Latin American A. This has already been shown, and we proved that through genomic. And these are the species, a group which is here in the bottom of this tree. You cannot see the colors very well, but anyway, there is a group of isolates from Brazil that is totally different genetically from everything we already knew regarding histoplasma diversity. So I'll be talking about these groups specifically. This Latin American A group, we see there is genetic isolation. According to the country, it is widespread in Latin America. And there are a few cases reported in the US, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, in South America. This was identified in Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and in Brazil. But when I talk about Brazil, you know, Brazil is a huge country. In the case of this group, we are talking about patients who, of isolates, who were taken from uh, patients in the state of Pará, this up in the north in the Amazon in Brazil. So the tendency is to find this group more in the northern part of South America. And then we have this group, which is restricted to Rio de Janeiro, which we call RJ group, standing for Rio de Janeiro. But isolates were also found in the state of Sao Paulo and also in a Swiss patient with this genotype. And the genotype from Rio de Janeiro, they tend, well, patients who have this genotype have a greater likelihood of having symptoms related to hemor hemorrhage when compared to other genetic groups. The Northeast group, it's interesting to talk about it. And why was it called Northeast? Because it was originally found in the Brazilian Northeast, but it has a much wider distribution. It's already been found in Suriname, in French, Guiana, in the city of Ceará, Pernambuco. Recently, we also found it in the Bra Brasilia and also in Rio de Janeiro. As I found this Amazon group, we can see that this big genetic picture here. And there is also a certain geographic isolation. So you see it in Suriname, French Guiana, Guatemala, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Venezuela. Once again, isolate, we call Amazon. In Brazil, also come from the state of Pará, which is very different from what we found in the southeastern part of Brazil. The histoplasma capsulatum sensu stricto is also associated with isolates in Panama, Venezuela, French Guiana, Suriname, and the Guianas. So this species is very much restricted. The capsulatum is, is strict to sensor. 
And what is interesting is that this species has a common ancestor with an African group. It's interesting that this African group is found only in Africa, of course. So there is geographic isolation. Different countries, in different countries, the same genotype has been found. But interesting is that in Africa, the Latin American group has also been detected. So we have this geographic isolation in Africa. But when we talk about histoplasma du Boise, but we have at least two histoplasma uh, species found there, the Du Bois and the Latin American species. So Latin American B has, is really widespread. It's mainly found in Argentina. So basically 80, 90% of isolates coming from Argentina have this genotype, but it's also expected for the state of Rio Grande do Sul and Uruguay because it's closer to Argentina. So in the southern part of Latin America, in the USA, we find two species, NAM1 and NAM2, Ohaiense and Mississippiense, as we can see there. And it's interesting to highlight that Ohaiense, the Ohaiense species is more associated to the eastern part of the US and the Mississippiense is more at the center of the country. And they also found Suramericanum in the US, not only in the US, but also in Canada. In Alberta, we know that two American species are there, Ohaiense and Mississippiense, but we also find Suramericanum here, there in Canada. In India, there is also histoplasmosis. It's been shown already. And we see that this Indian group, in spite of the fact that it's far from the US, we know that this Indian group is similar to the American species, right? And the last two slides I'd like to show you is to show the following. There are different species and the same individual may carry more than one genotype. This is a very interesting example by Lisandra, a paper by Lisandra. Well, when you harvest the biological material to isolate, you isolate one genotype. Maybe the patient gets worse, and after one month, the patient returns to the clinic, and then you may isolate a different genotype, a totally different bug. And that is not only in the state of Sierra. We found that in Rio, too. The patient first came, we isolate LAM B. When this patient returns to the clinic, you isolate a totally different genotype, RJ genotype. So what this histoplasma superinfection may lead to in terms of disease outcome. I think this is an important discussion to have here. So some conclusions, I'd like to thank you all. And I'd like to say that I'm really happy to be here at EHU Graduate School with you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I would like to call all speakers for our debate with the audience, please. Jose Lee, Tom, Marcus, can you please come up on stage? We are open to questions now. We have 15 minutes to, for all speakers. Flavio. Congratulations, everyone. I'd like to ask a question to Jose Lee. Uh, you've spoke about some of the histoplasm niches and niches and i would like to ask about some of the artificial niches that sometimes come up in the city one of them being that uh that uh, vessel that box that keeps the old air conditioners we had some uh epidemics in the city of joinville in which the bat lived in this little box and when you turn it on it's a shower of conidia have you seen that? Well, I haven't seen it related with the air conditioner, but in Rio, for example, we had uh, some association 
with the church. The little bats were, uh, they lived there for some time and then they went away. But with the air current in the church, and they used the, the, the with the fans that they used too, there was, we didn't regard it as an epidemic outbreak, but it was a mini outbreak, so to speak. So we have this association. We know that, that air conditioners under bridges uh, in any environment that you, that there may be contact with organic uh, droppings, the organic material of birds and bats, uh, it can occur. So we lack studies to demonstrate that. We need to uh, have more demonstrations of these, these epidemic outbreaks in Brazil. There are many, there are few. We see in Brazil that most of the outbreaks described in Brazil are from Rio because the, the now it's a little bit different because So the, uh, Boda was a great uh, encourager of these trials. So the leader of each group, for example, Melissa now has many cases of histoplasmosis in Rio Grande. And so I think we have to work based on that. And I believe that any environment that favors the growth of the fungus it can, uh, there, can have histoplasmosis. Smoses, so uh, the, the fungus. So possibly there are other environments as well, other than the ones we have studied. And I'd like to take advantage of this time because I'd like to make a comment regarding the work of our group, of Marcus. And we see, for instance, that in Canada, there is a Sud American species. But who, does, who guarantees me that this was not taken over there through air dispersion because it has been demonstrated and all these global changes have been extremely important in the epidemiological profiles of uh, mycosis in general. So just to comment, I said my dad has histoplasmosis. There was the uh, host factor, but there was also a bird's nest in the air conditioner. So uh, it, it's not only about bats. We see that the strain is important for cer the certain severities of uh, histoplasmosis manifestations, but have you studied that at all regarding manifestations and all. Well, if we compare the profiles, for example, virulence, we uh, cannot yet check for the phenotypical factors, but for example, the North American strains, virulence among them is completely different. For example, the pulmonary, the, the lung damage caused by the Sudamericana species and the profile of lung damage as compared to the, these other strains are completely different. We know that virulence levels exist, but if we take strains that are dynamically determined and, and if we compare them with each other, I think this is the future, actually, that we can do that, we can observe as to the genotype. But we are starting to see, for example, this species, which exists in the southeastern region of Brazil, and we, we baptized it RJ, or Rio de Janeiro group. Uh, well, what is it about the the host profile, or is it the genotype that causes more damage? But we need first to do a genetic outline, genetic design, see if we can call it species or phylogenetic group or ABC group, and then we can compare the different phenotypes. But the greatest problem now that we see ever more frequently is that one same patient can 
carry different genotypes, multiple genotypes. And what does this do in the disease? So there is an, is there a new immune response when he's infected by another strain? This is the, these are questions we ask. As to your question, we've seen in Rio that this um, phylogenetic, the RJ phylogenetic species, we don't see any mucosa lesion or skin lesion. Usually we don't. So you we have a disseminated histoplasmosis, but with no apparent lesions, only of lungs, liver, and spleen. So we do believe it has to do with the species. So we are doing an in vitro study, but it's going slowly. That's the work of Fernando. But we do have this piece of evidence differently from the American strain, which causes a lot of mucosal lesions, right? You see a lot of mucosal lesions differently from Rio Grande do Sul also, in which there is a lot, there are a lot of skin lesions. So we believe that it has to do with this diversity, this genetic diversity, but it hasn't been proven scientifically yet. I I'd like just to make a brief comment in the, in the room next door, we're having a demonstration of how the antigen is detected. So we have the different methods there. So reactions are occurring now. And if you can stop by later, it's quite interesting. I'm Claudio Jus from Bahia. Congratulations on your presentations. Marcus, in your presentation, you said that you found the strains in some regions of Pará, Ceará, etc. Will you identify them in different states, Bahia? Is it a trend, a tendency for you to have this identification in different regions of Brazil and different states? Well, the idea and one of the perspectives of this work is, I had a slide about it, but I didn't have time to show it. But the idea is to broaden the areas that we want to work on. We have a lot to say about Pará in the southeastern region. In Rio Grande do Sul, in Santa Catarina, we don't have isolates, but uh, uh, therefore we have some gaps in Latin America that we need to fill. This project is ongoing and uh, any collaboration is very welcome from all of you so that we can increase knowledge about areas uh, which we don't know much about in terms of the genetic identity of the histoplasm. and therapy. Do you think we can change anything uh, related to the recent guidelines on HISTO? What do you think? Do we need to change our therapy? Hablas de terapia con los con los genotipos, los diferentes. Therapies and genotypes, right? I believe that by now there's nothing to be changed. I believe that what we have to change is perhaps the way we use the what we have. I know some of you are, are participating in a study with Alessandro with higher doses and a shorter co uh, time, like we're recommending for cryptococcosis. And there is, well, there are three new antifungal medications that will come out this year, which perhaps we could think about uh, using these medications, these drugs. But for genotypes, I don't see any change that we have to to say, to, to make. Thank you, good morning, excellent presentations. My question is based on public health aspects. Presentations reminded us well, the strong component of histoplasm with the environment as a concept of a single health. 
what strategies could we implement to include histoplasm more in this concept of uh, in this one health concept because many times we talk about zoonosis yes i believe that we are ever more in a world of inf infectious diseases in the, in the One Health system. We've seen this with COVID. We've seen this with different uh, infectious diseases. And I believe that fungi have always been a bit apart from all that, even though we all know that we find fungi Jai within animals in the environment and patients, but these, uh, of course, uh, fungi want to be more in animals than in the environment. But I believe that we always have to talk about these diseases as a single health. There is this connection with the environment and with animals as well. Before this One Health concept existed, my master's thesis was exactly this. I did what I showed you uh, in the leishmaniosis area, uh, field in Rio. We took soil, we took animals, and we took patients. And we did histoplasm in, in children of that location. And we demonstrated this connection and this was millions of years ago so fungi fungal diseases they fit very well in the one health concept and people have to think about that this in my point of view this is what we need it's no use for you to isolate an otter in alaska and not demonstrate whether the disease was occurring there it should have been assessed i believe so we here should uh, get something out of it. Histoplasmosis is in the One Health sy uh, system. And we have to think about a mapping strategy. If there is a case of histoplasmosis, like Terezinha and Lisandra have been doing in the state of Ceará, they have a case of uh, a patient and they go after the environment. So I believe that we all should have this view, okay? Well, we had that outbreak of firemen in Brasilia. Uh, they, went, they went into a cave and when I came back from the US, one of the things I wanted was to contribute with the public health system of Distrito Federal, the federal district. And, we started to collect uh, because Brasilia is a, but well, there are many, there are more than 300 caves in the Brasilia area and all caves in Brasilia have histoplasm with no exception. So we collected a lot of bat samples. We did real time PCR uh, in lung isolates and we found that more than 70% individuals are in by histoplasm from bats. So we lack diagnosis. Unfortunately, somebody's speaking off the mic. That's what we call, yeah, the little flu, so to speak. The person will have a subclinical condition, a pulmonary condition that is mistaken by any pneumonia or a cold or a flu and it cures spontaneously that it could happen. I'd like to make a comment on what Fabio said. I believe it's characterization studies, species characterization studies are essential, epidemiological studies and molecular studies, but I believe that you have to be joint with uh, clinical trials so doctors can be scared if they see that 
it was caps histoplasm capsulatum, that it was a different histoplasm. So it's very important not to lose this connection between science and clinic and the clinic. And, by, and because you were starting to do such complex studies with the genome sequencing and all that, we perhaps can do observational studies to, to try uh, to take the images from patients and analyze them together and try to understand what the meaning and what the reality is from the clinical standpoint. So I think that's extremely important. If you have a histoplasmosis community, you should try to bring together the clinicians and researchers in order for them to work together. Good morning, everyone. I thank you for the opportunity to be here in the meeting. I'm going to chair a table, uh, a panel now on the epidemiology epidemiology of histoplasmosis in Brazil, and different speakers will be will present their visions about their views about the this at the this epidemiology. So the session is divided into two blocks. So at the end, we'll. Of the fourth presentation, we'll have Q&A. And at the end of the session, once again, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to call Dr. Marcos Lacerda from Manaus. He's a doctor from the Tropical Medicine Association, a specialist in public health in Fiocruz, Amazonas. Please present the epidemiological data from Manaus, please. Thank you, Pascaloto, for the invitation. It's been a time since we were together in Manaus. Curiously enough, when I'm asked, to, I'm asked to talk about Amazonas data, I talk about Manaus. It's like the Amazonas state is small. It's like when my colleague here talked about Paraná, he really talked about the whole state. And I actually, when I, whenever I speak, I talk more about Manaus. Uh, Manaus is the capital city of the state of Amazonas. We actually have been working a lot, even though we, we don't have many caves around Manaus, we have been studying a lot histoplasmosis and HIV positive patients, because that's an area where we still have many HIV patients being diagnosed. Even though in Brazil, HIV infection is under control, we still have an increased number of HIV diagnosis that leading to late treatment. Almost 90% of these cases are impatiently that have been recently diagnosed with HIV or who are not no longer being treated. So this is a, the, our hospital is a reference hospital with 150 beds and that's where we do the surveillance of this tip of the iceberg, which are serious cases that come to us. We have a traditional mycology lab and this is where we diagnose using culture Buffy coat, from Buffy coat, bone marrow. And recently, actually after the meeting in Manaus, we started to buy urine antigen, even though it's very expensive. In practice, it's been used as an important screening tool. Treatment is still amphotericin B. Ambizom is still a medication that doesn't reach all patients, unfortunately. And we have had a slightly different approach. This is a center with a major tradition in autopsies, so pathologists have always worked a lot in infectious diseases. And a few years ago, we started participating of a project funded by Belinda Gates, which are the minimally invasive autopsies. This happened in Africa, specifically in Mozambique and in Manaus. This was the first demonstrative study funded by the Gates Foundation for us to try to understand the causes of death. This is a meeting 
in Maputo, where this project started. And this is a relatively recent publication coming out of this project with the number of autopsies performed in Manaus and in eight out of six to one, histoplasma was present. So it's still a very high percentage. We didn't want to have this disease as cause of that. And what we have been trying to do actually, not only doing GMS to try to better understand what is disseminated histoplasmosis, but with these PCRs, we try to estimate the amount of fungus we have in each tissue. So one of the goals is try to understand what are the tissues that could be candidates for histoplasma diagnosis before death. We look at the dead to help the those who are still alive so that we understand what are the kinds of tissues where you have a higher fungal load. Not only understand that, but it's also a start to understand a little bit more about the immunopathology, which is poorly studied. We don't know much about immunopathology in the tissue, what it does, what kind of cells are found in every tissue, in every organ, what are the contributions for the mechanism of death, so that the clinician knows, for example, that you may have adrenal failure, which will ultimately lead to death. So we have to understand where the fungus is in those patients who died and what was the contribution of the fungal disease to the death of that patient. Out of those patients included in the study, four of them were genotyped, and you can see that actually we have a very diverse profile of the histoplasma, at least in the city of Manaus. That's showing that we do not have one specific genotype, and maybe we will have to try to better understand even the clinical characterization of every different genotype together with individual immunity. And from Cadmia, Emory University is now coordinating this surveillance alliance. At that time, we used to call it minimally invasive autopsy. And people from the qualitative research found out that the name autopsy doesn't sound well, really, because minimally invasive autopsy are actually biopsies where you use needles. You don't have to open the whole body. An autopsy gives you this idea that you have to open the whole um, cadaver. So the term that is being more widely used in literature today is minimally invasive tissue champion. This sounds better for the relatives of this victim, of this disease people. So with MITS, MIT, with this new name, compared with the full autopsy, let me read 80, 90% of agreement. So we no longer have to open up the whole uh, category. So there is a very significant agreement where when you use needles, make this biopsy. So we are funded by the alliance. And last year, we conducted 100 of these autopsies comparing with the minimally invasive autopsy. And we did that only in HIV positive patients, which are the majority of patients we have in our hospitals. And you see that in 35% of these people died due to pneumocystis. And the second cause of death was histoplasma. And some patients are diagnosed only after they die. Cryptococcosis still a significant number. So 62% of these patients actually died because of a fungal disease. We are talking about diseases that are still very lethal in these populations. And this shouldn't exist, but you still have many, many patients coming to infectious disease clinics in Brazil because of this kind of disease. When you compare different tissues, so histoplasma uh, pathology and culture before the anti molding I think so could identify 17 out of the 19 cases. So on top, they could add two cases that hadn't been diagnosed in the anti molding period showing that when you have an anti molding diagnosis with Buffy code culture, which is not available everywhere, this will detect a higher number of cases. 
that's it before the bell sounds. This is my email address if you want further information on the website of the Carlos Proborema Institute. There you can look at many different studies being conducted in the state of Amazonas. We have a it's not only part of the Tropical Medicine Institute, but also, well, it's actually a consortium of different agencies and organizations where together we conduct this kind of research. Thank you. Thank you. For really sticking to the time you had, I'll now call Dr. Bai, Monica Bai, who is infectious disease doctor and professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. She will be talking about epidemiology in the city of Natal. This is the capital city of the state of Rio Grande do Norte. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alessandro and Diego, for the invitation to be here today talking about the data from Natal. As Marcos was saying that he wouldn't bring data from Amazonas, but from Manaus, I don't bring data even from Natal. I bring data from the hospital where I work. We really have a hard time making diagnosis of fungal diseases in general in the city of Natal. People are really concerned because our ambisome research is gone and we will no longer have histoplasma antigen available. We are just wondering how we're going to do it. So Natal, we say that it's the corner of Brazil. You were later, uh, earlier today talking about the fact that the fungus can be carried by winds. And we have uh, winds coming from different continents reaching our area. And that's why we have many fungal diseases there. Our environment is really prone for the growth of histoplasma. Humidity and temperature conditions are perfect for Funga, fungi. That's why we have been diagnosing many cases. The hospital I'm going to be talking about is the Giselda Trigator Hospital, which is the reference hospital for infectious diseases in our state. And it's also the teaching hospital for the federal university regarding infectious diseases, 120 beds. We have many HIV patients, many TB patients. We have an ICU. The hospital now during the COVID-19 pandemic was taken by COVID patients. We really had a hard time having a bed for other patients. I think that was actually the reality of every hospital in Brazil. What are the diagnostic tools we have in order to make the diagnosis of histoplasmosis in Natal? We have direct examination of peripheral blood and bone marrow aspirates, but we don't have a specific staining for fungi. We have we do direct exam and bone marrow with staining for leish, leishmaniasis, and which is one of the, our main uh, differential diagnosis for disseminated histoplasmosis. Now, with the research, for some time we had detection of antigen in the urine, which was great. You will see that we had a much larger number of diagnoses using antigen, urine antigen and histology when you can perform a biopsy, particularly in lymph nodes, we can have histology diagnosis. We don't have serology and we don't have culture. We don't perform culture. We don't perform culture tests for fungal disease anywhere in the state. The only one we can do is for cryptococcosis. This is our reality. So think before you complain about the places where you work. So here are the data from the last presentation. We delivered here in Porto Alegre, that was back in 2015, cases of histoplasmosis in our hospital. In 2015, we had 81 suspected cases and six confirmed cases, only six confirmed cases, four using peripheral blood of the Buffy coat and to using bone marrow aspirates. That was in 2015, out of 81 suspected cases, six confirmed cases using this methodology, which unfortunately are the only ones we have. And these are the 2021 data. In 2021, out of the 61 suspected cases, we could confirm 34. 
all of them with positive antigen and some of them also with bone marrow aspirate. And out of the 27 who were excluded, in 11 we could con uh, confirm TB and 16 cases of visceral leishmaniasis. So our the prevalence of histoplasmosis is higher than the prevalence of TB and visceral leishmaniasis. If we put together both diseases, we still have less cases than disseminated histoplasmosis. And the hospital is really aware of that. And when I went to the hospital epidemiology department to ask for this, because this is not a notifiable disease, as you know, we have the hospital records. And then I talked to the epidemiologist there. I'd like to check this data because I have the impression that we have more cases of histoplasmosis than the shipmaniasis and TB and epidemiology people said, yes, we also have the same impression. So this means that this is a really important disease for us. Out of those five deaths, so a mortality rate of around 14%. I also bring you some data of patients who were included in the research, the current research we are conducting right now with treatment with ambisome. 28 patients were included, most of them males. 36% in 36% of them, age was the defining illness. And mean CD4 count in this patient's 34. So we still have many late HIV diagnosis with advanced AIDS. Just one patient had a CD4 cell count greater than 100. Most of our cases are located in this area closer to the coast, many cases in Natal and in neighboring cities. And for terms of differential diagnosis, well, we have better diagnostics for these other diseases. We can say that it's not TB, we have gene experts, we use culture for visceral leishmaniasis. We can also do culture, RK39, strip test. So the difficulty we have is really to make histoplasma diagnosis. And now that we will no longer have an antigen available, it will become even harder. Regarding available treatment, doxycholate, our supply of intraconazole is intermittent. Sometimes we have intraconazole available and some months we don't. And then if the patient can afford, he or she will buy. If they don't, if they cannot afford, they will not take it and will recur. Amphotericin, the lipid complex, only for HIV negative patients. For these, we can get this medication. Let's hope in the 2015 presentation, I showed you that the Tropical Medicine Institute was being built and it's been opened already. It's next to the reference hospital. So now we have a better infrastructure. Labs are being organized right now, but still without an adequate mycology structure in order to be able to make better diagnosis of, of these infections. That's it. This is the team that was part of this uh, research. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for the excellent presentation. I'm going to call now Dr. Lisanda Damasceno, infectologist and infectious disease specialist from Ceará State. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Pasqualotto, for the opportunity of presenting here the Fortaleza data. And like she said about the city of Natal, let me show you. Well, we work at the São José Hospital. It's a 128-bed hospital, and it's a reference hospital for infectio infectious diseases in Ceará. It's located in Fortaleza City, and it, it 
it's the one that receives the greatest demand of patients if there is an opportunistic infection or HIV infection. Unfortunately, we still have this problem of people who are HIV infected and are not absorbed by the system. So they are referenced to our hospital. Uh, so what do we see in Fortaleza? We have a highly endemic disease in Ceará. You've all seen this map. It's been shown in other presentations. And Ceará has reported in the last few years a large number of cases together with the state of Goiás. And endemic mycosis are not compulsory notification uh, conditions. And in Ceará, it's no different. So what we know of data are the are data that uh, based on data that are reported by our hospital in the last 12 years we managed to do a survey and we see that we've always had above 40 cases a year in average diagnosed through culture we don't have antigen and we also provide microscopic diagnosis but we couldn't make that survey uh, well, the prevalence is 30 to 40 percent. In the last 12 years, we detected 566 cases. Unfortunately, we still have a very high mortality rate during hospitalization. About 30 to 40 percent of the patients end up dying in the hospital. This is an interesting trial in which we mapped out cases of patients in Fortaleza, and we wanted to know where they came from and where they lived. And we observed that most of the patients live in the outskirts of the city of Fortaleza, and they are exposed to environmental factors, but they have a low human development index, and they live with bad sanit or poor sanitation conditions. So histoplomosis to us is a highly neglected disease. And as we've said, HIV patients are the ones that are mostly affected, but currently we've seen histoplasmosis in patients with rheumatology diseases, patients who use steroid, uh, steroid therapy, the prolonged sterile drugs therapy, and others. Here, Marcus showed us our PhD trial, and we know we'd observed observed some different isolates from different strains, from different genotypes that have ident been identified in the world. And we also identify these double infections or poly infections with different genotypes. But we do not know exactly what will be the impact of these co-infections in patients. We have discussed whether they worsen the outcome or they will if there will be any clinical relevance and it needs to be further studied. How do we do diagnosis in Fortaleza? We have a presumptive diagnosis. We train all residents and colleagues who are at the hospital. We take into account a presumptive diagnosis, patients with HIV, patients presenting with fever or respiratory symptoms, patients that have a high HDL above 800, usually are uh, high. Uh, AST greater than ALT by three times, and also if they have any cytopenia or a parosplenomegaly, and all these patients are, are screened for histoplasmosis. We do culture or microscopy, especially buffy coat and bone marrow. For some chronic cases, lymph nodes, but end of his, we do histopathology and the more acute cases go to Fiocruz Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. We, just to mention that we do not have the antigen and the PCR test, but in one uh, work that we're doing with Alessandro, we noticed that antigen uh, incremented by 30% the detection of positive cases. So we lose many patients many diagnoses of histoplomosis because we don't don't have more sensitive and more uh, rapid diagnosis techniques treatment well not everyone has a lipid complex and uh, in our hospital we have the lipid formulations only if patients present with renal failure already or if they progress having renal failure 
during treatment. If not, they start with DAMB and then nitroconazole. And those who don't have HIV, they begin to use uh, lipid complex amphotericin based on the protocol by the Ministry of Health. Unfortunately, atraconazole, like Monica said, is very irregular in the network. So if the patient doesn't have atraconazole, either they buy it or we use uh, the in this oxycholate one. Of course, this uh, complicates the quality of life of patients because they have to go to the hospital every week, do stay there for four years for treatment. And many times they cannot even afford to be in the hospital for a week. So uh, what are the needs? I think it's necessary for us to consider histoplasmosis as a neglected, highly neglected disease. We suggest here that all cases should be reported and notified in order for us to know the exact situation of this disease in Brazil and implement goals to improve this scenario, train healthcare professionals to recognize the disease, train mycologists, we know it's a big deficiency in Brazil, people who work with epidemiology, diagnosis and treatment, assess more early diagnosis and fast treatments for these patients, have access to antifungal therapy with less adverse events, access access to molecular methods in the surveillance and diagnosis, and we will know the exact impact of clinical impact of these impacts if we start to do surveillance and study virulence more in depth. And we need financing for that. This community here, we created with our undergraduate students to uh, to disseminate these fungal infections in Brazil, well, to actually to, to make them more known because people don't, some people don't know how to differentiate this from other conditions. And we need to insist on this information for, pe information for people to know more about histoplasmosis. Thank you very much, Lisandra, for the brilliant presentation. We will now go on to the next presentation by Dr. Claudilson Bastos from the state of Bahia. He's a preceptor doctor on infectious diseases in Porto Maya Institute. He is a professor at, and he's a secretary of the Brazilian uh, Society of Infectious Diseases. He's going to talk about the data from Salvador, the city of Salvador in the state of Bahia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Well, here we have the hospital where I work, together with the interns and the students from the state, the Bahia State University where I teach. I am actually a secretary in the regional society of infectious diseases and not national, not national one. I have no uh, conflicts of interest in my presentation. And for those of you who know Bahia, those of you who have come to Bahia, well, if you haven't, then go, first thing. But I'm going to show here some historical data. I did active search here, like Professor Roseli said, there's no compulsory uh, notification. So we try to do this on our own. And in our hospital, it's a very high complexity hospital. Professor Ana Alcantara identified 14 patients in 1994. Professor Nancy Silva actually here up on top, Ana Paula Alcantara in 95 and 96 identified 11 confirmed cases. This is what we have in Bahia in terms of confirmation history. And the, the year 2018, 2019, Professor Laura Bassa and collaborators identified 13 confirmed patients with histoplasmosis. So we have, this is what we have in terms of published cases. And this data here, 13% infections, I believe is not updated, but this is what we have in terms of data. Well, patients, this is a brief, re report on how patients presented their symptoms. Out of the 11 patients in age UPIS and 14 patients in hospital GRS, uh, 10 were male and one female, 13 male and one female. So a prevalence in the male, in males. 
Uh, out of the symptoms presented at the time, we have fever, weight loss, dyspnea, cough, chills, and skin lesions. Also in the Robert Sons Hospital, we have interesting data here, anemia, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and uh, the other uh, were similar, symptoms were similar to the other hospital. From Kotomaya Hospital, we had 13 patients and the predominance was also of males. The symptomatology that we have is similar to the other hospitals, although the authors reported diarrhea and uh, in a retrospective trial from 2013 to 2019, which hasn't been published yet, she's studying and looking into uh, oral lesion. You said that, right? Well, these patients had oral lesion. We didn't identify the species or genotype, but some patients curiously, instead of skin lesions, presented with oral lesions and, mo and a lot of them pancytopenia. Now, 2020-2022, we were debating with our residents and preceptors, and we were over WhatsApp of, about patients who possibly, and laboratory-wise, laboratory were confirmed. At least eight patients were discussed in our debate. Most of these patients have a long a prolonged length of stay in the hospital, more than 15 days, more than 50% had a low CD4, between five and 50. And we conducted myeloculture, histopathology. It's interesting that Professor Sergio Ajuda from Fiocruz Bahia and Unabi, he identified it in the esophagus. A patient who had esophageal histoplasmosis, serology, hemoculture, and residents also identified it in fresh blood, the presence of ectoplasma capsulatum. It's quite interesting. We have a hematologist, Professor Ana Carla, who is training uh, the boys as to conducting biopsies, uh, punct uh, puncture biopsies, fine needle biopsies, and well, and then we can identify that too. Well, just to uh, remind you here, this trial, this trial was sent to me. We all know about the, this trial, and we had, it identifies 44.4 percent. Uh, that that is four out of nine patients investigated. And he did this, of course, everybody knows these predictive values for histoplasmosis, and our patients follow these data, CD4 uh, lower than 50, pancytopenia, miliary pattern of the chest image, hepatomegaly, lactate dehydrogenase. I think this helps a lot uh, to know all this. And finally, we have a colleague who's doing her PhD in tuberculosis, Betania, as she said, as Betania said, if we think of tuberculosis, you have to think about histoplasmosis. And we have these statistical data by Faust showing that the lower the CD4, the greater the incidence of histoplasmosis, or you should think about histoplasmosis all the time. That's why Faust said he brought us here for us to think about histoplasmosis. And to wrap up, these are some important aspects. We diagnose for opportunistic infection. These patients, uh, once they are confirmed, they are selected. This is what the project is all about. And people who have HIV, that is frequent, it's frequent that they have histoplasmosis that has been shown here, both in Kotumaya as well as other colleagues, they, they mentioned the same difficulty. And we need to draw more attention to the need of doing these diagnoses in these patients, given the different options of diagnosis. And we need really to pay more attention. And this is our group. They probably watching me, Professor Ligia, Audia, Veronica, all the residents, not all of them are here, but they have all contributed and they are, we are proud of them in Bahia. Thank you. Muito obrigado a todos. Eu vou convidar...
Thank you. I invite Dr. Claudius Alessandra, Marcos, Monica, so I'd like to invite all the speakers to come to the table. We will have a 15 minute QA session. So please raise your hand. We will provide you with a microphone so that we can start our QA session. Hello, congratulations. All the data you've shown were really interesting. Well, I actually have a comment, particularly for you, Monica, because we at Fio Cruz, we are a national reference lab for Brazil, a reference lab for mycosis, so we can contribute to you so that you make the diagnosis you need so badly. We are already providing support to Lisandro, so feel free to contact us. Now, a situation, I something I saw in all presentation, except uh, in Marco's presentation, was that the lack of diagnosis at your centers is something really clear, and it's a big issue. And we are having a big problem in buying antigens. Even we at Fiocruz, I've talked to people from IMI, and I'd like you to reinforce that. We need to have more antigen distributors in Brazil, because we are in the hands of one single company. And this company, it takes sometimes three to four months to import this antigen kit. And we can no longer live without antigen tests, you know. And it costs a lot. It's very expensive. So I think that one thing we have to take out of this meeting is really becoming aware of the fact that we need to introduce the urine antigen test. And then Dr. Adelaide has to be on our side. And she's already doing that. And I'm part of that movement. And that in a near future, Adelaide, I think we will be able to use to have these tests provided by the Ministry of Health, but please demand that. And this is something really important. And congratulations, Marcos. That was a great study. Thank you so much. I would just like to make a comment. Dr. Brazili mentioned regarding antigen is really important because it's much easier for us to implement antigen testing anywhere in Brazil. It's an ELISA, so any biochemist chemist working in a lab can do it, then having to establish a mycology lab to do it. So training a good mycologist takes time. It takes a lot of effort. Valerio is here, our great mycologist here from Porto Alegre. It's hard. And antigen testing is something relatively simple. You know, ELISA is not simple, but it's more feasible to implement that. And we see that the disease exists in Natal. It's a great difference from six to 30 out of 35 cases. What changed? Patients are still the same. We still have late HIV diagnosis, but the thing is that now we are making this diagnosis. That's the difference. Congratulations to all speakers. I have an objective question to Marcus. I saw that in your case series of diagnosis using uh, needle fine needle aspiration biopsy, you have a number of cases of patients with cryptococcus gati. We don't see that often. Cryptococcus gati is more in immunocompetent patients. Do you have an explanation for that? Maybe an epidemiological explanation? Well, that's our experience. Non-HIV patients with Cryptococcus gati, tough treatment. We were kind of shocked, but we confirmed that. It was indeed Cryptococcus gati, and we are still trying to understand some things related to immunity, but we were shocked, much higher than we expected. Previous series showed in HIV patients, there are a few cases of cryptococcus gati, and in this study, we found many uh, of these uh, cases. The... Flavio, in Rondonia, in the state of Rondonia, we also saw cryptococcus gati. Rondonia is in the Amazon region, so possibly this is what is happening. The state of Pará, too, is also in the Amazon region. So in northern Brazil, you're having that. So 
you have closer contact of the population in general with Cryptococcus gatti. So I think that's the reason. But anyway, that's a change because when you look at historical series in the past 40 years, you clearly see that gatti was much less representative in HIV patients. It's just a comment. Uh, endemic areas of GATI, I have 10 HIV patients with Cryptococcus GATI, Cryptococcus by GATI, confirmed diagnosis. So in area where you have Cryptococcus GATI, HIV patients will have GATI infection to add to this comment on Cryptococcus GATI. People in, to what extent in routine lab tests, you isolate and then you report it as complex neoformans GATI. But we don't do another staining to see if it's neoformans or GATI. So I think that these statistics may be because they are taking one step ahead, reaching, a, so getting uh, to the level of the species and not only the complex. As an additional comment, during this, <coughs> a uh, high level of, of this number of cases of cryptococcus due to cryptococcus gatti. We know that antigen sensitivity may be also related to the species causing the infection. We should know how to choose the antigen uh, detection method that may cover both cryptococcus species. Questions? I have a question to the panelists. Many colleagues have talked about epidemiological characterization and they mentioned some data from our study where we found a very significant number of co-infection with TB. I'd like to know what is your view, what is your perception in your own cases regarding the epidemiology of your center regarding co-infection, TB and histoplasmosis. This is an important remark. I think we have to start studying histoplasma in a place where you have to be the best studies to be conducted are people with TB and from that detect not only co-infection, which is relatively common, because if you see mycobacteria, you forget about other things, but also those who are TB negative. Today we have a network of gen, a gene expert network in Brazil that is able to uh, diagnose many of them with good specificity and sensitivity. So those where microscopy failed, BAL negative, gene expert negative, but who have a suspected case of tuberculosis. I think these are the candidates to put together a histoplasma workup network. I think that we will be shocked to see the number of histoplasmosis cases we have in these people. And they usually are referred to a pneumologist because TB is ruled out. So Brazil is anti One Health. If you have malaria, you treat. If you don't, look for someone else. TB is the same. If it's TB, we treat. If it's not TB, just go somewhere else and try to find what you have. So I think this is the group for which Brazil should have a good network trying to look for histoplasmosis in TB negative patients and also looking for co infection. In Natal, we have around 10% of co-infection, histoplasmosis and TB. This is always an issue because we have that difficulty to have maintenance treatment. Patients have to go to the hospital to get amphotericin for one week. This year, we had cases of the central nervous system TB associated to histoplasmosis. Then things get even harder because we have one year for TB treatment. And we also have cases of co-infection between histoplasmosis and leishmaniasis, less than co-infection than co-infection with TB. But that's good because they will get uh, amphotericin B liposomal and then they will be able to treat both conditions at the same time. I work with residents in a center, a state center. It's a state hub where we get data from patients from all over our state and we monitor them to suggest where they're going to be referred to. We have an extremely high level of TB and if we do some screening, 
We all think it's TB, and interestingly, most colleagues working in smaller towns, they don't think about HIV. They don't ask for an HIV test. We call them and say, please do the HIV test. So, so we shouldn't be only in the capital city. This is what I mean, because I think the pro biggest problem are in smaller cities away from uh, the capital city. TB, they just, if, if, if it's positive for TB, they just forget about other things. They forget, they don't even consider histoplasmosis. We have around 15% of co-infection, TB and histoplasmosis, and we have the same situation there. Fever, miliary infiltrate, TB in an AIDS patient, of course. And then the patient started being treated, even though gene expert is negative, they don't have a proper sample perform the test and people are okay with that it's tb negative and then they start empirical treatment we've seen that happen many times and we talk to interns residents and even uh, physicians we tell them that you have to start thinking about histoplasmosis and then we test for it and it's indeed it's a Moses. We have this issue of drug to drug interaction. We have 15% co infection. We also have a, an issue we still have, which is that we're not able to provide diagnosis for pneumocystosis. So many times patients are on sofa. They are okay. They got better after 10 days. And when they return two weeks later, they have already severe disseminated histoplasmosis. So probably the patient already had histoplasmosis and when they are readmitted to the hospital, they have many failures and unfortunately often uh, they die. And what we tell residents or actually everyone who is working in the hospital that we have to really look more for a diagnosis of histoplasmosis. Sometimes it takes a long time because we only have conventional methods available, culture and microscopy now with antigen. In a research setting, patients who started being treated with TB drugs, then antigen test was performed. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. We have the support of La Saint, a state lab. Sometimes it took, took a time, like two weeks. But then when we had that, they were positive for histoplasmosis, not to get better with TB drugs. In the end, it was indeed histoplasmosis. I think we really have to talk more about histoplasmosis so that can so that people can start including it in a differential diagnosis just a quick comment the data we have represent the reference centers you know we are talking about places where clinicians as marcelo simon work where sandro pasqualotto works but this is not representative of the rest of brazil brazil is much more complex than that. And we're just looking at a very small fragment of what is happening in Brazil. So you should take all this data with a grain of salt because they are really biased. They don't represent the whole situation in Brazil. We have time for one more question or comment. Tomorrow I'll be presenting data on core infection, but I can say this study was conducted in Guatemala. It was a screening study in all Patients, we used all diagnostics, so we have very robust data. 15.6% of patients had co-infection. Any co-infection that the most frequently found was histoplasmosis with TB. 50% of cases, very hard to treat because if you don't have amphotericin B, you cannot treat both diseases, it's really tough. And our recommendation, main recommendation is TDLAM, TB LFA in patients with CD4 count less than 50, we have to do screening for histoplasmosis and TB for all patients because the incidence in certain areas, you have much more, in certain areas, you have much more histoplasmosis than TB. So I think we should do the screening for both. I think I'd like to thank all the speakers. And now we will continue with this session. Yeah. 
I'd like now to call Dr. Cassia Godoy, infectious diseases specialist and working at Hospital José Jorge from the state of Goiás. She will present the data from the state of Goi from the city of Goiânia. Good morning. We are located in the midwestern part of Brazil. The state of Goiás is divided, has been divided into northern, well, the northern state has become the Tocantins state and now is part of the northern region. We have our capital, Goiânia, very close to Brasilia. And we have 246 municipalities. The city of Goiânia, Aparecida and Anápolis are uh, quite close to each other. One interesting fact is that the state is located in a se the second largest biome in South America, which is the brushland. Brushlands with uh, grasses and low trees with two very dry seasons that go from May and are quite cool until October. And then we have a rainy period. And with the, the uh, well, our region is quite ventilated. We have a hist uh, epidemiological situation done with histoplasmin and back in 20. 2006, this is dated 2017, we had a very low incidence. We had a very low incidence and the more recent studies that we have done show a quite important number. This is what we have observed in the last 27, uh, in, in almost 20 years, excuse me, of our situation. And just like Monica's data, these are concentrated in one single unit in the, refer in the HIV reference uh, center. It's a uh, 1,500,000 inhabitants city, and this is a hospital which Hospital Anwar Awadi, which uh, treats HIV patients since the 1980s. We have 127 beds in this hospital. We also have outpatients. We do have. We do amphotericin B deoxycholate A. This data is from the epidemiological surveillance uh, center, which surveys HIV cases. Uh, the AIDS cases correspond to uh, 89% of the overall HIV cases. And now we start to calculate the histoplasmosis number from 2003 to 2021. We've had 792 cases of histoplasmosis. In the first half of 2022, we had nine more cases. This leads to a prevalence rate for HIV related histoplasmosis of 79 cases a year. And here we have a co-infection that is not as important as tuberculosis, but crypto, uh, we have the crypto colonies form of a histoplasma capsulatum. There's something interesting here. Uh, when we see what the diagnosis was of, we started in 19, in 20, in 2003, we noticed the fungi in uh, peripheral blood. And we start to, to then contact our laboratory and we have a good partnership with our lab. And we now start to do research with the hematologist and the uh, bone marrow. So we see cultures and it, from the beginning, 
we do diagnosis in the peripheral blood and this study here and Dr. Bianca used this, did this study for 10 years and now we have a spe some specific characteristics of the histoplasm patients group. So we see the metropolitan area of Goiânia. And we have this about uh, 50 cases to every 1,000 AIDS cases a year, most of them being men, very similar to other data presented here. We noticed that one fourth of the patients used to have, uh, they refer to the municipality of Goiânia as their residence, but they actually come from other states, Mato Grosso, Tocantins, Maranhão, and they come to Goiânia looking for medical assistance. And they give a Goiânia address. And 41% of the cases, the disseminated histoplasmosis diagnosis opens the HIV diagnosis. Monocultures are the main diagnosis, but we also have uh, direct fungus research. In the study period of Dr. Brianca, of histoplasmosis crypto, we have here a mortality rate of 53%. This happening up to the third day of patient's admission. So these clinical outcomes are very dramatic. As I said, diagnosis takes place in the first years based on peripheral blood, then the bone marrow samples too. And when we summarize the diagnosis, 89.6% uh, is done through blood cultures. So the labs become very important here for diagnosis. But it takes it's long, so our concern is not to just to do the diagnosis, but to do a fast diagnosis because the coach, if the culture is ready in two weeks, the patient has died already. So the antigen test becomes part of our diagnosis, became part of the diagnosis in 2017 during the validation of this test. We took place in a multi-center study and more recently with this in this second trial by Pasqualotto. We have 24 cases in this period of uh, CSF culture and 45 in the skin lesion culture biopsies. We have the participation of the mycology laboratory and it's interesting that in 2013, the state government transformed endemic mycosis, histoplasm, and crypto as compulsory notification diseases. This really boosted diagnosis to us, but it did not improve treatment. When we talk about the treatment of histoplasmosis in our unit, we have more than 85% of treatment being done both for crypto as histo, uh, through amphotericin B deoxycholate, but in other centers, only leishmaniasis patients have access to it. Same expectations of my colleagues. The expectations of my colleagues are my own. Why do we have so much histoplasmosis? Why do we diagnose so much? We all think about that. So thank you, Dr. Dr. Cassia. I'm going to call Dr. Marcelo Simão now, a specialist in infectious diseases and chief of the infectious diseases department in the Uberlândia Hospital. He's going to talk about the city of Uberlândia in the state of Minas Gerais. Good morning. Thank you, Pasqualotto, for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. I'm going to show you actually not only Uberlândia. He's asked me to provide a broader picture of the state of Minas Gerais. 
Well, I wanted to show you a background. I studied in Oberlandia in the nine in the 70s. I'm quite old. And in the 70s and 80s, I did not see one single case of histoplasmosis in our hospital. It's a 530 bed hospital. It's a university hospital. And at that time, we never we had never seen we had a lot of mycosis, but not histoplasmosis, or we didn't diagnose, which was the most uh, probable situation. I mean, epidemiological survey in 1988, when I was already there as a professor of infectious diseases, we had uh, Professor Lacaz gave me the histoplasmin test and paracoxidiodin. And at that time, uh, 18% were positive for histo and 13% for paracoxic. But where were these histoplasmosis patients? In the 90s, first cases of histoplasmosis occurred in HIV positive patients. At that time, we published, uh, Professor Ayas, who works with me, we published 18 cases on histoplasmosis. The 18 first cases diagnosed in that period of 1997, we published that on the Brazilian Journal of Tropical Diseases. And it and what called our attention was the large quantity of oral lesions diagnosed as histoplasmosis. And we took the opportunity and we published 10 cases of oral lesions with the people from the dentistry field. And in 2009, we did a review, which is published here on, on the same journal uh, about histoplasmosis. Well, in order for us to know if this disease occurred there already, we had this autopsy study, which was published with our pathologists. At that time, few people did HIV aut autopsy, but in Uberlandia, we did it systematically. And you can see that from 1988 to 1995, 7%, we had five out of 67 cases. Of it. And in 30 autopsies later, we had seven same number, but five out of 30 cases, so 17 cases of patients with histoplasmosis. That is, this disease was an endemic disease in our region, undoubtedly. Here I have compiled our cases of histoplasmosis from 1988 until the present, 2022. We had four cases diagnosed of acute histoplasmosis, self-limited, self -limited, three cases of progressive, chronic progressive pulmonary histoplasmosis, and all comments are very pertinent here regarding tuberculosis cases, and we will talk about that. Mucosal lesions, isolated ones, three cases, immunocompromised hosts, we had 210 cases of HIV positive patients. HIV positive patients, we had 210 cases, 200 disseminated cases, 10 uh, localized cases, mortality, mortality rate of 25.7%. We had one severe acute disseminated case of an HIV positive patient who came hypotense and shock with disseminated uh, coagulation and in the peripheral blood. And I showed the pictures to Pasqualotto we observe the presence in monocytes of uh, histoplasm capsulatum, actually 201. So HIV patients, to, we had one, uh, what the, cirrhosis, renal transplant one, cirrhosis two, and the TNF two, old age one, three patients that were not immunodepressed, two young patients with a disseminated uh, disease and one with adrenal involvement. And this was interesting because it's a trial that we did with Adson's disease patients with the endocrinology people. And one patient had high numbers and through puncture, we diagnosed histoplasmosis. And we had one case with lipocytopenia, CD4 idiopathic. But many, many cases here, histoplasmonas, because one uh, surgeon here in Goyan, all lung nodule they see, he sees, he removes. So we see a large amount of 
Mr. Plasmonis. Our pathologist did a study out of a hundred autopsies. He took these lung nodules that we see a lot in x-rays and he tells students that this is a tuberculosis sequela. And he saw that more than 50% of these nodules were actually uh, small histoplasmomas that were asymptomatic. So we have acute cases here such as the A, an acute case, here a histoplasmoma. And we have a pulmonary chronic form, chronic uh, occurrences. So this patient was treated three times for tuberculosis. You can see cavitation in the upper left lobe with a pulmonary infiltrate bilateral so the ct showed large cavities and bubbles on the apex and he was treated three times for tuberculosis there was no response until finally culture showed it that it was histoplasm capsulatum so it was a case of histoplasmosis dr marcus lacerda commented that many chronic pneumonias fungal pneumonias are frequently misdiagnosed as tuberculosis this is a slide by Professor Arnaldo Colombo. He shows very well in this case, the, the chest X-ray is highly suggestive of tuberculosis, but there was no response to treatment. Therefore, if you have the availability of immunodiffusion test, you can do uh, a specific diagnosis of histoplasmosis. Other cases such as oral lesions, these are our published cases. Here we have an extremely curious case of a young 22-year-old patient with a disseminated form of the disease with a huge lymph nodal mass in the mesenterium. Diagnosis was of lymphoma. She ended up dying. An autopsy showed that it was disseminated histoplasmosis in a patient who was not HIV positive. Tongue lesions in an elder patient, elderly patient 89 years old. Here we have two cases of patients using biologics, biologics, biologicals, and uh, with ankylosing spondylitis. And he was taking medication, and he uh, had a he he took that because of Crohn's disease. Well, AIDS patients. This is the largest number of cases we have in this study that we conducted with 1,000 AIDS patients. They were. Uh, hospitalized in our unit, 50% has histoplasmosis. It accounts for 15% of this trial we did in 2018, which is greater than the cases in Porto Alegre, Cuiabá, and Fortaleza, and many such as French Guayana or Argentina. Our percentage of patients with AIDS and histoplasmosis is extremely big. I'd like to mention here the frequency of clinical manifestations, which is quite large. About 40% of our patients have skin lesions. Our residents know that HIV positive patients uh, with hepatosplenomegaly, fever, uh, and skin lesions, until proven differently, you should think of histoplasmosis. And here we, they saw only 16%. Other things that calls our attentions are mucosal lesions, 21% of the patients, aside from 70% of these patients having hepatosplenomegaly. So skin lesions, most diverse, sometimes they are small lesions, as you can see. The feet, people don't account much importance to the feet, but when you've researched the fungus, you find it easily. Here, too, we see uh, secondary syphilis, uh, similar lesions. And many times these lesions cover all of the body or, or large portions of the body. You can see sometimes lesions that we can see that are similar to patients with cryptococcosis. I have two publications in Minerais of histoplasmosis outbreaks in a cave. The second one here in a cave called Tambuil in the state of Minas Gerais. I don't know if you knew that, but and here in Pedro Leopoldo, you also have an outbreak of four individuals who were in contact with a bat full of, with a cave full of bats, and they all developed histoplasmosis. 
In the first paper, eight biologists did an expedition into the cave to study the prevalence of the fungus in the cave. I'm about to finish. And it was disseminated. In Uberaba, a close city to uh, Uberlandia, we have two papers on histoplasmosis with AIDS. And this other one here showing that 33% of the patients were diagnosed with histoplasmosis, but did not have uh, well, they, they they went they died before they were finally diagnosed. Well, so what do we have in our lab? What everybody does? We have histopathology. We have culture observation. In the East form, we have a histopatho. We we don't have an antigen test. We have histopathology. We don't have PCR either. And in terms of treatment, this is the last slide. We have empath. Therisin is oxycol deoxycholate, and for therisin B lipid formulation, the itraconazole and voriconazole. I reiterate to Dr. Adelaide here that we don't have, uh, we, we can't, we don't have a decision by the Ministry of Health to treat hesoplasmosis. Well, and then I'd like you to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marcelo. I'll call Jose Vidal Bermudes from Sao Paulo, who is infectologist from Emilio Ribas and Clinicas Hospital in Sao Paulo. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank for the invitation. Congratulations, Alessandro, for this effort to put together this meeting that is so important for everyone. I'll make a broader presentation because Sao Paulo data are really scarce from the clinical perspective regarding this topic. It's already been shown that Brazil is part of a hyperendemic or endemic area. We just have to see where we are regarding this. So this map has already been shown here, but I would like to highlight the relevance of scientific production and research in the areas of veterinary, in the environmental area, and in the southeast of Brazil. A lot of research has been done in this area of Brazil, in the southeast, but these do have no clinical correlation. We have a lot of basic research going on, and also a lot of research in animals, and also in the environment, but not much clinical research really in this area. Even though we have interesting numbers regarding other Brazilian states and regions, Sao Paulo has a prevalence of positive tests around 20-30%, and the number of cases, according to a literature review, have almost pretty small case series when compared to the case series in other areas of Brazil in a systematic review, including over 3,000 cases, we could see that disseminated forms in HIV positive patients account for over 80% of the cases. This, particularly after the AIDS epidemics, this became much more relevant. So Sao Paulo is uh, the center when we look at the literature regarding the major case series in Brazil, we usually have more case series from the Northeast, from the state of Rio de Janeiro, from the state of Minas Gerais. Sao Paulo is virtually not there. And this really caught, catches our attention. So mortality data from registration of that. So histoplasmosis is number three in terms of fungal infections. So this is a 
a study from Emilio Hiba's Institute of Pathology, which is a reference for HIV patients in the state of Sao Paulo. We have the same thing, histoplasmosis and the third cause of invasive fungal infections in HIV positive patients, five to 12 cases a year in the past few years at this institute using traditional methods for diagnosis. In this multicenter study with participation of Alessandro and Diego, you see Sao Paulo have 8.8%, .8%, but this series were not consecutive cases. This is a more directed case series. So it's really hard to know what the true prevalence is. But anyway, it's really important showing in patients with CD4 counts less than 50, you have more histoplasmosis than TB in these HIV positive patients. Here, all HIV patients with CD4 counts less than 100 who were admitted to the hospital, they collected a blood sample to do PCR and a urine sample also for a urine antigen and around 80% once again, that was the prevalence, eight out of 106 patients. And that was a different strategy. It was a real screening. And three out of these eight were being empirically treated for TB and the PCR or even uh, antigen really added to the diagnosis. We don't have much information regarding post-mortem analysis in the state of Sao Paulo. We have this study conducted at the Clinicas Hospital in Sao Paulo, 250 autopsies of HIV AIDS patients who died of acute respiratory failure. And you can see that in the top five, we have bacterial infection, pneumocystosis, sepsis, CMB, disseminated TB, histoplasmosis is way down on this list. So we have to be very careful with the design. Maybe this shows only part of the histoplasmosis cases. We probably have here septic patients with acute respiratory failure. And this can be one of the manifestations of histoplasmosis. And maybe what we have here is just a bias, inclusion bias. I like to highlight the issue of TB. This has been already mentioned many times. Histoplasmosis, in addition to being neglected, it's not diagnosed a lot and it's not reported a lot. When And even when it's diagnosed, not always are these cases reported to registries because as we know, this is not a notifiable disease. In a recent review, they found that in Brazil, the annual incidence of TB is seven times more than histoplasmosis. But we may challenge that because it depends very much on the prevalence scenarios of this opportunistic infection. And this is very clear here in Brazil. When we, we compare the complexity of our country, you know, Brazil is a huge country, we will see a, a variety of prevalences and outcomes in different areas of the country. Sao Paulo, TB incidence is above the national Brazilian mean. New cases of TB confirmed by lab tests, 30% of patients are empirically treated, and many times they may not have TB. This is even more alarming, number of deaths due to TB without any mention of lab confirmation, up to 65%. These are official data from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. The state of Sao Paulo accounts for roughly 23% of the TB cases in Brazil. This is the hint I think we have to follow. This study by Diego and Alessandro the centers in Latin America and the Caribbean with molecular diagnosis or 
gene diagnosis is still just a few. Another review from the Pio Cruz group, very similar results. We almost have no availability of antigens or molecular diagnosis. And finally, some issues related to logistics for diagnosis and lab testing in Sao Paulo. We know that there is a national network of labs in Brazil. In all states, there is one state reference, the lab, and Fio Cruz is the national reference, and Adolfo Lutz Institute is a collaborating center at the national level for mycology studies. In the state of Sao Paulo, surveillance for invasive mycosis is performed in the epidemiological surveillance centers, and there is passive surveillance only for histoplasmosis. And we have many hospital centers, both public, uh, not-for-profit, or private. Mycological diagnosis at Instituto Aldolfo Lutz, in addition to antibody, work up using immunodiffusion or Western blood, histopathology and molecular test, which is standardized and available at this reference center. Conventional mycological diagnosis in tertiary centers is really important. We have reference centers as UNIFESP, Clinical Hospital, Emilio Ribas, Infectious Disease Institute, but none of these services are using antigenic tests. Mycological diagnosis is virtually absent in less complex services and out of uh, these academic circuits, so to say. And mycological diagnosis in private labs is very variable. Some have antigenic tests to be performed in Sao Paulo, or they may submit samples to other countries to perform serum antigen tests, challenges for the state of Sao Paulo. Most studies are needed to identify the real dimension of human histoplasmosis in Sao Paulo, particularly of this disseminated presentation in people living with HIV. I think we have to follow the tracks of TB. I think that's the best way to expand this search for histoplasmosis cases, improve the problem-solving capacity of clinical mycology labs outside the main referral centers, incorporate and integrate antigenic diagnostic tests within the care routines and in laboratories that perform conventional mycological diagnosis, more availability of molecular diagnostics in referral centers, which is something that will be discussed later today, and the main challenge, which is reduce this lethality, which is still between 15 to 50 percent in our state in people living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidal. Now I'll call Dr. Rosana Basso, who has a PhD in Health Sciences at the University of Rio Grande do Sul and professor at the medical school, Rio Grande University. She is going to be presenting the data for the city of Rio Grande, which is located in our state, the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Alessandro. I'd like to thank all the organizing committee. Thank you, Diego. I was asked to talk about the epidemiology of the city of Rio Grande, not of the state of Rio Grande do Sul. This is the city of Rio Grande, which is located in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. No conflict of interest, Rio Grande. Rio Grande is the city with the southernmost federal university in Brazil. This is a port city with 200,000 inhabitants. It has a federal university, it's a peninsula, and its main economy is linked to its port. Our teaching hospital is 100% free health services hospital, and we provide services to 28 different cities in this part of the state, in the southernmost part of the state here. We have a service with a reference for HIV patients. We have had that service for 32 years. 
We are close to the Patos Lagoon, and this is our hospital. Well, I have to talk a little bit about epidemiology of AIDS in Brazil before talking about Rio Grande. According to this epidemiological report, which was out in December 2021, we have a detection rate in Brazil of 14 cases for every 100,000 inhabitants. In Rio Grande do Sul, we have 21 cases for 100,000 inhabitants. And in our city, we have 50 cases for every 100,000 inhabitants. We, unfortunately, are the leaders in the COMPAS index for AIDS, and we, only in the latest report, we were not first place. In the three previous reports, we were the number one city in Brazil among the cities with over 100,000 people leading the compost, composed, compound index. That said, but I cannot talk about histoplasmosis without talking about HIV. Regarding our histoplasmosis data, the first study we participated, which was coordinated by Alessandro and Diego, we showed that 10% of patients were looked at in 2017 had a diagnosis of disseminated histoplasmosis. We had a outbreak of mycological diagnosis starting in 2010 in our hospital, because in 2010, we implemented a mycology lab coordinated by Professor Melissa. And after that, we started having more diagnosis of fungal diseases. So we have mycological diagnosis in our hospital, which is done through a lab, which is related to the School of Medicine. So we did a retrospective study, 2010 to 2019, 31 cases of patients with disseminated histoplasmosis. And in the first seven years of the study, we had 15 cases. Until 2016, we had only diagnosis only using classical methods, direct mycology, mycological study and serology. Now, with the participation of Diego in the study in 2017, through research work, we could then have diagnosis also using urine antigen testing. So from 2017 to 2019, we had 16 cases. So in three years, we had more cases than in the first seven years of the study. We had a 300% increase when we started using the urine, urine antigen testing for diagnosis of disseminated histoplasmosis. And in this retrospective study, we found that severely immunocompromised patients, most of them with CD4 counts less than 100, we had skin symptoms in 58% of patients. We, in our teaching hospital for HIV patients, we only have itraconazole and amphotericin B deoxycholate. And out of these 31 cases, the lethality rate was 35% in 12 months. And then what was really standing out was that this is a teaching hospital and all people could think of was TB. The average workup for this patient until you consider TB, they had five requests for workup for TB and using gene expert, a sensitive method before they even considered it could be disseminated histoplasmosis. With all that, in 2017, through training programs with the residents and also talking with the professors at the clinic, we could increase the level of suspicion and also with the availability of the urine uh, antigen test, which is key to make the diagnosis for disseminated histoplasmosis. And through this investigation, even so, 26% of patients were treated empirically for TB. That's a shame. And what we could see was that in patients with disseminated histoplasmosis, 29% of them had documented co-infection with TB. So we thought, okay, we already have histoplasmosis diagnosis, and in spite of that, they got empirical treatment. But this is changing. 
regarding the diagnostic methods. Until 2017, we had only the classic methods. 2017, in a setting of research, we started using urine antigen testing. And since March last year, we implemented as a routine for all patients with CD4 less than 400 or with symptoms compatible with histoplasmosis, we implemented urine antigen testing. We could make that available starting last year. And preliminary results, which is the topic of Bianca's master thesis from March 2021 to March 2022, 243 patients were evaluated with 19 positive cases. So in 10 years, we have 31 cases. And in one year, we had 19 people diagnosed with disseminated histoplasmosis. So 21% is age-defining illness, and we had documented TB in 30% of these patients who had a diagnosis of disseminated histoplasmosis. We don't have the outcome for these patients yet, but we want to go on with the study until 2023 or go on with implementation depending on the Brazilian Ministry of Health waiting for them to make the antigen available to us. So Rio Grande has a federal university, which is the southernmost university in Brazil. We have the longest beach in the world, Casino Beach. And what are the treatments we have available? Amphotericin B, deoxycholate, and itraconazole in our city and at Barra do Chui. We have amphotericin B liposomal, which will start being used to treat disseminated histoplasmosis. This is our group, which is led by Professor Melissa Xavier. We have mostly women there, as you can see. So these are all our co-workers. Once again, I'd like to thank Alessandro for this great meeting. I'd like to thank Diego. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosana. I now invite all of the speakers to come up on stage. We have 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Diego, thank you. Thank you for bringing to this uh, in the previous Q&A session, the discussion about histoplasmosis and tuberculosis, which is quite important. We're talking about the diagnostic markers. The question is the use of biomarkers for the follow-up and treatment of histoplasmosis and the lab tool to measure concentrations, well, uh, I'd like to discuss this, to open this, to, to talk about it, to open the discussion. Well, it's a quite interesting question, whether there is the, the availability of monitoring the disease through serum levels of medications. Well, in Sao Paulo, we don't have such service. Neither do we. We do it We did it in the study using antigen, but we don't have a nitroconazole serum uh, dosage detection. No, it's the same criterion we use, uh, the cl clinical improvement of the patient, and they get into prophylactic therapy until the CD4 goes above at least 100%, 100 ex excuse me, 150. And uh, this is our routine and also serum levels of hydroconazole we don't have. I don't think anybody in Brazil has that, not even Curitiba, Flav is there uh, shaking his head. And I don't think any service in Rio or Sao Paulo, the Fifth Valley Rio Grande do Sul University has, but the doctors haven't accepted yet the importance of these levels and they don't request it. We don't even have a regular supply of hydroconazole. One question to Diego. Which recommendation do you make to monitor with the antigen? Regarding the antigen, same guide, 
we recommend to monitor this portion, this part. I think the information is not very clear about that. For example, there have been previous trials that in the first weeks, the antigen could be, there, there could be certain peaks because uh, usually the first doses of treatment, the antigen may go down or up, but then it becomes to be shown more significantly. I haven't seen anything on the frequency. As to bioassays to, to measure serum concentrations with nitroconazole, this would be the idea. We have to remember that this is, bioassay is a very sensitive method to be conducted. We have agar dishes, and, we, uh, and then you add the patient's serum, and you, le you measure the inhibition, and that can be extrapolated into a serum concentration of medications. Obviously, we always want the most precise thing but we should bear in mind that there may be other alternatives that are more classical, which could provide useful information to the doctors treating the patient. Dr. Juan, two comments. I believe that when you, you have to assess the progression regarding the antigen, we have to think about doing the screening and to understand that we need a sufficient number of patients regarding therapeutic concentrations. I think you, you can do an assay, you can the antibiograms with bacteria, you can apply that with any, in any location. You have to validate it every day, of course. We have to think about the drug concentrations and all that, itraconazole or uh, Unfortunately, the audio from the speaker is very low, very difficult to understand. There are more complex techniques, but you, you need a dedicated person because these equipment are complex and you need to do maintenance uh, frequent maintenance. I, Dr. Marcus, please, I'd like to make a comment. I've seen that to understand the disease load, we there is a niche that I haven't seen you mention. Those of you who talked about HIV, you said that this is when we started to become more interested in histoplasm and these uh, cave uh, cases are an exotic disease that, well, we have these cases come to us, and then you showed something about it, the prosmosis post to use them in immunobiologicals. We know that our national healthcare system makes available these biologicals, and then things started to appear, but I don't see a niche in transplant and transplantation. I train people in Manaus, and their dream is to come to uh, the Southeast to do infectious disease uh, in immunodepressed patients. So are we losing this diagnosis? Is it not taking place at all? Is our histoplasmosis reference centers, well, they're not the same as transplant centers because I have not seen the specific niche of transplanted patients and how much the disease have an impact on them, has an impact on them. Well, we have a publication that was done with a former resident of ours working at USPI on transplanted patients from the both the hospitals of USPI and Uberlandia and prevalence were very low, 0.2% only. 
of transplanted patients had histoplasmosis. In our case series, I showed two patients that had kidney transplant and had histoplasmosis. One of them died because nephrology, I said they should give amphotericin and I, she, they said they're going to she, lose her kidney. And I said, well, she's going to die with a good kidney. So they did, gave her fluconazole and she died. But in our case series, it's very small. We have more than 1,000 kidney transplanted patients in Uberlande, and I saw two cases of histoplasmosis in them. However, anti-TNF is growing. Tuberculosis is the most common, but histoplasmosis is the second most common. Crohn's disease and ankylosing spondylitis. So I think we have to be alert for that situation. Dr. Omara? Congratulations, I'm Omar from Argentina. I'm sorry, I don't speak Portuguese. This discussion is very important about biological markers. Uh, you talked about hipping and LDH, but these are the markers of dissemination. And we can't take into account diagnosis without the antigen, the risk, uh, or any other disseminated disease that we see. But the value of the antigen probably in the follow-up, the only situation in which there is evidence, as was said here, perhaps the only situation in which you could make a recommendation of the North American guide is prophylaxis greater than six months. Then uh, it would be over uh, CD4 over 150, a negative antigen. Therefore, you, you suspend this therapy. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask a question so we can reach a consensus. Which patients should we treat with itra? Conosol, and which patients should we use amphotericin? We have severe patients, maybe severe patients, amphotericin, mild patients, intraconosol, but it hasn't been very well defined. Uh, so I'd also like to ask about the experience in immunoreconstitution syndrome that we see in tuberculosis. Do you treat them with steroids? Well, that could worsen it too, could worsen histoplasmosis. I don't know if you've seen an AIDS case, if you have any focus in terms of the treatment in that regard. Thank you for your question, Omar. I don't know if I speak Portuguese or Spanish. From my point of view, and I think the topic of uh, diagnosis classification is key because when we talk about disseminated histoplasmosis, it seems to be a homogeneous group of patients. When actually what we see is the end of a spectrum, a patient is severe, many times septic to, uh, they come to a reference center that way, septic. So the WHO classification is disseminated mild to moderate histoplasmosis or my, uh, moderate to severe, it should, we, sh we should invest in this diagnosis in a more aggressive way when patients have, uh, say, when even when patients don't have uh, organ failure. And I think per perhaps this could be a point where we can follow the, the example of tuberculosis, which should not end for lab markers to become very severe, or like Cassio said, sometimes the patient comes from other states, they are migrant patients, and they have gone through so many medical services that they practically come to, the, to us to die in our hands. So the clinical classification, well, we have to think about the antigen, we have to think about disseminated histoplasmosis, not only the severe patients, but also in a patient who is in an outpatient clinic, perhaps still, and goes to primary care and is taken to a tertiary center. 
Perhaps this is where we are failing to capture these patients. And the treatment, from my point of view, in, of the disseminated form, uh, every time that it's possible, lipothyrosin B liposomal. Ampho liposomal until you stabilize the patients. And then I think I wouldn't define two weeks, but perhaps a period in which there would be a clinical stability, toler uh, drug tolerance, and then continue with itraconazole. In my experience, and we have about 10 cases a year, we've seen one or two cases only. But I think that it's very it's more infrequent than what is described in Africa, for example. In the last two years, out of 20 cases, we went. We only had two. We can speak Spanish if you want, but you understand Portuguese, right? Okay, well, I have no doubt about it. Uh, at least uh, lipid amphotericin. It doesn't have to be liposomal, but at least we have used this in these patients with this, the disseminated form of the disease. There is no, no way we can use itraconazole in these patients. Professor Negroni in Argentina had large experience treating all patients with itraconazole, and he said he did very well. I'm not brave enough. And an HIV positive patients with a disseminated form of the disease, a patient that is transplanted, the patient with lymphoma and histoplasmosis, I'm not going to treat them with itraconazole. I cannot even measure the serum levels of itraconazole. I'm and uh, to be sure that it is at a proper level to kill the fungus. So amphotericin for sure, preferably liposomal, if not lipid, and then we go to atraconosol. What was the other question? It is. We had cases of it is in with hetos, histoplasmosis patients, but now I have a patient with cryptococcosis. Uh, she exacerbated meningitis, started in, uh, in two retroviolet patients, and then exacerbated meningitis in the first two months of treatment. So it doesn't grow in the culture. This is an iris phenomenon. And that uh, treatment then with steroids will improve the patients. So now Dr. Jose Lee at the Lygian Flavio. So for those of us who are in the from the mycology lab, when you do the screening of histoplasmosis in a patients with tuberculosis, please take two single samples because if you send to bacteriology a clinical sample, it is treated for us to do tuberculosis diagnosis. Forget it. There will no be diagnosis for histoplasmosis because the treatment done in this sample we kill the fungus before anything else. And this we, we've seen very much at Fiocruz and with COVID, it was quite interesting because everything went to bacteriology and then it came to us and I had nothing. And how could it be possible? And they said, it's impossible, doctors said. So we did serology and it was positive. So it was positive. So, so the whole thing has to do with the sample manipulation. Please, every doctor should send two separate samples. This is my recommendation. Actually, I'd like to say some things about everything that has been said here. I don't know if it's the right time. If anybody wants to ask a specific question or Flavio, if you want to say, mine is very quick and straight to the point. In Curitiba, in our hospital, we currently have a growth of immunobiologicals related case, cases, Crohn's disease, solid organ transplanted patients. And we've found many histoplasmomas that are silent, which is a finding of the test. HIV, we have a small number compared to Cassius and others. But this is what we see in terms of histoplasmosis currently. Adelaide? Yes, I want to speak because 
we have this paper published on transplanted patients and I took the abstract so I could get the numbers right. And Marcus says, out of 769 liver transplanted patients, we had seven cases of histoplasmosis uh, diagnosed. So it is a common disease in transplanted patients. Liver patients, we had none in this paper at least. But I'd like to make a comment on what Kassiris said about the control of antigen during treatment uh, in patients. And I think even to save resources and to properly allocate resources, we have always observed that patients who have, well, not HIV patients, but pa patients, when they adhere to patients, they progress well. Some patients we haven't even tried. Patients left, were treated in the hospital for pneumocystosis, and when in the outpatient, the CD4 increased, the viral load, and, that, and patients became great. So what were we to do? He was no longer sick from histoplasmosis. I think we need to, we did, I think they're doing quite well. So in terms of resource allocations, we need to do diagnosis at the right time to control, but for treatment control, I think we need to be sure that this is necessary. Since we have CD4 and viral load, then we can observe the case progressions. Good morning, we have some questions on the chat from the live transmission of the YouTube channel. One is, what is the pathway to make this disease uh, of compulsory notification in Brazil? To, this is a question from Simone. Just to complement what Dr. Terezinha was saying regarding transplant, we in Ceará, in the city of Fortaleza, our center is different from the center that does transplantation. So we may have been lo maybe losing diagnosis as well because in our hospital we are used to, we microbiologists and biochemists are used to doing conventional diagnosis and in other hospitals they don't. We had a re recent lupus case from a state hospital and the colleague sent the material to us because the resident was suspecting this suspecting of disseminated the, his plasmosis and then we close the diagnosis so we need to train more mycologists which we don't have home we don't have. and well lab support is quite interesting we will now purchase equipment to do antigens too and we do antigenuri and even doing so much diagnosis through blood culture during the in the two times that we use the antigen uh, the team was very much interested because of course it's quicker so we will discontinue the antigen tests and antigen research the unit is very much concentrated on hiv we will have more disseminated histoplasmosis and in these almost 800 cases, five were in non-HIV patients, a child who came to us, and four elderly patients, male patients. The other thing is iris. We noticed that in uh, the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, iris. When we did the urinary antigen test and when the, the therapy we did not observe iris in AIDS patients, in HIV patients with histoplasmosis. But the, we hope we can have the breakpoints, the, the moments in which we can collect urinary antigens after early treatment to see if we have to retreat and, and, and to see what the tolerable levels are. We hope they are still high, like we did with this other study in which the antigen was still quite elevated and we be, we chose to retreat patients with any symptoms. Well, I have a number of things to clarify. First of all, the compulsory notification disease. We have done several, countless 
attempts to include endemic mycosis as uh, compulsory notification diseases. And countless times it has been denied by our health surveillance secretary. So we try to show that in order for us to establish any public policy to help patients with fungal infections, we need to know what the country situation is, and we don't have that. Therefore, in terms of numbers, what do we have? In a hospitalization system that does not give us this reality. So the last attempt, we haven't managed to do that. The last attempt was in 2019. In 2020, they mistakenly published this, and one month later, a new publication excluded it. So we don't know what the reality of fungal infections are without this. So we have uh, under construction an information system in which we decided to connect the release of medications or drugs to the case notification. So it's not ideal, but the pilot to trial should be in the second half of this year. So this will be a, not the ideal, but an early tool for us to begin to have an idea of what is happening in the country. So it has to be a notifiable disease, and but it needs to come from the, the decision makers. And while that doesn't happen, we'll take the shortcut and find other ways to to try to achieve that. Regarding itraconazole, we had a period without any supply of itraconazole, which coincided with the COVID period. We found it very difficult to obtain itraconazole uh, again, but I'd like to tranquilize all of you, especially you, that it has been normalized. The, the, already the this, the supply of itraconazole. So there's no problem with that. Another uh, front that we are fighting, and I and I see, of, uh, I and I have been fighting about it for more than 20 years together with the ministry, and now we are beginning to have some victories, some achievements. We are very much criticized. When I say we, I see the mycosis. Uh, working group, not the ministry necessarily, but why don't they release it for PVHIV? I know that the alarm is sounding, but I have to talk now. This is a this has been a political determination from many, many years ago. This was a pact in the tripartite management committee in which the sec state secretary, the, the sec health secretaries would be responsible for all opportunistic infections of HIV patients. Therefore, we, and as a doctor, of course, it's pointless. And we've been fighting for a few years now about that. And this year we have managed at least to take to uh, CG the, for, for them to treat patients with um, meningitis and And other and cryptocosis, but now they uh, now we are taking to the agenda of CT all fungal infections, PV, HIV, all of them that we can provide medical assistance to. Just to give you some uh, answers here and to put to, to update you on what the situation is. So we want and we're trying to at least. Uh, have the fungal infections encompassed in this so we can treat these patients. And this is a work that we are doing in partnership with the Sexually Transmitted Infections Coordination Center, uh, HIV, tuberculosis, 
this is something that we are planning to screen fungal infections and in all patients who are being screened for tuberculosis. We should work together and we are certain that this will increase and, and improve our diagnosis much more. These are a few achievements that we have been making. And I think they, it will benefit everyone. We become uh, eager and anxious to solve things, but I am not going to give up. I think it's an end, end's work and we've done little by little, but we are at it. And uh, regarding diagnosis, we are restructuring a diagnosis network. We have done many, many uh, trainings in 2010, 2011. And then uh, everybody is dismissed and they now are being trained again. And last year, uh, last week and last same at the last same, People were trained, 11 states were trained for basic mycologic diagnosis. So these are steps we have to follow. And regarding antigen, I will talk about it tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Adelaide. Well, congrats to everyone who presented their, their talks. Thank you. Pessoal, pessoal, aviso a todos que tem um coffee break agora no salão principal e logo à frente, por favor. 30 minutos de intervalo.
Alô? Bem, esse final de manhã nós vamos dar continuidade ao evento, agora com uma, uma sessão muito interessante de manifestações clínicas. Ok, we will now mo move on with our meeting. A very interesting session on clinical manifestations. I have my friend here, uh, Kasia Godoy. Firstly, we have Terezinha Maria de Jesus Silva, she has broad experience with acute histoplasmosis, and she's going to talk about acute histoplasmosis in this time frame that was awarded to her. Thank you very much. Good morning. I thank you for the invitation. It's great to see old friends after two years and find everyone well and be able to hug our friends. This is priceless, really. So I'm very grateful for that. I have been asked to talk about acute histoplasmosis. I will briefly, and not, I will not dwell into the, the pathogenesis of the condition. On the contrary, you teach me a lot every day. So infection begins when small fragments are inhaled and the patient, and this, then they, it can survive with all of the barriers of innate immune, immune, the innate immune system. Uh, then there is, well, it, it hits the alveol, alveoli. And in this trajectory, that is when the transformation of these fun, fungus partic particles are transformed. I apologize for not mastering the technology here. Well, I have a summary in this chart of cells that are important in this defense mechanism. Here we have some of the important cells in this. We have the pathogen response. The macrophage has a crucial importance in this, the pathogenesis of histoplasmosis, because it, be, it ends up being the vehicle through which uh, it disseminates through the organism. So it survives, it, the histoplasm survives in the macrophage, and through that, it can be spread through different regions of the body. That's why it is considered a systemic mycosis because it follows. I'm sorry, I'm really messing things up here. So histoplasmosis is considered a systemic mycosis because it has this spreading process, it may affect any organ, especially those rich in immune system cells, lung, liver, spleen, lymph nodes. And because of that, it has a variety of clinical manifestations, which may cause lat latency in the granuloma form. It, uh, well, that microorganism may be latent and be reactivated later. Here, we have the clinical spectrum, the different presentation forms of histoplasmosis. The vast majority, you know, is asymptomatic. 80% is asymptomatic. The acute disease is auto-limited, self-limited. After a period of 7 to 21, day, 21 days, there may be a benign condition, influenza-like, or it could be more severe, such as pneumonia. This takes place because of the number of conidia inhaled. If the number of conidia inhaled is larger, the manifestations will be more... Uh, obvious they will have more severe or if the individual has an inadequate immune response there may be a severe condition needing ventilatory support this condition can be disseminated and it's usually associated with the inadequate immune response. And if the individual has a structural disease, a pulmonary disease, chronic disease, there will be uh, more problems. And what's important and has been shown is the virulence of the fungal strain. Here we have the clinical manifestations of radiological findings of pulmonary histoplasmosis, which is the most, most common manifestation of acute histoplasmosis. histoplasmosis. You have all these systemic uh, symptoms, fever, headache, dry cough. You have chills, chest pain. If you have you have a, a lymph node enlargement and the radiological findings is a pulmonary infiltrate 
uh, with the increase of lymph nodes and the and mediastinal lymphadenopathy or hillier lymphadenopathy. This is what makes a suspect of histoplasmosis. So that is key in the presence of this increase of hillier and mediastinal lymph, lymphadenopathy. This is what makes us suspect of histoplasmosis because the condition is very much characteristic of many diseases. The disseminated form, Aside from the dry cough, fever, weight loss, malaise, we have uh, skin densenium filtrate and oropharynx lesions. We have a reticular uh, nodular infiltrate with the miliary type. And then you see the presence of these nodules. This is a patient, a female patient who went to visit a Sierra region of Sierra and she had chest pain cough and and the x-ray we noticed that there was an enlargement here in the miliary region and then the patient was treated and this and it disappeared this is a patient we can see here the pulmonary the lung infiltrate and the past the presence of adenomegaly hillier and mediastinal this is a three-year-old patient. This boy had many allergy symptoms, had persistent coughing. The aunt decided to take him to the doctor. In the x-ray, we could see this enlargement of lymph nodes in the hillier uh, region, very pronounced. Here we see in the uh, CT a calcification. This child also improved a lot with the treatment with itraconazole and serology was positive. Itraconazole. Uh, this is interesting. This patient, he was a supervisor of the city administration and he had just visited a building that was being renovated and his complaints were systemic ones. He had malaise, he had some cough, but this cough was not what bothered him the most. What bothered him the most was the headache and a pain on his eye and joint pain, as if it were dengue fever. And 12 days later, the patient presented these skin lesions because of the persisting cough. We did a CT, x-ray was normal, and in the CT, we visualized the infiltrate. Serology was positive and the patient was treated for histoplasmosis with itraconazole and progressed well. This is another case, it's more severe. The patient in early December began with, uh, started with chest pain, dry cough, high fever. He was treated for pneumonia, didn't improve. He was treated for tuberculosis, didn't improve. And by the end of the month, he was admitted to the ICU with a respiratory failure condition. This is his x-ray. And, and he was treated for tuberculosis because he had lung infiltrates, especially in the apex region regions. So he didn't improve. So we thought of a fungus and he re reported that he worked in the airport and he reported that he had been called to call to, to, to clean a shed that had been abandoned. And he said that in this shed, there are many uh, droppings of birds and, and bats. So the friend, he went with a friend, the friend had nothing, but he presented with that, he had that uh, condition. And then we treated him and he was well. This is an HIV patient with a CD4 of 189, uh, that is above 150. And this patient had a localized pulmonary form of histoplasmosis with reticular mod nodular infiltrate, and he progressed well. Here we see only the nodular forms. So what are the complications that you may have in the acute form of hitoplasmosis? You may have pericarditis, rheumatologic syndromes too, similar to the patient I showed. You can have erythema nodosum, you can have mediastinal fibrosis, an abnormal inflammatory reaction only with patients with HLAA2. You may have histoplasmona and bronchiolithiasis. These are the most cited manifestations and the diagnosis is a challenge. It is not very available. You need pro, uh, adequate specialists to do it. Well, what we have adequate uh, methods. What we have is we have these, the, this method here has a low sensitivity. 
we have direct visualization. If it's acute, an acute uh, form of histoplasmosis, the antibody detection helps in the detection. Half of the patients that we have diagnosed of acute histoplasmosis was uh, provided to us by serology. LPD has doesn't has LFD has no not does not have such good sensitivity, but in the nuclei. Uh, so detection is what is in the for the future. We compare lung con lung cases, lung conditions with this the tests here. The acute and subacute pulmonary histoplasmosis here we they refer to the immunocompetent patient. The acute form would be the HIV patient that I showed you that has that diffuse infiltrate and presented in a more severe way. You can see here a low detection of antigen. You have greater frangimia when you have a larger fungal load. But, uh, in a patient that is immunocompetent, you see it's lower. Serology is much greater in subacute form than in the acute form. If you combine both antigen detection of antigen and antibody, you increase diagnostic sensitivity. Here, while my time is going fast, I want to discuss a few cases with you. This is the role of lateral flow. You can see that sensitivity is very low. If you have a more severe form of the disease, you can improve this sensitivity. Uh, treatment for immunosuppressed patients that have had it for more than a month and amphotericin B. Well, I always say that I hope for the day when uh, this uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate is prescribed because it is, it would be so great when that day comes. The cases that I mentioned about these uh, transplants, they were treated for uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate, and it's a very expensive treatment. So we did a survey in Fortaleza for the pa for ten year cases of patients. They were all. Uh, they did not have any previous history of immunosuppression. They came from the systemic mycosis lab and from private medical offices. We identified 21 cases of histoplymosis in HIV negative patients. We excluded four because they were immunosuppressed patients. And we found eight cases of acute histoplasmosis, six required hospitalization, and they were all treated. We had one death in the acute group. The age was about 35 years. Symptoms, clinical features were those respiratory symptoms. Uh, the microphone, the speaker's microphone is failing. Well, this is a young patient, 24-year-old medical student. You can have to think how difficult it is to think of histoplymosis in cer certain situations. The main complaint of this patient was dysphagia and chest pain. That's why he did upper uh, GI endoscopy. And then they, this was thought to be a necrotic material. He was treated for tuberculosis, this boy, because he went to the doctor, he did a chest CT, they collected biopsy, it was positive for histoplasm and histopathology was negative. His diagnosis was because of serology and he only suspected because he watched a film talking about histoplasmosis and he thought it was similar to what he had and actually it was. This is a case of death, a very emblematic patient, he was a poultry farm driver, so he took the droppings from the birds and he sold it when you can do it, when, at the time back in the, when you could do it. And he complained of hemoptysis mainly in the pulmonary, in the lung biopsies. He had granuloma, he improved a lot with atroconazole, but it's 
he was treated. They did a new biopsy. Histoplasm appeared again, and then he progressed with a condition that was repeated eight months later after he started treatment. He was di diagnosed an interlobal artery aneurysm. The patient went through embolization to do a resection later, but he died before the second resection was done. This was a very emblematic, very interesting case. And this is the yin yang sign that shows turbulence. So it could be an aneurysm. Conclusions. These cases were detected in an isolated way, not in outbreaks, as it is usually diagnosed, suggesting that exposure to histoplasma can be more widespread than presumed in Seara state. Despite the auto-limited outcome of the disease, that can occur even in previously healthy patients. Well, I've, I was reading Clarice Lispector, and I thought, as I am as you see me. I'm may be as light as a breeze or as strong as a gate. It depends on how and when and how you see me pass. I apologize for going so fast and for going over my time. I forgot to introduce Dr. Terezia, who is, uh, has a PhD in infectious diseases and now is full professor at the Federal University of Paraná. Sorry for that. Seara, from the Federal University of Seara. Now, I'm pleased to invite Dr. José Teixeira from the city of Rio Grande do Sul. He is an infectious disease doctor at Santa Casa Hospital in Porto Alegre and associate professor at the pneumology department at the Health Sciences School in Porto Alegre. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pascal Otto, for the invitation. <clears throat> I was asked to talk about chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis and specifically chronic cavitary pulmonary histoplasmosis. And in order to do that, I will start, since I have nothing to disclose, I have no conflict of interest. So I'll report a case, a 39 years old woman who used to work in farming, a tobacco farming, smoker, 30 pack years, who has a non-productive cough and dyspnea in the past four months, night sweats, no fever, no weight loss. Nothing was found on her physical examination. She had already had a workup in another uh, center, but she has uh, had anemia, which was uh, found in lab tests. And this is the image. We can see two cavities, one with a fluid level in both upper lobes. A CT, CT scan was performed. And here we can see a sequence of CT scans. We have thin walls, but the fluid level is evident. Then these walls become thicker as the one you can see on the left. And this leads to consolidation. We see an air bronchogram here. And this is the sequence of images for this patient. Many negative sputum smears for tuberculosis and fungi. Bronchoalveolar lavage didn't show anything at all when doing the workup for mycobacteria and fungi, she has anchor positive 1 to 80 and a negative and immunodiffusion tests for aspergillus, histoplasma, and paracocosoidosis were negative. This anchor, the result, it took a long time. So turn turnaround time was long. She then underwent a puncture. This is not of her case. This is just to give you an idea of the size of the fragment. I performed bronchoscopy for workup. A transbronchic biopsy gives you very small fragments, and sometimes pathologists have a hard time. Sometimes the procedure is uh, more complex, and puncture gives you a very good sized fragment, which you can then split this material and then perform any tests. This was the result of the needle aspiration and the needle biopsy. 
specimen showing histoplasma in this patient. And here we have the major challenge when performing a differential diagnosis, as has already been mentioned by many speakers who spoke before me. Differential diagnosis with tuberculosis, but also chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, it may be similar on X-ray and CT, chronic cavitary pulmonary histoplasmosis. According to the literature, the cases of chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis have more nodular lesions. Series are variable in terms of outcome. There are two major series, one showing up to 87% of cavitation, but many cases were treated as being TB, another shows 7%, but these are all small series. And I'd like to highlight non-infectious diseases because they too may lead to a sim similar picture. This patient had an anchor of 1 to 80, showing that she probably had a Wagner or something else, but sarcoidosis may lead to similar pictures, as is also the case with the lymphomas. According to the literature then, in order for us to have chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis, we should usually have a structural change in the lung parenchyma. And then histoplasma infection it would be characterized with these bilateral lesions usually more predominant in the places where TB usually occurs, namely upper lobes, apical and apical posterior segments. Now, from the point of view of symptoms, usually we don't have many symptoms when, I, when you have cavitation. Of course, you may have fibrosis and uh, respiratory failure, but this characteristic of having it in the same places where you have tuberculosis leads to confusion in terms of diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and empirical treatment. For many years, we attended meetings at Santa Casa Hospital with Dr. Severo, and Severo loved to show these cases of histoplasmosis who had worked diagnosed as TB before. And we come, came to an agreement before we struggled because we had to show residents that pulmonary histoplasmosis existed, but that TB was more prevalent. He would say, this was treated as TB, but it was histoplasmosis. And then I would stand up and say, Severo, they will get it all wrong. They will think that histoplasmosis is more important than TB. It's important for you because you are looking for histoplasma all the time, but the most prevalent disease is TB. But you got it right, haven't you? You have to learn how to diagnose both. Most recent series emphasized the importance of chronic cavitary histoplasmosis. And as I said, a study showing a cavitation rate of 87% and another study showing 8% in older, older K series. We don't have more recent series in the literature. This is a review showing cough and sputum production as the most frequent symptoms. And also most of these patients have a cavitation after three years as shown in the study from the 1950s. In terms of radiological changes, we have cavitation, some of them that are thin walled, other with thicker walls. And something very important is that we do have excavation in lung cancer with thickened walls. And that cavitation, particularly the one on the left, is thicker. So you may have that. From the diagnostic point of view, as has already been shown here, and the genemia 88%, antigen antibodies 83%, pathological findings and culture, you see that culture much less. This is a series published by Dr. Severo. This was Dr. Gisela Uni's PhD thesis published in 2005 in the Brazilian journal. Out of the 12, 212 cases of histoplasmosis diagnosed at Santa Casa Hospital, between 1980 and 2005, 10 
were cases of chronic pulmonary hysoplasmosis. The main manifestations were cough, dyspnea, fever, anorexia, and weight loss. Radiological findings, patients with areas with emphysema, cystic cavities, bronchiectasis, and pleural thickening, all of them had had contact, particularly with chicken uh, droppings and an old abandoned chicken coop. And one case had also colonization by Aspergillus fumigatus. In relation to treatment, this series that were included in this review article shows that depending on the situation, conservative treatment, depending on the persistence of the cavity, it was lower when compared to the use of amphotericin B. And of course, when you perform a surgery, you remove it and you solve the problem. IDSA recommends itroconazole for at least one year, but some clinicians suggest uh, for two years. And this is a case of chronic cavitary sarcoidosis. As you can see, lesions are very similar. Here are a case of pulmonary vasculitis. It's very similar. These are not my cases. I took this from the literature with similar features. And here a case of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma also suggesting that it should be part of a differential diagnosis. Conclusions. Chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis is difficult to diagnose. Its prevalence is unknown. It's very hard to find material on that information are obtained from historical case series. Every patient with suspected tuberculosis where you don't find bacilli, should, you should ha have a workup for histoplasmosis and chronic cavitary pulmonary histoplasmosis should be included in differential diagnosis whenever you have lung cavitation. As in this case of this patient, if the result of ANCA, if the turnaround time was quicker, I don't know if we would have puncture this patient. Why? Because we would be pleased with the diagnosis. And puncture showed the presence of histoplasmosis. I like to listen to the bell ring, but I'm done. I'm in the conclusions already. So with that, I used less time than I had available for my talk. And now I would like to say that I'm really happy to be here talking about histoplasmosis. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay a tribute to Dr. Severo, because I learned from him a lot about fungal infections. And as a resident, I had the pleasure to go down to his lab, look at the slides and learn about the infection in a different way. Just as, as I had the opportunity to look at microbiology with Petrillo and like to study bacteria, they were two pneumologists. Petrillo is no longer among us, but they both showed and gave us the opportunity when we were residents to have this idea of the clinic and of the lab and doing it simultaneously and very closely. Additionally, I also had a pleasure of being a student of Dr. London. So fungal infections and the personalities of fungal diseases, I've always had the privilege of being close to them. And I'd like to thank you for this privilege to be with you. And I would like to thank Pascualo to thank you very much. Continuing. Continuing with our discussion of clinical manifestations, uh, I think we all should leave some uh, something for the future generations. And uh, our generosity in teaching is so important for that reason. I'm going to call now Monica Bay. She is an infectious disease specialist in Rio Grande do Norte state, and she's going to talk about disseminated histoplasmosis and AIDS. Thank you, 
Thank you, Cassia. I'm going to start by going against Dr. Paolo because I am ever more doubtful about uh, whether we should think about histoplasmosis first or, or tuberculosis first. I think it should be histoplasmosis, especially in my reality of, of HIV patients. We have many papers, especially by the, Guyana, the French Guyana people who aren't here today, but trying to call attention to the importance of this disease in HIV patients, especially with advanced HIV patients in Latin America. This paper here, dated 2020, showed that 43% of Latin American countries have an instance of disseminated histoplasmosis greater than that of tuberculosis patients who have HIV. In 67% of these countries, the mortality by disseminated histoplasmosis is also larger than that of tuberculosis. So we've been doing this awareness uh, raising work, especially in, for, in the professionals who go through our service, how this disease kills and how we have to think about it in a, uh, when we are dealing with HIV patients. And where, why is there this association? Why is there a greater severity of histoplasmosis in HIV patients? We see that ma the macrophages of HIV positive patients have a defective activity against the histoplasma. So they find it difficult to uh, bind to the funga, fungus yeasts to be phagocytes, and the fungus then brings uh, uh, grows more in the macrophages affected by HIV. Uh, besides, the CD4 cells are extremely important in controlling infection through the release of interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. Hence, we understand why the reason for the next uh, lecture here, why patients with immune biologicals have an increased risk, risk of this infection. HIV patients have usually have a progressive disseminated histoplasmosis fa uh, form, either acute or subacute. Usually it takes weeks for it to progress, two, four weeks, sometimes even more especially in patients with a CD4 greater than 150. Patients with a higher CD4 may have acute uh, forms of even pulmonary histoplasmosis cases that are isolated. There is a whole discussion about uh, cell, well, reactivation versus new exposure. We don't know how to establish this yet, but the fungus cells will migrate from the lungs to any organs that are rich in mononuclear phagocytes. Therefore, it is very much like tuberculosis. Anywhere in the organism may be affected by the infection. And for us in Natal, we do a lot of differential diagnosis with the uh, leishmaniosis, leishmaniasis. So it's a systemic disease that will be manifested in patients with, uh, with fever, night sweats, weight loss. We know that fever, night sweats, and weight loss is tuberculosis. We learned that in school. There is also hepatosplenomegaly, which is very common, and x-ray infiltrates, which may be diffuse or reticular endothelial. These two patients are patients who have been included in the ambisomy uh, paper in the ambisomy survey in Natal, and this patient came to us with this image findings. He, we, he, we started treatment for pneumocystosis, and we now have the habit in the hospital. Any patient coming with fever before anything else, we collect antigen for histoplasma. And then we we saw that they had uh, an antigen for histoplasma in the urine too, and other ones uh, that ended up being a disseminated histoplasmosis. This is one la patient that was included just now. He had this very characteristic bill, uh, liar infiltrate iliar infiltrate, and we did many, many tests. They were all negative, but we found this. This other case was quite interesting. 
and I'm giving you a spoiler because I know Valeri will present this image in his class as well, in his lecture as well. This patient had skin lesions and he had fungus present in the sputum. This is a sputum test showing the fungus and this is a uh, smear of the same. Look at the amount of fungus here. We don't have very much uh, very um, state-of-the-art equipment that we managed to visualize this. And this was a patient with disseminated disease. Not all patients have skin lesions. I would say a minority of patients in Natal presented with skin lesions. When we see patients in uh, Natal, we think of uh, histoplasma. This is another patient uh, admitted in the COVID ICU. It's an HIV patient with COVID. And he had disseminated histoplasmosis, a lot of skin lesions. This is an a, a bone marrow aspirate. And this is after amph amphotericin. So there was a significant improval after treatment with amphotericin. I brought this uh, paper here from the people, from uh, colleagues from Fortaleza, showing the clinical manifestations that we commonly see in HIV infected patients with uh, HIV histoplasmosis patients. Most of them will have fever, cough, weight loss. And one thing that calls our attention very much is the presence of diarrhea associated with the clinical picture. More so than skin lesions, we see these patients very commonly with diarrhea, anemia, also then hepatomegaly, spinomegaly, all the other changes come after. As to the lab tests, it's very common for you to have pancytopenia, especially anemia and, pl and platelet-penia in these cases, an increase of LDH and AST. It's been mentioned here when you have an AGL, the L LDH above 1,000, this should already call our attention early on to think about this diagnosis. And in the multivariate analysis, the factors which were associated with disseminated histoplasmosis were acute re renal failure, splenomegaly, respiratory insufficiency, or failure, proteinuria, hypotension, hepatomegaly, cutaneous lesions. These skin lesions were less associated as, uh, with histoplasmosis, at least in our, in our region. This paper has been shown already, but I think it's always worthwhile to show it. It was a study coordinated with by Diego and Pascualotto, assessing patients with HIV and histoplasmosis. Here in Brazil, we see in the multivariate analysis what the predictor of histoplasmosis in these patients was a CD4 lower than 50 presence of pancytopenia miliary infiltrate in the chest, x-ray, hepatomegaly, and then HDL above 1,000. Well, lymphadenopathy was against, it was not associated with it. One thing that is important for us to highlight is that the reality of Brazil is not the same in all states. I know more, other presentations mentioned that. So we should pay attention to the fact that to us in the Northeast and for the Midwestern region here represented by Goiânia, the prevalence of histoplasmosis in the PVHIV patients population is very different from that, what we see in Sao Paulo or in Rio Grande do Sul. So PLHIV patients, excuse me, uh, so it's different from other regions of Brazil, and it should pay attention to that, where the patient is coming from uh, to think about one disease more than another. This slide has been shown already as well, just to highlight that patients with the CD4 lower than 50 in the overall analysis for Brazil, histoplasmosis was more prevalent than tuberculosis. 
especially in this presentation, therefore, when the CD4 is lower than 50, perhaps we should think first about histoplasmosis and not tuberculosis. Differential diagnosis with no specific test is it's very hard. The clinical picture is exactly the same as miliary tuberculosis. It's very uh, similar to visceral leishmaniasis. And perhaps there will be no uh, less frequent cutaneous lesions, skin lesions, but we have many cases of histoplasmosis with no skin lesions. As to visceral leishmaniasis, a greater hepatosplenomegaly, less pulmonary involvement, al albumin, globulin inversion. But again, it's very difficult to do this differential diagnosis without specific tests. Well, I am concluding now. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Felipe Prohaska, who is infectious disease doctor in Pernambuco with the School of Medicine of Olinda, and he is an infectious disease doctor in charge of the Brazilian group Onco Clinica. He will be talking about histoplasmosis and the use of immunobiological agents. Hello, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to be here to talk about this subject. It's a provocative subject. And we have a 20 hours course at our university about this that I had to summarize it in 15 minutes. I was sitting back to let's see if it works and I can do it in the time I have. These are, this is my disclosure. We have over 150 immunobiological in Brazil, and in the next five years, we have 750 in phase three or four trials about to enter the market. So the world is changing, and things are really changing very quick. If 150 is hard to study, imagine if you have 750 available in the market. We have different classes, but we are have new classes emerging. But to make things even worse, when you talk about virus and kinase and TOR, you have eight subclasses. Regarding surface antigens, we have additional five. So we have many drugs coming, but when you break them down into classes, it's easier because they follow the same behavior. Sometimes you have a change in intensity, but they follow what has been established for the particular drug class. And when we talk about immunological pathways, in order to try to understand, one of the issues has been the formation of granulomas. And when you talk about, specifically about histoplasmosis, what are we talking about? We are talking about drugs that work directly on interferon. And when you have a drug that works directly on interferon, you have a higher risk. Now, when you have a drug that will do something to interferon indirectly, the risk is proportional to the degree of interference on interferon. That's why we have to understand the role of interferon to see how this is used. That's why in the beginning is beyond tuberculosis. We always think about TB, but unfortunately, we have other diseases as well as granuloma. Everything starts in TH1, TH, up to TH17. When you talk about TH1, what has a greater impact on inter interferon is macrophages. When you, have, when you look at interleukin-17, it's much broader because there you go to many different immune profiles. Even though it acts indirectly, it's much broader. Immune biologics, you open up it, door and you close another door and the other way around. So it, if you open a door, if you close a door to TNF, but if opened another door and it may lead to granulomatosis and also autoimmune granulomatosis, the drug will block the autoimmune disease, but it will open a door to infectious diseases. The green there are the leukocytes. They are around the fungus and they surround the mycobacterium, and by doing so, embraces them forming a granuloma to prevent 
expansion when the drug is used, you prevent leukocytes to do that. And the door then is open and the fungus will spread through the blood or by being there in the area. And there's an excellent review study published in 2020. They show all the steps for fungus cytokine and leukocyte adhesion, interleukin 1, 6, and 4, phagocytosis goes down. The macrophages and phagocytes are the main players, and NK cells too. They are the main cells controlling fungus, particularly when they are in the form of spores, oxidative process, and activation mechanisms, and all this is impacted by the drugs. Formation of the granuloma, granuloma, cages granulomas, is not the same as tuberculosis, and sometimes the patient has a TB diagnosis and say, well, I had tuberculosis, and unfortunately, many times it was not TB. Maybe they got better because the immunity got better, but not improved because it was properly treated. So you may have a sporotrichosis after one year of treatment. We see TNF alpha disseminated his plasmosis. The first treatment was for TB. Didn't get better because there was. Why will I say it's tuberculosis? We have to expand our workup and look at how many diseases may form a granuloma, sarcoidosis, or infectious diseases, leishmaniasis. Sporotrichosis, and that's a big confusion. What about Bartonella? You may treat with a different drug. Rifampsin, six months got better. That was TB. How many Bartonella infections were treated when people thought it was TB? It's abdominal TB. That was a bacillary adiomitosis, and the drug will treat that. It was just for a few days, but to be sure, they treated the patient for months. Rensenic disease, venereal lymphogranoma, sarcoidosis, Wagner's. So you have many, many different conditions. Now, if it's autoimmune disease, the drug will treat. If it's infectious disease, it will disseminate it. This is a study by Bartley on the TNF alpha used in the world, their indications and their impacts. And he mentions everything that ends in MUMAB is human. Everything that ends in ZUMAB is humanized. And everything that ends in CMAB is chimeric, coming either from mice or rabs. Rituximab, mice. Golimumab, human. Infliximab, mice. Adalimumab, human. And then you've learned. And they will think that you know all the 150 by heart. Adalimumab is human, right? Only by knowing that, what about this sept? This is a fusion protein. So it has been genetically changed. It's been changed in the lab. That's why it has this ending, sept. Okay, you know by heart all 150 available in Brazil. And these are the indications for clinical use and off-label use. Indication has been growing a lot because we are understanding better the immune profile of the patient. And then we have the big issue. When you do TNF alpha, as in TB, this is also for histoplasmosis, not only for histoplasma. And this study is interesting. By Cantini, we use PPD in Brazil as a marker. If PPD is greater than 10, you start prophylaxis. He conducted a study comparing PPD with quantiferon. And he determined in the study that 40% of patients with PPD are, are PPD positive didn't need prophylaxis. They wouldn't need prophylaxis. So, but we don't have quantiferon. We don't have quantiferon, so we do more prophylaxis than needed. We should be aware of that. You, you do a PPD, it's okay, and the patient start presenting disseminated signs. You have to treat for TB, but you have to do a different workup and to not waste time because otherwise the disease will spread very fast. This study with varicella zoster is interesting because those who had facial zoster, a number had stroke, why? Local vasculitis. So 
when we have patients with disaster on the face that are on TNF alpha, we do a cyclovir prophylactically to prevent stroke. Listeria salmonella, we have to be careful with whatever we eat. And hepatitis B, I think that's the greatest, the odds ratio is high. You have to be careful if you have a positive test, you should consider prophylaxis. These are the moderate risk drugs, even though the axis is complex involving TH1 as part of and part of TH17, it doesn't interfere directly on the interferon, and it is not necessarily a risk factor for TB or histoplasma. But it it isn't the biggest concern. But as you do PPD prophylactically, as you do PPD in order to see whether you're going to do prophylaxis or not, you pay attention to anti EL anti EL17 with these drugs used for psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, anti-leukin-1 for rheumatoid arthritis, which we use in our practice, anakira, canakinumab, and some tyrosine kinase inhibitors, some of them, JAK2 inhibitors, and JAK2 has been used a lot for rheumatoid arthritis in refractory setting. And in this cartoon, look at the summary. You are always confused. I think I'll get a bell ringed. So I cannot talk about all of them. Look at TNF alpha here, the drugs involved. Look at tyrosine kinase, the number of receptors involved at different sites. That's why you have eight subclasses. This is from the same study, from the Davis study. This study is pretty interesting. Low risk, it depends on the CD4 count. These drugs, alentuzumab, that has been used a lot whenever you have solid organ transplant rejection, CLA4, anti alfa 3 for plaque, psoriasis, sometimes of melanoma, fingolimut for multiple sclerosis, and for refractory multiple myeloma, they decrease CD4 count. You have to measure CD4 and CD8 levels and in the study by Pascalotti also has been mentioned here when you have CD4 the low if it's less than 150 you have a greater risk for histo histoplasmosis and for TB and that's true the other day I had a patient with a lesion on the face CD4 was 58 we made a biopsy and we found spores weird it also has filaments okay open the mouth please she has a rotten tooth we extracted the tooth, the biopsy had uh, isoplasma both on the tooth and on the gums with a skin lesion on the face. Bone marrow transplant, you rarely do that whenever you have a bone marrow transplant. She used one of these drugs before the transplant and it happened. Proteasomes, bortezomib, they are for blame to blame in some studies, but these drugs that have been used also for transplant patients to control moon-mediated uh, rejection, these two drugs come with, are used with very high dose of steroids. I think that the culprit is, are actually the steroids and not these drugs. This is a summary, the response of this specific group of drugs. I won't have time to go into details. And when we talk about diagnosis and treatment, we've discussed and we've already talked about this here, all the diagnostic text antigen is by far the best one, because particularly in immune suppressed patients. And even in, even in HIV patients, antigen testing is better. And we need that diagnosis. If you have an open door, you don't have, you cannot treat with the itraconazole, the door is open. You cannot just use itraconazole because it interferes with these other drugs as well in patients with this disease. So it, you really have to use amphotericin for these patients. Four to six weeks because they have disseminated disease. The best method 
treating method for these patients to know if it's been treated or not is PET scan. It may be gallium scintigram, it's cheaper, and the sensitivity from 95 goes down to 90%. It's a good sensitivity. We have profiles of patients with control when it goes above five glycolytic uh, activity suggestive of infection. This has been increasing, particularly osteomyelitis. Patients with osteomyelitis with more than one bone involved, all of them have to undergo PT scan or scintigram to see if it's been cured or not. Antigen levels can be used as a comparison to know whether the patient was effectively treated or not. But we have been achieving good results in more than five cases that you just treated and the treatment when the PET scan was okay. And sensitivity of TLG and SUV, TLG, 94% of sensitivity, 100% specificity. So this is what we use, TLG and MV, metabolic volume. This is what we use for cure and SUV to look at intensity, diagnosis and response to treatment. I'm lucky, I think she lost the bell. My last slide. So what do we have to understand here? Nuclear medicine is a need today. We need it for diagnostic and treatment purposes, particularly in this situation where you have limitation. Oh, you found the bell. Okay. An interesting thing is antigen as able for preemptive and PPD. I do not know, but we could think about it. Since we are using PPD for TB to do preemptive tr treatment, do you have some room with antigen testing to do it with itraconazole? And finally, treatment with amphotericin, doxycholate, poison. You should use it in farming. Here we have to treat with lipid formulation. And I have bad news. I think this is a big world. We infectious diseases, uh, physicians will have to start working with immunobiologics. I get patients there from pediatrics, from gastroenterology, from rheumatology, from dermatology. I get patients from different specialties, from nephrology. I, I joke, I say that nephrology, rheumato, they, and pediatrics, they should be brought together. Immunobiologics have been used a lot. They have spared the use of steroids for these patients. And it's a challenge. And it's not only about endemic diseases, we have talked today about histoplasmosis, but there are many fungi out there leading to disseminated diseases, aspergillosis, and they have a to to totally different immune immunity profile. So it's not only about histoplasma. You have a much more interesting world out there regarding fungal diseases. If you want to, I can send you all the papers used in my presentation, and I can send you my slides to just send me an email. Thank you very much. For the last presentation in this session, we would like to call Dr. Gilberto Fischer to talk about histoplasmosis in children. He's a doctor in the outpatient clinic at the Presidente Vargas Hospital. He has a doctor's degree in pediatric pneumo uh, pneumology. Well, thank you. I feel like a strange in the nest here, a stranger in the nest speaking of a very rare disease in pediatrics. But as Paulo said before, I have learned a lot in my outpatient clinic discussing cases with my colleagues, patients from the Santo Antonio Hospital. The few that we've seen in these last few years, it was while well, their diagnosis was done with the help of these colleagues of mine. So this fungus has been described for over, uh, well, over a hundred years ago. And 
it does not have so much repercussion in pediatrics lately, but perhaps with the immune biologicals, we will begin to have more patients with it. We, I will try to do a review of some aspects that have already been mentioned. Obviously, we will stick to our time limit. <clears throat> the first description in pediatrics is dated about 80 years ago. It was a case of disseminated histoplasmosis. At the time, it was called Darling's histoplasmosis because he was the author of the first publication on that. Many things have been mentioned that the majority of patients will have infection and will not have the disease diagnosed. We expect about less than 5% of individuals having that, and many of that, the information in the literature do not uh, distinguish pediatrics from adult cases, and I am not the one who will try to, to do that regarding the pathophysiology of the disease because it's a very infrequent disease in children. Based on my experience and our experience on pediatrics pneumology, especially pulmonary histoplasmosis, I'm going to show you a couple of cases next. The clinical manifestations are not specific as has been shown in pediatrics, that is the case as well. Curiously, this week on Monday, a patient was admitted with skin manifestations, lung manifestations and extra pulmonary manifestations. Patient is under assessment for a possible diagnosis of histoplasmosis, and that would increase our case series at 30% if that is the case. Images have changed a lot, the possibility of a diagnosis. When we began to do pediatrics, a computerized tomography was a sophisticated test, very difficult to obtain, and now it is exaggeratedly used. We see a very disseminated and even inadequate use of CT in patients with acute diseases such as viral infections, and they get a CT, and when we take that CT and then we interpret it, we begin to see things that don't exist. It has also been mentioned here that many times it can present itself as calcification, cavitary lesions, like Paulo said, are infrequent for him. For me, they are inexistent, inexistent, at least in my experience. These man uh, manifestations, such as extrinsic compression of the airway, this could be one way we might suspect of histoplasmosis. I will show you a case of tuberculosis. Well, no, sorry. Everybody talks about tuberculosis here. So I did too. Uh, we only, we, we have a, our mindset to think about it, but actually it was a very interesting case of plural. Uh, histoplasmosis, and I will share it with you. These other manifestations have already been mentioned a lot, and it's very difficult to find, at least I have not found in the literature, anything that would make a differential diagnosis between a child and an adult. Apparently, we will repeat that in a, in a no great majority of times, we will have the same type of diagnosis, that of differential diagnosis. It is also within my scope to discuss with you all of the diagnostic techniques because you are all very much uh, knowledgeable about these. In this patient here, we were trying to get an urinary antigen and we got that little reply, no, not available at this hospital, and we would mu very much like to have done this test in this specific patient that I'm mentioning right now. Other aspects in children of the disseminated disease may occur, and if we look into what has been shown and mentioned already, 
manifestations of systemic disease involving a wide array of diag possible diagnoses, menin from meningitis to disseminated coagulation disease. And this disease apparently will be more frequent in children under the age of two. I must particularly admit that I have never done a diagnosis of disseminated histoplasmosis in children. It is very important for us to see, and it is mentioned as a possible manifestation, this unilateral wheezing. This is what would be expected in a patient like this. But actually in children, many times we may hear greater wheezing on one side than on the other, but we have to have a very well-trained ear. And if we see, it, and, and given the inf infrequency of this diagnosis, this is quite difficult. We may have cases of severe presentation, especially this patient here that I am referring to. He is a hospital, he's admitted at this uh, right now, and it's a manifestation of a severe disease. Other tests may be used, the urine antigen, you have all mentioned them and mentioned their specificities and sensitivities, so it's not worthwhile to dwell into that. I will try to give you a review of publications that have chosen pediatrics as their main focus. And this review is relatively recent. It's important for me for, for us to look at a few aspects, for example. Out of this series, 30% didn't have any type of immune deficiency manifestation. Therefore, in a situation of a clinical suspicion, you must be very keen and sharp uh, when dealing with patients without immunodeficiency. And in this series, most patients had disseminated disease. This author tried to make a difference, a differentiation among the clinical aspects in the immunocompromised and immunocom between immunocompromised and immunocompetent patients. Uh, there were no ex no huge differences in the respiratory or in other aspects. And everything that I will show here is very variable in terms of information, as these are all retrospective studies based on other publications. The prognosis wasn't different either. And what's important for us is to see that in these series, the mortality was very low, fortunately. In the same series, fever was the most frequent manifestation, but if you look at the other manifestations, they are pretty evenly distributed in the different forms from headache to cough and abdominal pain. That is, as has been highlighted here already, we have to think of this disease very much in patients with, uh, well, especially when we don't have the diagnosis done. In this series also, the antifungal therapies are distributed like amphotericin B and hydroconazole as, and, as anti fungal treatments, and they are also described here. Now I would like to illustrate another type of study, which studied 44 patients with lymphadenopathy, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and now we stress what has been shown and mentioned already with regards to the possibility of tuberculosis, which we have to always bear in mind. In these clinical cases here, we can see visible adenopathy. I have been given a yellow card, so I should rush. 
this is another case series in Argentina with an average age of eight to nine, uh, nine to ten years. Ten cases with disseminated the disseminated form, and the others were pulmonary. Well, this is interesting how they showed this. The clinical manifestations were, are distributed in the different age groups. Obviously, we know that there is a mix of respiratory manifestations and neurological manifestations. This study from Africa? That where well, Africa wasn't mentioned in the other series, but this one is from Africa. This is interesting. I do not know the criteria, but many also had tuberculosis. This series we published in the Pediatric Respiratory Review, Dr. Severia Cecilia, who is here, 14 children, Brazilian children with histoplasmosis. I will skip that. We have to consider also prevention. Prognosis in most children is very good. Even in systemic disease, response to antifungal treatment today is pretty good. This presentation will also be available to you. <clears throat> this is a seven years old patient who was referred for a pneumonia with no improvement with amoxicillin. He got another antibiotic treatment. He had this disseminated aspect infiltrates, infiltration. Already some adenomegaly, which we can see here in the CT scan we performed at that time. This is a different patient, three weeks, fever, cough, no improvement with antibiotics. And it was a confirmed case of histoplasmosis. This is the case, if you are an editor of a journal, if you find it interesting to publish this, we would like to publish it because this is a pretty interesting case. So this patient in March started having intermittent fever and chest pain. He was treated with antibiotics. And as he didn't get better, he once again had chest pain. He once went to see a doctor again, and then he was referred after this x-ray. Opacities on this side. Maybe with increased heart volume. Now this is June, and this patient was okay. His performance status in general was good. They changed antibiotics. They didn't get any material in thoracosynthesis, and then he was referred to us with this X-ray, clear pleural effusion on the left side, citrine fluid and. We didn't really know what the diagnosis was because it didn't have a pattern of a complicated pleural effusion, but we had pleural effusion in a child who clinically was fine. Then I don't recall, someone from mycology called us excited about the results and we were excited together with them, not really knowing what we were looking at. We knew it was a fungus. And then it was a very clear diagnosis, but we didn't know. So histoplasmosis was confirmed. And then we found that this patient was uh, often in a chicken coop. And that was the case. Thank you very much. I like to invite Dr. Fisher to come here to the table and also the other speakers. We will have 15 minutes for questions, okay? Uh, 
Parabéns a todos. Congratulations, we had great presentations. I start with Felipe. Felipe, in 2010, there was a publication by Haji and co workers in clinical infection talking about histoplasmosis and immunobiologics. And he would recommend primary prophylaxis in patients who lived in endemic areas and who were being treated with immunobiologicals, thinking that we in the northeast of Brazil, in the state of Goiás, in some areas that are hyper endemic, do you recommend primary prophylaxis? If we do it for TB, why wouldn't we do it for histoplasma if the mechanism is the same? Why well, at least for those who have a greater exposure, those working with uh, agriculture, living in a farm, didn't they deserve that? In the area of Mississippi, where they conducted this study, they were talking already about prophylaxis. That's why I think that antigen would play a good role so that we didn't give unnecessary medication to everyone. Because there's an issue here. If you think that this patient will be treated with immunobiologics, it may have drug interactions with other drugs, particularly patients with uh, hematological problems. They are on many drugs usually. So I think we have to define the role of antigen testing in the search for the, those most, most susceptible patients, but not for everyone, but some do need prophylaxis and we are not giving them prophylactic treatment. Well, still talking about immunobiologics, what is known about the performance of antigen, urine, urine antigen testing in this population? I know Diego has been doing some work, maybe Caceres or Felipe. Thank you very much. These three presentations were very interesting. I'd like to ask you, when you mean antigen, are you talking about histoplasmin? Do you mean histoplasmin or urine antigen? I mean, urine antigen, positive urine antigen means that there is already disseminated disease. So you treat with intraconazole, maybe the role of PPD is histoplasmin in patients with high immunity before a transplant or before immunosuppression. That might play an interesting role. And then a second question to doctor who showed this large spectrum of symptomatic diseases, how to approach asymptomatic patients with positive urine antigen. Histoplasmin, the difference between histoplasmin and PPT, is better the fact that they seem to have the same model, but the immune response is different. The immune response in TB is disposition, and one third has that. And when PPT is zero, it's a marker of Th1 immune issues in Brazil is an immune problem, not necessarily because they haven't been exposed. Now, in histoplasmin, the response is different, sensitivity is different, and the immune mechanism is also different. And in the end, we cannot really compare them. Regarding the antigen, I agree, antigen has a cutoff point suggested for disseminated disease. Does it have a cutoff point to say if the patient has been exposed? That's the point. This is what is missing, because otherwise we would do it and would be done. Now, antigen more than five have to treat. What about between one and five? Prophylaxis and less than one. Can I be okay? This is the point about the antigen. Will it play that role? I don't know. We don't have that answer yet. We don't even have the identification of the cases of histoplasmosis with immunobiologics because this is not mandatory as is in TB. That's why it is. That's the point. We still don't have those information. Performance of the antigen testing in patients who were on anti-TNF drugs. 
vis-à-vis -vis the risk of histoplasmosis. Is it, is it as, sensitive, as sensitive as for HIV patients, same cutoff point? Antigen is different when you have antibodies. Antibodies would really have a, a significant interference with anti-TNF. In some of them, you have no response. Antigen, well, we have the presence of the agent. Theoretically, anti-TNF wouldn't have an interference on antigen because the agent wouldn't need interference to emerge, theoretically. In vivo, we have different intensities, as we all know. But as of today, we are not able to define how much every immunobiologic drug may interfere directly with an antigen. We have to study this population more. I would like to say something about the antigen. Well, the patient will start immunobiologic. You do previous screening with PPD. But in a patient that may be infected with histoplasma, this antigen will very hardly be positive because the patient doesn't have anything at all. Even in a patient that has acute histoplasmosis, not necessarily in the lung, maybe in menistinum, we know that the frequency is very low. The immunocompetence is extremely low. It may increase a little bit in the immunocompromised patients. We consider that PPD, if these patients were already on steroids for a long time, in a way they are immune suppressed. They are not immune competent. So immune suppressed patients, I think it's worth it. I think you're right. Because I cannot really compare. I'm not screening a immune competent patient, but immunosuppressed because this patient has been on steroids, for example. So you may find increased levels of antigens. I agree. But epidemiology in every patient, this eight Patients with pulmonary histoplasmosis, we detected in all of them, except in one, we didn't get an association in all of them. They were like drivers in a farm or a patient who cleaned an area or someone who visited a farm. In all of them, we, people working with construction. And in the epidemiology is important. You have to. This is really something I learned when I was a resident. Who is your patient? Not only know what he has, but who is your patient? What is his job? You have to know your patient. I think the epidemiology bit is really important. We shouldn't forget it. I would just like to add something to this question regarding antigen testing in asymptomatic patients. We have to face that or look at that as the antigen for cryptococcus. If you have a patient with low CD4 counts, even if symptomatic, if they are, have positive antigen for crypto, I'll treat with itraconazole. I think that we should do the same thing for histoplasmosis if they have no symptoms. And if antigen testing is positive, we should treat them to prevent them from uh, developing disseminated disease. I think we have to consider that, particularly in areas such as ours, where we have many cases. What about the role of ferritin? Histoplasmosis leads to very severe systemic infl uh, inflammation, and the levels of ferritin are the highest we've ever seen. One Over 100,000 of ferritin, this patient I mentioned. So, You've mentioned different factors, things that were reported, pancytopenia, but you didn't include their ferritin. And our residents already know that because TB leads to higher levels of ferritin. 1,800 visceral leishmaniasis, you also have higher levels of ferritin, but not very much. Now, with histoplasmosis, you have 10,000, even 100,000 ferritin. So I think it's an important market. If you find ferritin, very high ferritin levels in a HIV positive patient, if it's way high, you have to have a differential diagnosis for histoplasmosis. What you mentioned about urine antigen, just like the crypt cryptococcal antigen, 
when we did necropsy, autopsy, and those autopsy studies we conducted, at that time, we didn't have treatment for HIV. Sometimes you found histoplasmosis only in the spleen. The spleen was filled with histoplasma, but nowhere else. So you couldn't have a diagnosis with the patient still alive. Now, in these patients, if you did, if you did back then, even antigen testing, they would probably be positive. Now, a comment on patients on immunobiologics, particularly anti-TNF drugs and even antigen. It's not clear for me what is the best strategy. I don't think we have that information. I cannot interpret it so quickly, really, saying that positive even antigen is the same as disease in this host. We have to understand that many of the infections we have in this host are not because of reactivation, but are due to new exposures. So a negative urine antigen will not tell me a lot. We are conducting a study in this group of patients. We don't have the data yet to show you, but we have many patients who are fully asymptomatic and we have been following them and they ultimately do not have the disease. Not only our work, but the literature doesn't have an answer really regarding what is the optimal strategy for this patient. Maybe in hyper endemic areas, we should consider more prevention and maybe then uh, prevent new exposures. But I cannot ha have the same rationale as for a TB, for example. Just to comment on ferritin, actually, we don't really use ferritin a lot, but we use LDH. So the reason is basically the same. We did a study, it's been published. So the predictive factor for histoplasmosis, we compared patients that had confirmed histoplasmosis and those who didn't have confirmed disease. LDH was very high, 10,000 in very severe patients, CD4 less than 200, if I'm not wrong, LDH and presence MPGO. So ferritin or LDH, very elevated LDH is an important uh, tip for us, an important hint to consider its histoplasmosis. I'd like to make another comment regarding the diagnostic techniques. I think it's really important not to extrapolate validation for one disease to another one. So not extrapolate to other diseases that are totally different. I'm sure that if you use histoplasmin antigen here in this room, some will be positive. It's very important diagnostic. When you talk about the diagnostic techniques, you have to look at the context. Uh, the patient should have some risk of having the disease. Otherwise, we'll have too many false positives. The clearest case is a mammogram for breast cancer. If you read the papers on breast cancer, there are many, many false positives, and most of them will never, ever have a breast cancer. So I think it's very important that the standardization and assessment of the diagnostic techniques are done in the context of the disease you are looking at. Extrapolation has risks, and it's important to have pilot studies if it's a different kind of patient in order to check and see if the technique does work the same as in a different group. I would just like to make a comment. I really agree what you've just said. When we look at predictive factors or risk factors, when you have these biomarkers like ferritin, this is not characteristic of any given agent. So I'm always concerned if ferritin is at that particular level, if C-reactive protein is that level, if HDL is that level, in lymphoma, it goes all the way up. We have to be careful because I think that having these numbers or measurements as prediction, I don't know if this is really useful to have them as predictors of something. It's like you've, for many years, you studied that hyponatremia was a characteristic of Legionella, but it's a characteristic of severely ill people. So these biomarkers are characteristics of severely ill patients. And when we try to assign a value, for instance, for calcitonin, if you try to 
pro value pro calcitonin you start having issues because it goes up whenever you have fungal infections, but it doesn't go up when you have bacterial infections. So I'm kind of worried regarding infectious diseases of not to, not to overvalue these markers, particularly related them to the etiological agent. I think it leaves much to be desired. I'd just like to mention that. We have questions from the chat. We are already late. It depends on the context. We just have exams or tests that have very low sensitivity. The culture that will have a turnaround time that is very long. Most of our patients in our hospitals, we start treatment and then the results were negative. We don't know sensitivity is low, but we start treating them. In this setting, if you don't have antigen testing, if you don't have the best diagnostic methods available, you have to suspect and that has an impact on prognosis the earlier you start treating. So if I don't have the best diagnostic test, I have to look for evidence to suspect that that can be histoplasmosis. That's the intention, not to give a definite diagnosis, is to suspect. Sometimes we start treatment, empirical treatment, because we are not sure. And then the culture is positive. We have a few questions from the chat. I'll read the first one. Ana Paula, good morning. That was a great meeting. A question about transplant, particularly kidney transplant. Prophylaxis with SMP, PMP prevents histoplasmosis in these patients, considering that they cover histoplasmosis. Well, in a way, they do. There's an old paper, McKinsey, I think it was the author in the US, and he showed that this was a protective factor. Patients who were in Bactrin had less histoplasmosis when compared to those who did, even though he was working with HIV patients. I don't, I'm not aware of any paper on transplant, but in HIV, it decreased the prevalence of histoplasmosis on patients who did prophylaxis with Bactrin. So I think we could extrapolate, think that possibly, back to prophylaxis to protect these patients. Thank you. Next question. Simone asks the following questions. I'd like to know why you don't have epidemiological inquiry as has been mentioned by one of the speakers. We did, we worked together, was it is Brazilian? HIV patient, CD4 over 350, a prevalence of 11 percent in fertilizer. An HIV patient, when in immunocompetent patient, the prevalence was 20 percent. It's relatively high, but I think that Rosalie Rose can tell you why we cannot really afford doing it. Just a brief comment. There's a workstation in the room next to where we are. We are doing tests there, you, urine antigen testing. Go there, say hello. I think she's kind of sad because nobody's going there. We are doing the IMI and the Mira Vista test there. Please go there, it's for free. You don't have to pay anything to look at it. That, those were the questions from the chat. Pasqualotto, one more question, the last one. Diego Caceres. It's actually a final remark. I think Teresinha's presentation was very nice when she talked that table with the three clinical forms and the analytical performance. And you were talking about the combination of antigen, antibody, and the sensitivity was at 100%. It is important to know that there is no perfect test. Even those who say they have 100% sensitivity, they do have a confidence interval. And that may be a risk leading to false negatives. So I think that what we have been doing over the years in Guatemala, this has been shown in a study is how to combine the different diagnostic methods 
leading us to have greater uh, results. So it's not just use one lab tool, but combine different diagnostic methods, also with epidemiological data and clinical data.
de microbiologia do Hospital de Clínicas de Porto Alegre, uma referência no diagnóstico clássico de micologia. Pointer aqui no... Então tá, boa tarde a todos, agradecer imensamente o convite do Alessandro Pascoaloto, foi um prazer a gente estar tá falando nesses eventos, de ver tanta gente junto assim, depois de tanto tempo, assim, só com eventos online, que acabaram meio que saturando essas convivências, é essencial a gente discutir os casos mais próximos. Assim. Então vou falar um pouquinho dos métodos clássicos de diagnóstico micológico através do exame microscópico e da cultura. Então, lembrando que a histoplasmose, é um, a gente viu de manhã que, essencialmente, o diagnóstico definitivo é dependente do laboratório, de alguma maneira, ou através da sorologia, ou do exame direto, ou do cultivo. Então, o laboratório tem um papel importante no diagnóstico dessa doença, então a gente deveria valorizar um pouco essa, a qualificação dos laboratórios e a cobrança do infectologista é essencial nesse ponto. Esse é um trabalho que eu acho bem interessante do Diego e do Alessandro, que ele mostra... pensa em histoplasmose em vários cenários. Aqui as manifestações clínicas são variadas, usualmente o diagnóstico é feito nas formas invasivas e 95% das vezes a doença é uma doença residual. O paciente tem sintomas inespecíficos, febre, tosse e depois regride espontaneamente, na grande maioria dos casos. Essencialmente nas formas disseminadas é onde se trabalha mais o diagnóstico. Existe um gap bastante grande nas formas agudas e nas formas crônicas que são bem mais raras as séries, onde tem alguns casos específicos. Aqui um trabalho do Dr. Severo, também com 156 casos, a grande maioria, 70%, nas formas disseminadas. Aqui no Rio Grande do Sul, uma zona endêmica, o Dr. Severo fez esse trabalho também antigamente, essa, esse delta do Jacuí, que é onde... Ops. Não. essa região da Ilha da Pintada, esse trabalho foi feito em, em, fazendo isoplasmina em Cachoeira do Sul e depois nas missões em Santo Ângelo. Então, se achou vários casos em toda essa região do Delta do Jacuí, que aqui a gente vê Porto Alegre, aqui é a usina do gasômetro, grande estádio internacional, e aqui toda essa a região da aonde desemboca esse delta do Jacuí, que é uma área endêmica de estoplasmose. Então, a gente tem que se orgulhar, o Porto Alegre, que no sul tem o Grêmio, tem o Inter, tem o melhor mercado do mundo, que é o Zafari, e tem estoplasmose também. Esse trabalho aqui da doutora Vanessa Cunha, mostrando as lesões de pele, que já foi salientada em vários casos em pacientes HIV, eu queria só chamar a atenção da variedade de lesões, das formas disseminadas aqui, o paciente com capos e mais estoplasmose. Esse aqui, dificilmente o clínico iria pensar em estoplasmose. Em todos esses casos se fez uma escarificação, um exame direto e uma semeadura em micosel que se isolou o estoplasma. Aqui mais formas, pápulas, crostas. Então, o que, que se fazia? Na época, se fazia um raspado, um exame direto pela prata e uma cultura no meio de micosel. Aqui um comprometimento cutâneo ou de mucosas, eventualmente pode ocorrer. Então, vou falar um pouquinho dessa forma do exame direto na cultura propriamente dita. Uh, isso aqui é um médico se queixando no laboratório, isso aqui não existe, é só uma ilustração. Existe, existe sempre uma boa convivência harmoniosa, todo mundo é amigo, então, isso é só para chamar a atenção. Mas, a gente fixando no exame direto e na cultura, a gente teve a identificação do estoplasma, a gente deve buscar isso aqui, então, as formas vegetativas, as leveduras no exame direto, que são essas bolinhas de 2 a 4, 8 micrômetros, no máximo, ovaladas, e, eventualmente, a gente encontra, parece o um número 8 ali. Isso aqui é bem interessante, bem sugestivo de ser estoplasma. Qual é a dificuldade? Se for uma lesão de pele de um paciente HIV com infiltrado, é estoplasma. Se for uma lesão da mucosa oral de um paciente não neutropênico, é muito fácil confundir com cândida. Então, em alguns casos, dependendo do tipo de paciente, 
a gente vai encontrar um ou outro resultado. Que, aonde que eu posso ver esses bichinhos aí? Várias colorações, panótico, pode faltar aí. Eu, eu não posso ver só no exame direto, que é simplesmente hidróxido de potássio 20%. Aí eu não vou conseguir ver, é muito difícil. Mas em várias colorações, o Romanoski, Gimso, a Prata, é a melhor coloração para fungos. Então, uma infinidade de colorações eu posso enxergar o estoplasma. Posso confundir com leishmania, candida glabrata, pirimocissis, mas com um pouquinho de treino do pessoal do laboratório é possível fazer esse diagnóstico diferencial. Lembrando que ele é um fungo dimórfico, então ele tem uma forma filamentosa. Esse aqui eu fazia uma coleta tipo indígena, quando colocava o próprio bisturi no meio e ele crescia puro ali. Ele fica interessante e limpo, asséptico, na beira do leito. E depois aqui a forma leviduriforme. Então, ainda a cultura tem uma sensibilidade baixa e permanece até então o padrão ouro para diagnóstico. Então, aqui a sequência, o exame direto e a cultura ali. Esse trabalho do Severo é só para exaltar, isso é interessante, o fungo cresce bem naquele meio que se usa para dermatófitos, que é o saburô adicionado de clorofinicol mais cicleximida. É o meio que se, isola para, se usa para isolar dermatófitos. O estoplasma cresce bem, isso é bem interessante a utilização desse meio para isso. Lembrando que ele é um fungo dimórfico, então aqui tem os microconídeos e aqui os macroconídeos tuberculados. Essa foto é bem bonita, só lembrando as duas formas que tem ali. Eventualmente, esses macroconídeos tuberculados podem ser encontrados em alguns contaminantes de laboratório, então é importante fazer essa diferenciação do dimorfismo, ele tem que crescer sobre a forma leveduriforme 37 e filamentosa 35. Existem dois fungos, um chamado cepedônio e o outro, esse crisosporin, que também pode crescer, só que eles não são dimórficos, eles são essencialmente filamentosos. Aqui é um caso do hospital, um paciente com 52 anos, esfumante, tinha trombocitopenia idiopática, lesões disseminadas, uma coriorretinite e uma trombocitopenia. Olha só o lado da patologia, sempre os patologistas com aqueles excelentes laudos esclarecedores, comprometeu ali com estoplasmose sistêmica. Então, a gente olhou a prata, dá para ver as leveduras ali, acho que não tem nenhuma dúvida, mas, então, se a gente comparar um pouquinho, elas, elas são diferentes um pouquinho, as leveduras do histoplasma são aquele, aqueles detalhes que eu comentei em número 8, e essa aqui em forma de cigar shapes, isso aqui é esporotricose. Então, o diagnóstico inferencial é importante no Brasil, é, é bastante frequente a esporotricose, então deve se entrar no diagnóstico inferencial e no exame direto cuidar essas formas, ou as leveduras mais ovaladas ou um pouquinho mais extensas que seriam da esporotricose. Aqui o Malditoff, que é uma outra ferramenta importante para a identificação dos fungos, ele é essencial para os laboratórios adquirir essa, essa tecnologia, ele tem um, um empecilho do preço alto, mas ele passa a ser uma ferramenta importante na ajuda diagnóstica. Aqui um, um isolamento no trato geniturinário do Dr. Severo, esse aqui do Pedro Chestaski, com uma série de casos em sistema nervoso central, Lembrando, para a cultura, é essencial fazer o isoleito, o isoleito tem várias limitações, ele contamina 10% dos frascos, mas quando se quiser focar em isolar estoplasma do soro, obrigatoriamente teria que fazer essa técnica do, do isoleito. Esse aqui é um trabalho também da Guatemala interessante, eles avaliaram 24 meses ali uma corte em paciente HIV e conseguiram fazer os isolados em 4.245 pacientes 16% tinha doença uh, oportunista. 35% dos pacientes com estoplasmose. Então, o antígeno foi detectado em 94% dos casos. Então, esses programas são interessantes para valorizar cada vez mais a necessidade do antígeno para se fazer o diagnóstico. 35% dos casos, então, somente foram perdidos sem o antígeno. Então, só para finalizar, lembrando, existem vários espécimes clínicos que podem ser isolados do estoplasma. Os principais são medula óssea, linfonodo, lesões de pele e sangue, desde que se usem os métodos adequados. E, no contexto do antígeno urinário, evidentemente, a urina passa a ser o principal. Então, numa série de materiais, por exemplo, no sangue tem que fazer isoleitor, amostras respiratórias, eu vou ter o um melhor rendimento no lavado, o uso de anticoagulante na medula, sem deixar aquele coágulo no tubo, é importante isso. Lesões de pele, ou por biópsia, ou por escarificação, que é simplesmente raspar com bisturi e semear no meio de cultura. 
e aqui o, os meios utilizados, a sequência de diagnóstico. Então, o exame direto ele tem um valor limitado, o exame direto é cultura, mas ele passa a ser uma ferramenta importante em alguns casos, especialmente o exame direto, uma coloração de panótico, guincha, ele tem uma utilidade bastante grande no diagnóstico da, da doença. Então, o diagnóstico é um contexto da epidemiologia, a região que tem os casos, o contexto clínico e o contexto, a, a, a disponibilidade dos testes. A grande maioria não usa o antígeno urinário, é uma ferramenta essencial para se melhorar o diagnóstico. No mais, eu agradecer a oportunidade imensamente, o Alessandro, pela essas considerações com relação ao teste e deixar essa mensagem do Milor Fernandes para a gente conseguir fazer essa melhora diagnóstica da estoplasmose. Muito obrigado. Bom, então eu vou, eu mesmo vou me apresentar, sou a Cecília Severo, a filha desse Severo que estão falando, eu queria agradecer as homenagens que foram feitas, certamente eu não vou fazer uma homenagem por motivos óbvios, que eu vou me emocionar, uh, mas obrigada, certamente ele vai, vou passar para ele, ele vai estar muito contente. Uh, eu sou professora de micologia na Fundação e farmacêutica bioquímica no Laboratório de Micologia da Santa Casa. Então, o Alessandro me deu o papel de falar de histopatologia sem ser uma patologista. Eu já vou explicar por que isso. Só deixa eu me coordenar aqui. Para passar no meio? É, estou tentando passar. Ah, aqui. Então, só para situar vocês, o nosso laboratório de micologia, ele, além de fazer todas as análises micológicas, ele tem uma grande vantagem que é a proximidade física com o laboratório de patologia. Ficam lado a lado, dividem o mesmo corredor. E com isso, tá ali, ó, eu trouxe para vocês, isso aqui é a nossa porta, fica no Hospital Santa Rita. Uh, com isso, a gente, ao longo do, de todos esses anos, uh, tivemos muitas trocas de uh, informações, trocas de conhecimento, discussões de caso, uh, laudos compartilhados, e os casos que eu vou trazer aqui são reflexo dessa parceria que a gente tem até hoje. Bom, antes de uh, qualquer apresentação que vai falar de estopatologia, uh, é inevitável, eu até achei que alguém já ia ter falado do nome estoplasma capsulato, mas então vou ter que... O estoplasma capsulato, o nome dele vem porque Darlin, quando estava analisando a, 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 tecidos da autópsia de um, de um nativo da Martinica com suspeita de leishmaniose, de uma forma, né, de, uh, de leish, que ele acreditava ser uma forma de leishmaniose diferente, ele observou um halo, ele parecia ter uma cápsula, né, esse microorganismo e aí vem o capsulato. Isto estava dentro de um estiócito, plasma parecia ter um, uh, ser um plasmódio. Então, estoplasma capsulato. Tá? Foram as análises realizadas por ele, o que deu origem ao nome. A bicicletinha vai passar por cima de mim hoje, porque é brim, 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 está descoordenada a coisa aqui. Bom, gente, antes uh, de eu dar início uh, nos casos, eu vou fazer um pré-teste com vocês. Então, eu vou passar rapidamente com as informações que vocês vão ver aqui. Pensem o que vocês sugeririam de diagnóstico, tá? Depois a gente vai discutir. Então, aqui, uh, paciente diagnosticado com deficiência de alfa-1 antitripsina, transplantado hepático. A gente tem uma supuração. Tá difícil. Aqui. E temos esses micro-organismos. Paciente uh, imunossupresso, uh, isso é uh, nódulo cervical. Tá? Em maior aumento. Eu não vou falar nada, depois a gente vai discutir. Tá? Bom. Então vamos aqui, viemos. Histopatologia. Uh, uma técnica antiga, mas de suma importância, e a gente vai falar, eu vou utilizar essa tabela, do item colaboradores, para falar um pouco quando que a gente deveria ou poderia usar essa patologia. A gente sabe da baixa sensibilidade, a gente sabe que seria muito importante ter o, o, a técnica do, do antígeno urinário, né? foi falado uh, já bastante sobre isso, porém, Principalmente na doença pulmonar aguda e na disseminada uh, progressiva, nós precisamos de uma técnica 
que nos dê um pronto diagnóstico. Aí a gente poderia utilizar a estopatologia também, então uh, seria uma recomendação, já que nós não temos o antígeno urinário atualmente. Claro que na estoplasmose, uh, na estoplasmose pulmonar aguda, a gente precisa, antes de mais nada, ter o quê? Suspeição clínica para envio de material, fazer uma biópsia, se fosse possível, nesse paciente. E aí ela poderia auxiliar, como foi o caso uh, que a, a doutora Terezinha comentou. E na disseminada progressiva, um papel importante da estopatologia vem nas uh, biópsias de pele. Então, uh, seria recomendado, em todos os casos, que se fizesse uma biópsia de pele desses pacientes para investigar. E, obviamente, como a gente não tem o antígeno, né, a gente acaba tendo que fazer outras uh, biópsias mais invasivas. Se a gente tivesse o antígeno urinário, provavelmente evitaria esses procedimentos mais invasivos. Quanto, quanto às outras síndromes clínicas... Uh, eu vou deixar depois, provavelmente a Roseli vai falar, mas enfim, uh, sorologia, a sorologia seria interessante, uma sorologia negativa ou suspeita de, uh, de malignidade, enfim, como diagnóstico diferencial, malignidade, TB, também poderíamos usar a estopatologia. Bom, uh, os achados estopatológicos a gente pode dividir em dois grandes grupos dos imunocompetentes e dos imunossupressos. A gente já também já ouviu, uh, né, já, já escutou bastante falar sobre isso. Mas, resumidamente, então, no imunocompetente, o que, que a gente tem? A gente tem formação de granuloma, especialmente quando tem um pequeno inóculo, né? um, um pequeno granuloma, normalmente necrótico, pode ter linfócito, macrófago, e o, as leveduras ficam no centro do granuloma, ou seja, conseguiu conter aquele elemento leveduriforme, né? aquele fungo. No caso do paciente uh, imunossupresso, por exemplo, um HIV, a gente não, não tem essa, essa contenção através do granuloma, né? o HIV acaba uh, alterando diversos desses mecanismos de defesa, então a gente tem a falência nessa formação do granuloma, em que a gente tem um difuso infiltrado de macrófagos, não tem granuloma, não tem necrose, e tem uma miríade de elementos leveduriformes intra e extracelulares. Uh, ainda sobre essa diferenciação, eu gosto bastante dessa, dessas categorias que o grupo da Guiana Francesa traz, que ele elenca uh, a, 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 essa, a, esses achados estopatológicos de acordo com as, a, a ação e reação frente ao o estoplasma capsulato e o, o status imunológico, então em tuberculóide forma, forma anérgica, forma mista e forma de sequela. Forma tuberculóide, a gente já viu, granuloma, tuberculoso. Form, we've seen it, tuberculous, granuloma, with necrosis. We've, it's been mentioned here, when there are students, I say it a lot. What is the tuberculite uh, granuloma form? It doesn't mean that it's a tubercul that it is tuberculosis. Is, it is a tuberculum, a, pro a protuberance, and it's almost like a potato with cheese. We need to know what is inside that but little potato filled up with cheese. So we can do histoplasm or we can do, uh, we have to check for it. This is the anergic form. The name it says itself says that there is no reaction to the exposure to that antigen. This is what we see in HIV patients. This is a uh, HIV patients with a CD4 of 100. 44 years old, and he has a, a, a lesion in, near the optic chiasma. We can see a, several, a great number of fungic elements, and with silver, we can see it more evidently, the fungi. The mixed form is intermediate form between the granulomatose form, the tuberculoid form, and the anergic form. In this case, it is a patient with ankylosing spondylitis using immunobiologicals. She presented with skin lesions, and this biopsy was done of a, a maxillary lesion. So we can see the hair follicles here. It was a hairy area, and we can see a mixed form, but none specific. There's no formulation of granuloma, and we have microorganisms in silver. In this case, 
confirmation came with the culture. That's why I say it's this exchange is extremely important, the ex this exchange that we have with both labs. And the sequelae form, this technique is the Bernhoff and Gitson uh, form. And these are the elastic fibers. We can see the elastic fibers, a uh, brownish area here, and there is a collagen capsule and the central necrosis. So the yeast elements may or not be present or viable. Sometimes there is a nodule that can be responsible for a, an occasional reactivation. Cases, histoplasmosis mimicking neoplasia or neoplasm. Male, 54 year old patient, smoker, diabetic, in the CT presented with a pulmonary nodule. Suspicion was lung cancer. It was a fibrotic nodule the, without any malignancy. And we see an extensive necrotic area and collagen. And at greater magnitude, we see the granuloma. There is collagen here. We can see the normal lung, collagen, reticulin, and it was histoplasmona, revealing that it was not neoplasm. In this case, the culture was negative, so that happens a lot as well. Histoplasmosis mimicking pulmonary metastasis, a patient with a history of melanoma. She had several nodules, 17 nodules were removed from her. One nodule, by the way, had a sign at Pond CT, had the feeding vessel, which was suggestive of neoplasm, and it turned out to be histoplasmosis. Here we have an epithelioid granuloma with necrosis, conjunctive connect, uh, necrotic connective tissue. Probably there is there are microorganisms here, and with silver, we can reveal the histoplasm. histoplasm. This is a case of granulomatose synovitis, a patient with a history of knee injections, steroid injections because of pain, and in arthroscopy, there was an important proliferative, proliferating synovitis invading the capsular space, and biopsy was conducted. We have here extensive necrosis at greater magnitude, east form, east here, lung hangs, gig, giant cell in the nuclei on the periphery, and fungus. So this was positive and this was key because it's an unusual type of manifestation. So culture helped us do this diagnosis, finish diagnosis. A kidney transplant patient with a suspicion of rejection of the transplant. They did kidney biopsy, liver biopsy, bone marrow biopsy. Kidney was negative, and this is the liver biopsy. And the bone marrow was positive too. So here we have malformed epithelioid granulomas. On the inside, it was very difficult to find them. We need to do new sections and to reveal histoplasm. This is a bone marrow biopsy, just to show you, because of tropism, here we see the yeast, the intracellular yeast elements in large quantities in an HIV patient. Differential diagnosis, we have Cryptosine capsule. This is a typical case of a cryptococcus. Usually we would see a halo around with HE, we could see it and it reveals the agent. Musicarmin reveals that and it reveals the capsule. Musicarmin is negative because there is no capsule, so we can then do a which attaches the melanin, melanin to the wall, and we would be able to, to do it. 
leishmania, usually it's more on the outside of the histiocytes, on the periphery of the histiocyte. And the great thing here is to look for cytoplast, which is a pro, uh, in prolongment of the nucleus. nucleus. The, here we see variants, candida, Valeria mentioned candida here. It would be important to, to find pseudo hypha. Coccidioids, sometimes when these are ruptured, we see the spores lost and it could be similar. So we, in pathology, you always have to search more information or new sections. Let's go back to the diagnosis that you've done. The patient, a liver patient, liver transplant patient, there was these abscess that he had not a number of, uh, I, I'm sure the diagnosis was candida albicans, was I right? Well, what happened? We did several sections, the whole material had gone to formal and it really looked like histoplasma. And we requested more sections, we analyzed together, we couldn't do it on the first section. Pseudo hyphas here. And we had the information that uh, patient was positive for candida albicans in monoculture. So we closed our diagnosis. This is a the immunosuppressed patient, cervical lymph node. What did you do? Whoever was in doubt if it was leishmania or histoplasma, I, it was histoplasma. So you have to use silver staining and then it will reveal that and that's it. Because many times you see pathologists anxious oh look at this you see that there's an he here and i say don't ask before just do silver and that's all i know it's not for those who have it of course i know it's not a reality everywhere and many times we see in the literature that leishmania has one to four micrometers and histoplasma has two to six micrometers or three well if it's silver then we know that's it it's histoplasma. One curiosity, you know that histoplasma can be stained by zeonucin, mucin. So we've seen many cases. It's not the rule, of course, but it could happen. So in the cases of people who only think about tuberculosis, tuberculosis, we could be lucky and see pneumocysts in, in the culture for tuberculosis. We know it doesn't happen that way. This is a biopsy here. Well, the message I want to leave with you is if you do not expect the unexpected, you will not recognize it when it arrives. So we must be always open. We need to go after it. And I have finished my talk, okay? I would just like to take the opportunity to talk about a project that we will launch an ECHO project that we will launch. I'm coordinating it together with Professor Elena from the foundation in partnership with other hospitals. It is, a, it is focused on the diagnosis of fungal and endemic infections. There is a QR code. It's very much focused to labs, especially small labs and the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Basically, it is a tele-mentorship. So we always have this project. I don't know if you've heard of the ECHO project. It always has 15 minutes of a presentation and will bring guests and authorities in the topic. And one lab will bring a case. So these are end, end steps to try to improve what we have already. Usually we do uh, consult and see in WhatsApp groups. So if you get emails, please help spread the news. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Jose Oliveira, researcher with Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, Vice Director of Research, Evandro Chagas Institute. She will talk about serology. Hello, thank you again. Thank you, Alessandro, for allowing me to speak so much in this meeting. What will you think of me? Well, I'll try to show you a little bit about serology. 
as has been already mentioned by previous speaker, the diagnosis of histoplasmosis is a challenge. It is indeed a diagnosis that is multifactorial. So we have to think not only about one single laboratory method, but we have to consider many actually. I won't show anything of this part here, Cecilia and Valerio have already talked about that. So I was asked to talk about serology and the serology I'm going to talk about. So in these methods they've mentioned or discussed so far, we have a very serious problem regarding the gold standard, which is isolation and culture. Isolation and culture is not very sensitive. Turnaround time is long. Sometimes it may take four to six weeks for us to be able to identify. The patient is gone by then and we are there waiting for the culture to grow, depending on where the lesion is located. This is really key. If you have only pulmonary evidence, we will do an open biopsy to show the gold standard diagnostic test. No, you cannot do that in a patient. And additionally, as Valerio showed, we have to see the two forms to say that it is histoplasm because we have other uh, organisms in the environment that may mimic this disease. So we have to see both forms. And why have all these methods been created? Antibody detection is much more sensitive. It's fast. It can be a prognostic marker. I'll talk about that. It's much safer for lab technicians because histoplasma for us to make the conversion. So it's class three. So you have to have proper safety uh, uh, infrastructure in place, no need of invasive procedure. And today with serology, we don't have to detect what is the species. The serum is the same for all species. So far, this may change one day, isn't it, Marcus? So in the second week of infection, we start seeing antibodies, depending on the antigen you're going to use. Antigens usually are M and H antigen, and the reactions which are used all over the world, double diffusion and the complement fixation reaction. Complement fixation is almost no longer used because you may have anti-complement reactions, so you will not be able to get a diagnosis. So immunodiffusion is the most widely used method, but as you can see, there is a variation a huge variation in sensitivity and specificity because we don't have a standardized antigen. We are, all we have are in-house antigens. There are some companies today, IMI, for example, they already have this kit, but usually in Brazil, everyone has his or her own antigens and we cannot even compare results because of that. So we started to think, well, decades ago, people started thinking of developing more sensitive tests. Immunity fusion detects at the level of micrograms and immunoassays at the level of nanograms. So that's already different. So there are many different tests, some uh, developed by our own group. We develop a method, a, a Western blot, a immunoassay, and we showed starting in the 1990s that it could be used for a quick detection. Before two weeks, we were already able to show antibodies. Here we have, we had eight patients from Professor Marcela Zero who had a suspected cancer from images. And she said, is it really cancer? Then we did Western blot and it was confirmatory, only one patient had cancer. All the other patients had histoplasmosis. This test was validated and we were able to show that it had a sensitivity and a specificity of 94%. We showed that 
you can keep this strip for five years that it will still be reactive so we can introduce it in the industry by the way we are trying to do it in biomanguinho's lab and even if aids patients with disseminated histoplasmosis sensitivity and specificity of the western blot was 90 percent so we think this is a good test for diagnostic purposes right but then well just confirming what i said this is a meta-analysis by diego in all cases diagnosis of progressive disseminated histoplasmosis and here once again showing that the greatest sensitivity was with this western blot test developed by my by my group this is something interesting i like to show thank you for that diego for this slide when we say that we see even immunodiffusion when we see a m and a h band it means that histoplasmosis is active and really we can clearly see that here when we start having both band you see that they are growing positively each antigen or well, antibodies last uh, last last time in our body and then we start seeing the m band is that disease is this individual infected but with has no symptoms so m band is prognostic it's not diagnostic right Everybody has already talked about this, but I have to touch on that. This in a graph form, I think it looks nicer than a table. So depending on the clinical form of the disease, we will have to use one given method. We should highlight that if we use different methods, for instance, antibody testing and antigen testing, if we use both, we will increase sensitivity to almost 100%. But before showing, I'm speaking fast, so I'm short of breath. So this is a pretty recent study, and I, it's great, I think. It shows those cases, Cecilia just mentioned granulomas. Look at this. They conducted a study. The only criticism I have, it is performed by Mira Vista lab, and I do not know what was the antigen they used to form this ELISA. They don't tell, so we cannot replicate it. But anyway, they say that the presence of gene and IgG in an endemic area with suspicion of cancer. So IgG and IgM, they, you can consider this as histoplasmosis. So this is a very interesting study, and we could, from now on, think or consider to use this as a biomarker to show benign granulomas. This is the, a result from our lab. We did it in our cohort. We made a comparison, different clinical forms of the disease, as has already been shown previously by previous speakers, and using culture, immunodiffusion, Western blot, and galatoman and testing and using western blood and galatoman and uh, workup we found 100 percent sensitivity and specificity so i think we are going the right direction something else i bring you which i think is very interesting we wanted to see since we were the reference hospital for covid 19 in rio we had the opportunity of looking at the role of serology during the COVID-19 pandemic for histoplasmosis. And we saw that of 303 COVID-19 patients confirmed with PCR, we had 41 positive cases on day zero, meaning the day they were admitted to the hospital. They had histoplasmosis, day zero, after right after the mission. And look at this. 18 patients had both the H and M band, which is really diagnosis of active histoplasmosis. So 13% positivity, high. And we suspect that these patients had 
the fungus have had the fungus for a very long time. And when they had COVID, then this histoplasmosis showed. And this is going to be published by a student, a master student of mine. Two very interesting cases we had in this post-COVID lab, and we saw that two physicians had histoplasmosis after COVID-19. After four months, we could show that using both Western blot and NAST PCR, which we also use for diagnosis. We could show that they had uh, histoplasmosis. It's not working. I think it's out of battery. So here, this is a survey we did to show you our cases from 2005 to 2021. Well, first, look at the difference from 2005. Well, serology was a good prognosis, but after the introduction, now we've implemented Western blot in our routine. Everybody asks that for us, and just look at the increase to, from starting 2018. Look at 2019, the number of cases we like, were able to diagnose. So we can see that serology, even though we think it is presumptive, it should be used in most places that have a mycology lab. This is my message. So this is the group who works with me in serology and molecular testing because we do. Rodrigo is in charge of mycological diagnosis. He's the head of the mycology department, and the molecular bit is with me, Marcos and Fernando. And once again, I would like to thank you and show you this beauty, which is our foundation. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now opening the floor for Q&A. I would like to ask Cecilia a question. Cecilia, you know how, what a good friend I was of Severo and you have a lot uh, uh, you are a lot like him and the way you make your presentations you make jokes he used to call tuberculosis little potatoes because tuberculum is potato he always said that but my question to you is i found it very important that you uh, included the differential diagnosis the histopathological diagnosis of histoplasmosis what is most confusing is leishmaniasis. A lot of pathologists uh, don't consider that. We know that Paracoxicoid brasiliensis, your dad has a paper about that, and there's another disease with emeroglycosis. Perhaps it's around and we haven't observed it, but it's very similar to histoplasma. What do you think? I agree fully. I, I mentioned the little potato today, right, Flavio? I thought about using that chart, but the Sporotrix also has this confusion factor and paracox in small forms undoubtedly can be very confusing. I am a bit confused about 
the difference, the big difference that histoplasmosis, uh, of the histoplasmosis in certain regions of Brazil as compared to other regions of Brazil, such as the Southeast and the, the South. But I also noticed a difference in the mycology practice in the Northeast and also in Goiânia, they look, uh, they do the Buffy code in the peripheral blood of the site of the histoplasma and we don't use that. So is it this that we are lacking to have the frequency that they do have or what do you think or it wouldn't make a lot of difference certainly i don't have a lot of experience with that but i think the sensitivity is low the specificity is low compared to everything that we do i think it should be implemented yes i work with lisandra and when she gives sends it to us and we do the buffy code we can do it in rio that we don't do it either so we were discussing of doing this implantation, especially for disseminated histoplasmosis. So I think it could improve sensitivity, yes, of our mycological techniques. What do you think? You were not talking about isolation. You were talking about GIMSA microscopy, right? Because we do the isolator and well. So I had uh, prepared a slide and I think, uh, well, my class was changed here. Uh, he would say what they put on the screen here was a presentation that I had prepared. It was a sketch, only a draft. And in my slides of today, well, I had that slide anyway, but what occurs very frequently are the two main causes of therapeutic failure by the methods that our ancestors did would, would be direct culture. One of them is a random sample where you ask for bacteriology, tuberculosis with the small sample. And the second one, which is the most severe one, and it's very recurring, is when you do the biopsy and then all of the material is put into formal. And this practically become, makes the material useless for culture and then we depend exclusively on pathology. These two factors make it very difficult. And I think if we had this alignment, it would be very helpful between the surgeon, the clinician. The whole thing is very nice to to say, to use the word multidisciplinary approach, but we know it's difficult. The, the word is beautiful and elegant, but in practice, it, nev it doesn't always work, at least in the institution where I work. The niches are very isolated and communication is still poor, in my opinion. Congratulations on your presentations. Excellent. Professor Joseli, I would like to ask about serology from 2005 to uh, 2021. In 2019, there was a significant increase, which did not match the culture because the cultures were less. You mentioned that cultures were gold standard, and Pasqualotto mentioned this discrepancy that exists among the different states. So what you s showed us about Fiocruz, could you clarify this contrast between culture, serology, acute and chronic cases, asymptomatic cases? Yes. Most of our population is AIDS, uh, our AIDS patients. We are a national infectology institute, so to speak, and we have some defined cohorts. Uh, tuberculosis, mycosis, and... Uh, well, now we are, this used to be our flagship, but now it's changing a bit. Then we have the mycology lab. And what do we ask? We usually ask for serology because we don't have, uh, most cases we don't, there's no way we can have a clinical sample of these patients. So we have a radiology uh, uh, picture compatible with histoplasmosis, but we don't have clinical material. So say if we ask for spu sputum, if we can do induced sputum, that's when we can isolate the fungus. But most of the patients are not, uh, do not produce sputum. So we do not have any clinical material other than serum. And this increase, this substantial increase that I've showed you was the inclusion of a more sensitive methodology, which was Western blot. 
up until then, after, up to 2019, uh, while we didn't validate, we could not implement it in the lab routine because of the accreditation that we have at Frio Cruz. So when we published and we showed the valid, then we did the validation, multi-center validation, then we simply included in our routine a much more sensitive method than that of immunodiffusion, which we had been using since 2005. This is why there was this increase, okay? But culture really by mycologists in any, any endemic mycosis, culture, the demonstration of the agent is the gold standard because we may have some cross reactions in serology. And this we discard if we use a, another test in histoplasmosis, because when we got a free kit for a test, well, some tests are extremely expensive. So this was after COVID that we started to talk about how we had to have galactoma. Then we did the comparative study that I showed you, and it was impressive. That patient with a suspicion of histoplasmosis, we did serology, it was positive. We did urine antigen, especially in AIDS patients, and it was positive. That was it. They started treatment immediately. So we saw that there was sensitivity and specificity of 100%. So in most groups, we suggest or recommend if you can use both. Why? Because in acute disease cases, Antigenemia is pretty low. We've already seen that. And I think Diego is going to be talking about that too. In our cohort, antigenemia, antigenuria, she corrects herself, antigenuria in patients with acute histoplasmosis, for instance, those cases where you have epidemic outbreaks or cases in immunocompetent people antigen is no good. So we will have to do serology in order to know whether it could be histoplasmosis. You cannot affirm, but with greater sensitivity and with 100% specificity, it's really hard to say that it's not histoplasmosis, particularly if you are in an endemic area for the disease. Data show that in Brazil, microscopy, direct exam, histopathology are very important. Any experience, for example, with immunohistochemistry, are there antibodies available? Maybe we could consider immunohistochemistry tests that would increase sensitivity, that would also improve specificity, as Cecilia showed. There is a lot of candida, leishmania that may confuse things. It wouldn't be alternative, wouldn't it? In the pathology lab, they don't have it available. Congratulations for your talks. Rosalie, I'm very curious with the serology data in COVID-19 patients, as you showed, 13%. But I recall the graph you showed with anti-MOH antigens that they persist for years. It's just a discussion, really. Can we really, really say that this is active disease? This is the first question. And my second question is, if within these patients who were positive, was there any other symptoms that would be differential for COVID-19? No, we are making the clinical association now because this is what we are doing right now in those H and M cases. Well, the clinical manifestation, so this is a COVID clinic, but this overlaps with 
histoplasma uh, symptoms of Andrea Davila with an infectious disease doctor who is following these cases. She's looking at survival. She's looking at other features. For example, what they show these normal biomarkers. You see histoplasma. That these cases of H and M, they were possibly cases of histoplasmosis. The one related to the M, M, because as you could see in the graph, age goes down around one year. In, in, in one year, you no longer find age, but M persists for many years. So much so that M is not considered definite diagnosis. You cannot consider it because you may have had an infection. You may have had developed antibodies and in two years, you do a serology test and serology is usually indicated for epidemiological inquiry, replacing histoplasmy. Why is histoplasmy no longer used? I'll answer this question that was answered earlier, asked earlier today. Histoplasmy, they were prepared from the filamentous phase and these fungi in the filamentous phase are class three. So in order to handle them and do his make histoplasm, you should have a class three lab, number one. And number two, in the USA, because this is a antigen from inoculate, they thought this could be a biologic weapon, which I don't think it makes any sense at all, but nobody's producing histoplasmin or ferulein or nothing like that. So it's over. We can no longer have it. So in current inquiries, if we want to determine an endemic area, we can do it using serology with the presence of the M bat. Montenegro, which is one of the most important diagnostic reactions for leishmaniasis, has also been removed. In addition to these issues com commented by Rosalie, we also have this issue of biosafety because these reactions are produced with parasites, with proteins. So until we are able to do this using genetic engineering, engineering, these antigens, they will not return. So Montenegro is sorely missed. This is what I wanted to add. Now let's close the session. Thank you all very much. Eu acho que não. Ah, agora sim. A gente vai para a segunda discussão da tarde, que são os métodos não We will now begin the second discussion of this afternoon, which are non-culture based methods. We will start with Dr. Diego Fauzi, an infectologist from Rio Grande do Sul. He's a professor at PUC and URGS. Thank you, Renata. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I thank you again. I thank you. I thank Pascalota for the invitation, and I thank him for uh, kindly granting me the material I am about to use in my presentation.
Agora, agora sim. Uh, I'm going to talk about entries in detection in the, cytop in the, hist in the cytoplasm. Well, I will talk about the utilization of tests, test characteristics, some useful things for us clinicians, and some access, because I think it's important for us to tackle this topic as well. These are my conflicts of interest. Why do we need antigen detection? I think a lot has been said in several sessions today, especially in the previous session. But I think throughout the meeting, we've uh, touched on that topic, that uh, the, the fact that histoplasmosis is a disease that is difficult to diagnose. It has great impact in, in compromise, immunocompromised patients, patients with AIDS. Have, there is a great impact on the health of these HIV patients. And diagnosis in most centers, and I will mention that during my presentation, as well, it will usually be limited to the methods that we've seen, culture and histopathology. This leads, and based on the limitations that we've seen of these methods, this leads to a delayed diagnosis and many times a sensitivity that is not what we need and expect. And when we talk about access, this will be more evident, but many centers are not prepared to do this diagnosis, be it for the absence of tools or for the absence of uh, specialized training. It's not used, it's not easy to find mycologists like Valerio. I think we find it difficult to train people and this has been ever uh, more true as many colleagues have mentioned. What could then fill this gap? We have non-culture based tests. This is what I'm going to talk about. In this session, I'll talk about antigen detection and Dr. Vidal will talk about molecular tests. These tests could fill this gap with a more fast and sensitive diagnosis because we do need the detection of antigens. <coughs> antigen. This picture has been shown this morning, was shown this morning already, but regards to execution time, see here on the right, we have methods that have a shorter execution time, and on the left, those who have a greater execution time. These are histopathology with all of the limitations that Cecilia presented, and culture that Valerio mentioned, all of that taking a long time. For example, in many hospitals, histopathology takes too long for the result to come out, and many times the result is limited. Those reports that Valerio mentioned, they are very unspecific, but we need to go beyond. Unfortunately, these methods bring this limitation with them. And with a shorter turnaround time, we have here at the bottom serology, antigen detection, and molecular methods. These are classified as new methods, methods which increase sensitivity and at the same time have a much shorter and faster turnaround time. Certainly, these are more uh, attractive for the diagnosis of histoplasmosis. Of course, I will defend the antigen detection, but it's evident that, as we've seen in Dr. Jose Lee's presentation, serology has advanced as well. And nowadays we have new methods, which even in immunosuppressed patients could, can provide the sensitivity that we need. <clears throat> A little about the timeline and the background the history of how this has progressed throughout time. Miravista was the first antigen detection test back in 1986, a test that at, at the time had good performance, but was centralized. It was a proprietary uh, technology and people needed to send the samples for the lab to test and offer the results to its clients. Evidently, in the US, this could work, but anywhere else, there are barriers that are almost uh, uh, impossible to overcome. To be sending biological matter or material overseas over long distances, this created many problems for the, uh, all the other places that needed antigen detection. Based on that, already in 2007, we had the first IMI test, FDA approved this year, which was an antigen detection 
test based on polyclonal antibodies. This test was the reason of a lot of debate in the scientific community in the beginning because the results were conflicting with the MiraVista tests. There was a very heated up discussion in terms of publications. Some were positive, some were negative. Sensitivity was this and that. But these tests, well, it was actually good for both companies because they both perfected their tests and we clinicians have access to have had access to better tests since then. At the same time, CDC feeling the need for testing in lower income countries in Latin America developed a test, a polyclonal antibody test, also immuno enzyme, enzyme immunoassay, and it was tested here in Brazil and the performance was similar to that of IMIS in this polyclonal version that we called IMI alpha. More recently, we have an improved IMI test, which is Claros. We can see it in the picture on the right, based on monoclonal antibodies for the detection of the histoplasma antigen, which improved a lot the IMI test sensitivity. This has been the progression and evolution throughout time. And we have one more chapter in this uh, evolution regarding specificity and sensitivity. Now we include the more modern versions of these tests. We see in this meta-analysis by Kasser is that the analytical performance of the test is very good, sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 97%. Of course, here we're talking about disseminated forms of the disease, as has already been show, uh, shown by Professor Jose Lee, in the acute or chronic forms, these sensitivity will drop and the antigen test will not be such an ideal tool. But with an HIV patient with a disseminated form of the disease, certainly the antigen detection is the best tool for the diagnosis of these patients. As I said, there was one more chapter, and I think it's quite an important chapter, MiraVista test. It developed immunochromatography test, and this is the first test that has the potential to be used uh, uh, at bedside, uh, at the bedside. So it's a point of care test. It's a great advantage for us in terms of a more uh, of a faster diagnosis within one hour for one patient. So at that point of care, at the time that we're seeing the patient, we can do the test. This test has a performance that is comparable to immuno to an enzyme immunoassay with a sensitivity of 79%, the, uh, disseminated 91%, and a specific, very high specificity. So it has a great agreement and accordance with the MiraVista test. This is the assay that was published last year. It was also validated. <clears throat> These are the North American data. It has been validated in other contexts as well. We have it here in Colombia. And in this paper involving uh, 100 uh, matched urine and serum samples, we had 26 HIV patients uh, and sensitivity and specificity were 96%. We can see the analytical performance of the test was very good. It was a good agreement, degree, degree of agreement with the MiraVista test. This is another paper, and I find it very interesting. Now we're dealing with two possibilities. One a little bit older, but in this paper, they compare these three tests, two versions of the same test, and then one other version by another methodology. And we see here that sensitivity is, at least for the, la the latter two, is very compar comparable at around 90% specificity and sensitivity, which is great performance for those who want to test for histoplasmosis in patients with HIV. And this was uh, Mexico, a large number of patients that validated these diagnostic tests. When we think about other specimens, uh, should we test other specimens? Well, in this paper in Colombia, they assessed the LFA. They used serum samples and they saw that sensitivity for serum was highly, was very high, 96, 90%. And comparing to an automated reading, you saw in the demonstration, you can see it visually or we can use an automatic reader 
after a little band here in the immunochromatographic test. Agreement was very good, either manually or automatically. But what I want to show that sensitivity was not that different from, different from urine. And it has been said before that we don't need in a disseminated disease necessarily to test serum. We can continue to test urine because agreement is very high. And for the disseminated disease in urine, we have greater sensitivity. This is not so true when we were talking about other forms of histoplasmosis, like acute histoplasmosis, for example. But here in the disseminated disease, we can test urine only with no problem. When I talk about uh, central nervous system disease, then perhaps we have the need to prove the disease on another site. And here the entity detection showed to be useful as well when we do it in the CSF, either in the immunodepressed patient or with the severe disease with also a great sensitivity. So in the CNS, we can use antigen detection as well. <laughs> Improving diagnosis above the classical methods, and I cannot but mention our own work where we assessed uh, 570 patients in 11 centers of Brazil. But the message I want to bring here is this. Uh, in our paper with antigen, Detection, imeclaris, which is what we use, increased diagnosis by more than 50%, and that is quite impressive. This paper by Dr. Vidal's group also has a similar message. They have here a smaller sample, but they use not only imeclaris, but also PCR for histoplasma. And they increased the performance the yield uh, using these, ne these new tests by 37%. Uh, as compared to the previous tests. So we can increase performance as well. So in the last two minutes that I have, I will talk about access. I think it's very important to mention this in this meeting. This paper has been mentioned already. We did a survey trying to check the capability of mycology or the capacity of mycology labs in Latin America. Several centers are represented. We see that the histoantigen detection was around 20% uh, in the respondents as present in the lab, which is very low, very, very low and worrisome, given the prevalence of this disease in Latin America, as we have seen. In 2019, in the Manaus meeting, the declaration that uh, stemmed from this meeting says that in a well the it, the aim is for us to have 100% access of, to antigen detection tests in the Americas by 2025 we have a long way to go given the fact that several countries have no access this is we have several guidelines here summary of the guidelines and among HIV patients to diagnose disseminated histoplasmosis the best method to be used it is histoplasma antigen detection. This was also included in the new list. This is the third edition of the t list of diagnostic in vitro diagnosis tests. And we have, an, well, in the second edition, there was a conditional recommendation. They were awaiting further evidence. But on this third edition, incorporating some of the evidence uh, presented here, produced by our own groups, the evidence were accepted and the WHO has included the antigen detection test in the disseminated histoplasmosis diagnosis as one of the essential methods. To finish, I would like to say that antigen detection is the best option to diagnose disseminated histoplasmosis. The test has been improved with time and the more recent versions have a sensitivity of above 95% and possibly even for uh, to be used in the point of care. It is an essential product for in vitro diagnosis regarded the, as the WHO as such, and we must have urgent access to this tool. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Virnal Bermudes, infectious disease doctor at Emilio Ribas and Clinicas Hospital with the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, 
Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Alessandro for the invitation. I'll show you a topic along the lines of Diego. Something more clinical, not just talking about lab, but I think the clinical interface is very important. I'd like to start with saying something about the two main challenges we have as clinicians trying to make the diagnosis in a disease that is not very well explored. There is a still a very low level of clinical suspicion in many places. And secondly, there is this is a disease where we don't have many tools available that enable a rapid and accurate diagnosis in different scenarios. This is just to reinforce what has already been discussed here. Whenever we find a report, a lab report, a pathology report that doesn't match the clinical manifestations or the medical history and exam is important to go back to the lab, discuss, talk with them. That's why how we can sometimes re, uh, check again some diagnosis. And Diego also showed this in a different way, but going to a new vision of diagnosis where we increase sensitivity and improve sensitivity, but we improved how quickly we can have the diagnosis, which is the challenge we have with antigen tests and less so with molecular techniques. This is also to show how between oh, among over 1,500 diagnoses, less than 10 had as a diagnostic source antigen or molecular testing. So this, this is still the reality in most Brazilian services. In Sao Paulo, we have Adolfo Lutz Institute that do PCR for histoplasm, be it in blood or CSF. It has helped us a lot. And this is the experience I'll be showing you now, showing once again that in spite of all efforts being directed to include antigen testing, there is still room for molecular tests. And we're going to see where we could have that scenario. First, I would like to remind you that in order to evaluate diagnostic tests for histoplasmosis, we have to understand the clinical scenario of these patients. Is this a patient with a pulmonary form of the disease or does the patient have disseminated form of the disease? We have to understand the immune status of the patient because this will determine the fungal load. If the patient has AIDS, is severely immunosuppressed or if has another immunosuppression condition or if the patient is not immunosuppressed and severity of the disease. And all these criteria lead to a greater likelihood of finding antigens. And this will have some impact in terms of lab tests. These are the kinds of table that help us understand the yield or performance of different methods. Sometimes they are very optimistic. Now, when we get the result in practice, we actually see that this performance is not necessarily as good as the ones we find in the literature. But references show that in disseminated forms of the disease, the performance of antigen tests is really superior to the other methods. In this review, once again, a study by Diego, here including molecular assays. This is a meta-analysis of analytical of assay analytical performance, including five serological tests, five molecular tests, and three antigen assays. And highlighting this very favorable result for molecular assays, very similar to the ones described for antigen tests. Once again, reinforcing 
the fact that these are eight patients and with progressive disseminated form of the disease. This is not a meta-analysis or systematic review, it's a narrative review, but which really matches the one or similar to the one showed, shown previously with a yield or performance of around 95% for disseminated forms and 50% for pulmonary forms, looking at molecular methods. That seems all okay, but when we look at things in more details, when we look at the studies in more details, we see that first, we don't have many molecular assays. This was probably the first one comparing different pr protocols for detecting histoplasma DNA, a multi-center study comparing seven different protocols, seven different bio molecular biology protocols, and with different targets, of course, with different equipment, with different or variable methods, but only one of them, when they used conventional PCR with a primer, which today is considered the less sensitive, the sensitivity was 43%. And when we look at all the other results, labs using basically in this PCR, a real-time PCR, sensitivity is between 72 and 100%. The next two slides are very busy, but I wanted to have them like this to make clear that when we discuss molecular biology in histoplasma, it's not that simple as just coming up with one single value. We have different procedures, we have different sampling, usually with a small number of patients. So the three studies that are underlined in red were those who contributed with the largest number of cases in two of them. The sample used for PCR was a culture. So this means that this is not practical at all. If I have to have the culture first in order to perform the PCR test later, it doesn't make any sense as a tool to used to make clinical decisions and sensitivity is variable. Now, when we make a similar assessment, but looking only at the disseminated form of the disease in red, on the left, the studies with the largest number of cases between 50 and 146, these are not really big studies, but once again, culture are the priority samples from which PCR is performed many different extraction techniques, different primers, 18S, which seems the one that leads to best use and with very variable sensitivity. Some studies are like outliers, but in most studies, 90 to 100% sensitivity. This is probably the most relevant studies comparing antigen and PCR. Diego has already shown showed you the results for the antigen test, a multi-center study conducted in Mexico, 108 cases of disseminated histoplasmosis confirmed 41 probable cases and 266 cases without histoplasmosis. On the left, the three antigen techniques shown by Diego, ruling out the one with the worst yield and the two other ones were very similar in terms of sensitivity and specificity and predicting value. On the right, two molecular diagnosis strategies with different samples. The first one, HCP100, showing lower sensitivity as shown by urine antigen, but with moderate to high results in the other parameters. Now, regarding the SCAR-1281 primer, we see that specificity goes down to less than 60%. What we can conclude or take out of that is that today we have recommendations to prioritize strategies or PCR, real-time PCR platform, and the primers that are the most widely used are HCP, 118S, but the most important thing is to standardize this technique in the lab. This is a comparative study 
Well, this is actually an assessment of a laboratory hub established in Guatemala, where they were able to centralize the submission of samples in, uh, of people living with HIV. This was very interesting result because 80% of the services that see HIV patients in Guatemala were able to submit samples to this laboratory hub where very rapidly screening te techniques were used to identify culture for mycobacteria and fungi, PCR, and antigen techniques in the urine for histoplasma and LFA for cryptococcus in the serum. A very significant number of cases, 31% of the cases had histoplasmosis, but I would like to highlight or the table on the right. When one single test was used, PCR had a sensitivity of 63%. Now, when different tests are used in combination, and I think this is something very interesting in this study, in addition to the logistics and the diagnostic model used, you see that when you use both PCR and conventional culture, 66% PCR with isolator, 76%. When you use urine antigen testing plus PCR, 96%. And antigen alone had a sensitivity of 72%. So if you use two strategies together, enabled to significantly increase diagnosis. Two details, first PCRs for histoplasm was done using sputum. And with the classification of type histoplasmosis, when it was done operationally, a definition in the study, positivity of urine antigen for the cases of disseminated histoplasmosis was to 94%. They're showing good yield, but generally speaking, we had what stands out is this good result using both antigen and PCR. Now, with a smaller population in one single center in Sao Paulo, we conducted a prospective study, including patients with CD4 counts less than 200. And regardless of the symptoms and regardless of the cause of admission to the hospital, we did a urine antigen test for hips. His, histoplasm and an in-house uh, PCR with HC18S. Conventional mycological methods were available and the routine was to follow them. So this is real life, urine antigen plus blood PCR. Medium CD4 cell count was 26, which is classical of severely immune compromised patients, but eight out of 106 patients had disseminated histoplasmosis, around 80% positivity for histoplasmosis. Now I'd like to show you this table. Looking at that from a clinical point of view, very probably what favors a diagnosis in a severely ill patient who is in a hospital would be using mycological, conventional mycological techniques together with rapid testing methods. Well, this will depend on what is available, uh, that service. Only looking at histopathology or cytopathology, four out of eight patients were diagnosed. Now with culture, four out of eight patients. Now, if we bring together this method, five out of eight would have been diagnosed. If we look on the right, using only antigen testing, four out of five, using only PCR in the blood, four out of eight. The same thing. Now, when we outline a diagram, we said that both conventional methods and what we could call uh, rapid methods diagnosed two out of eight, but each one of them accounted for three cases. So conclusion, even though this is a very small series, I think it brings us the following message. It is important to complement the workup in a hard diagnosed disease, not necessarily in later stages, but using 
classical method together with antigen together with pcr with standardization is probably the most relevant thing to do if you give me if you allow me 30 seconds some final remarks molecular diagnosis is used in many centers in latin america there are centers of excellence that have a long experience in bio, bi, uh, molecular biology it can be a tool to be used in some specific settings the analytical performance of molecular assays varies according to the disease stage of the clinical form of histoplasmosis pcr has good clinical performance in disseminated forms there are no commercial pcr tests available L. there are many different platforms and there are many different ways of performing these pcr tests but there are already some recommendations i close saying that it's really important to have a comprehensive diagnosis and unifying a non-culture based methods and with special interest of molecular diagnosis in endemic countries where histoplasmosis tests may not be uh, available everywhere but there may be one lab experimental lab or in non-endemic areas where you have sporadic cases and that it is not warranted to have a routine use of these antigen tests thank you we now invite dr tiago garcia radiologist professor at the federal university of rio grande do sul and, and the graduate course in the same university of pneumological diseases. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Pasqualotto for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here in this multidisciplinary meeting. We radiologists like to take part in this in these meetings because our job is uh, has a multidisciplinary characteristic, and we like to to take part in meetings like this. It's a pleasure to share this session with the other speakers, many friends here. We have discussed cases in the past, so it's a big pleasure. We will talk about image in histoplasmosis. Image findings. The radiological findings in histoplasmosis are very variable on the in the chest we may have a solitary pulmonary nodule we may have multiple nodules we may have a miliary pattern in the ct or x-ray pulmonary cavitation excavated lesions consolidations uh, mediastinal lymph lymph node enlargement fibrosing well uh, Lymphadenopathy also it can see very well, but in the abdomen, you may have splenomegaly, splenic hypoattenuation, hepatomegaly, hepatic focal hypoattenuation, adrenal mass, and also adrenal enlargement. As you can see, there are many manifestations of the same disease, and usually, the weaponry that we have to assess histoplasmosis or a suspicion of histoplasmosis are these tests, X-ray, CT, MRI, PET scan, and arteriography. Of course, the MRI has a very limited indication. Rare cases like a mediastinal lesion, uh, PET scan is also very strict in the assessment of treatment response after diag the diagnosis has been done. Arteriography, well, it could be interventionist if there is a complication of fibrosing. 
medias denied is well but if that's not the case we the, the uh, tests that we use are mainly mainly x-ray and ct the ct is more sensitive the, the x-ray ends up being an entry test it's very much used it's very important but every time the case has not been well clarified then we need to examine the chest of the patient more in depth and we do a ct uh, there are some exceptions. If we have a suspicion of the histoplasmosis, which has not been diagnosed through another method, then we do a chest CT. Differential diagnosis, well, they've all been dealt with somehow here in this session. Tuberculosis, lung cancer, lung metastasis, lymphoma, uh, as angioinvasive aspergillosis, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, chronic hepatitis aspergillosis, cryptococcosis, Pericodiodomycosis, candidiasis, uh, candidiasis, pulmonary vasculitis. So I have stressed here tuberculosis, lung cancer, primary lung cancer, and depending on the context, if there's a disseminated disease or only pulmonary disease, we may uh, include uh, angioinvasive aspergillosis, chronic necrotizing aspergillosis, and pericoxidiomycosis coccidiodomycosis. So histoplasmosis in general is not a hypothesis that uh, comes first. It will come first if we have the clinical information because imaging is very, the image findings are very similar to that, those of other diseases. So there is no uh, sign, specific sign of histoplasmosis in the image. Therefore, the communication is key communication, clinical, radiological integration. If we know there is the suspicion, what the, the degree is of this suspicion, so we can put together the pieces of this puzzle and try to better help the team and the patient. So here, in terms of histoplasmosis, this is the flow chart for the image tests. We have pulmonary and disseminated histoplasmosis. Pulmonary may be acute or chronic, and the chronic one non-cavitary or cavitary. Let's start with acute histoplasmosis. This is one case, a 45-year-old man, dyspnea for seven days, dry cough, patient with HIV, diffuse crackles, ulcerated lesions in the oral mucosa. We ended up not doing a CT of these patients because we did the biopsy of the oral mucosa and the CT was not available for some reason. The histopathological diagnosis came and we didn't do his uh, CT. The patient was treated and improved, but what we see are bilateral diffuse reticulate infiltrates. Certainly CT would show us a much more bloomed uh, image, so to speak, but we see bilateral diffuse manifestations of histoplasmosis on the x-ray. This is the case that Dr. Terezinha showed in the morning. Maybe we, sometimes we, we miss it. This is a patient during a trip to Central America. Uh, they went, well, she and other people from the same traveling group had the similar manifestations. It's a multinodular type, certainly mycobacteriosis or a metastatic disease. There are other fungal diseases with differential diagnosis. And for the radiologist, this is the framework that we have. And this is the x-ray of the patient, multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules. One other case, we will see several one, several cases, okay? This is the coronal image. This is a section on of the right lung. There are less nodules than the previous image, here we see a subneural nodule here, one here, patient 61 years old with a condition of fever and cough. I'd like to remind you that distinction based on the image of a chronic and acute disease is very difficult. Unless you have a cavitary disease with many cavities, then you say, well, this is a chronic disease. Depending on the manifestation, for example, in terms of nodules, we don't know if it's acute or chronic. I know it's acute because the patient had an ac acute clinical uh, picture. So the 
to differ to diff to make a distinction between acute and chronic through the image it's not so simple this is another form of acute histoplasmosis in which we have a sign uh, an, a nodular area well it seems like a nodular area in the lung it's very difficult to think of histoplasmosis first off we will think about uh, pneumonia or even neoplasm and when we do biopsy we can then see that it's a, due to an infectious disease and we should bear in mind lymph node lymph node in, in enlargements this is an acute case Every time we do an x-ray and we see this, we have to think about histoplasmosis. In this case, had it confirmed somehow. Well, chronic histoplasmosis. Let us begin by looking at the non-cavitary forms. Here we have a 29-year-old patient who was who moved to a building about, we've been following this case for about a year. She, she moved to a building infect, infested with bats. This is the right side normal and there are nodules on the left side nodular opacity on the lower left lobe other nodular opacities also always in the lower left no, uh, lobe subneural uh, nodular opacity now some coronal images of the same patient. She had this clear exposure and diagnosis was done. Cases are diagnosed by this whole apparatus that I'm not very familiar with, which somehow, well, it was confirmed. You've talked about it all day and somehow that confirmed it. i uh, sorry, I'm not even going to risk getting into this area, but this is the same patient with the lower left lobe affected. This is another case of chronic histoplasmosis. This has more of an inflammatory component. There are areas of consolidation, a lot of nodularity. This is an airway disease. Nodules are uh, here, the right lower lobe two hemop hemoptysis and chronic cough. She uh, had hemoptysis as well. Now another patient. We have a nodule, a solitary nodule here. We always know it could be histoplasmosis, but we always invest, uh, investigate towards the neoplasma suspicion. This is a soft tissue window we see there is no fat there is no pulmonary hematoma it's not a benign nodule patient went to bio biopsy and it accused histoplasmosis we are not surprised but it's always we always rule out in the case of solitary nodules the possibility of lung neoplasm this is an if it diffuse pulmonary emphysema with a long mass of irregular contours. So it's first hypothesis is lung cancer. And when the patient goes to biopsy, they confirm histoplasmosis. Every time we see a nodule like this, we uh, hope it's not, we pray that it's not uh, cancer. And then we see histoplasmosis, we actually are happy, I should say, it's we actually, we're not surprised, it's common, but we always try to rule out cancer. This is another form, pulmonary nodules. This could be primary neoplasm with this, and already with metastasis, and it, metastasis, and it turned out to be histoplasmosis. Now we are looking at the chronic cavitary form of the disease here. We have excavated lesions of thick walls. This is a clearly active lesion with thick cavities, with many consolidation areas and nodules, some sparse nodules here. Pneumothor a person had the pneumothorax on the left because of a bronchopleural fistula. Because of these excavated lesions, some of these lesions somehow communicated with the pleura. 
this is a chronic form this is a clearly active disease but it's not acute it's chronic this is another form of excavated lesion there are excavated lesions on the right upper lobe upper right lobe of thin walls and the here this here is more uh, the wall is more is thicker so we are always uh, we always try to find out whether it's active or not so we always say that the previous test the, the the patient did was always the most important one so we had to check for this now when we have a case of fibrosing mediastinus then mediastinitis then histoplasmosis go up to the top of the list in the differential diagnosis it could be a uh, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, but every time we see fibrosis mediastinitis, we think of histoplasmosis. There has been exposure, exposure, uh, because it uh, it's an important cause of fibrosis mediastinitis. Here we see the venous trunk, bronchocephalic trunk. The, the here we see worse situations. This is all encompassed by the infiltrative tissue. In scintillography, we can see the perfusional deficit on the right lobe. Here, another case with stenosis of the right pulmonary artery. Here's stenosis of the pulmonary vein and lower right vein. In these situations, we do arteriography. This shows the, the decrease in the pulmonary artery uh, caliper. So we try to increase the caliper of these vessels through interventionist radiology. This is another patient with infiltrative lesion. There's an infiltrated lesion in this middle portion, reducing the caliper of this vessel. We have a reduction here in the this U site, and we see a reduction of the caliber of the intermediate. Uh, Bronchus. Here we have a patient with dysphagia, and we do an esophagus, esophagogram, esophageal, esophagus test. We can see these are some other methods that we can use to investigate fibrosis mediastinitis and the comp and its complications. In the case of disseminated histoplasmosis, this is a 62-year-old patient with a cervical lymph node megaly and abdominal pain. We see many lymph node, abdominal lymph node megalies here in the hepatic. I love the mesoterium, a lot of lymph node enlargements and the mesenterium, uh, others more here, tar uh, the chest was normal. This is pre and post treatment, pre-treatment, post-treatment, showing an important improvement in these changes. In the pre and post treatment, you can see good improvement. Also pre and post treatment, you can see how this mass decreased after treatment. Well, here we have an HIV patient with weight loss, multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules in the CT. Again, multiple nodules, lymph node megalies, axillary ones, and mediastinal ones too, bilateral, retrocrural ones, splenomegaly, retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal as well. This is a case, uh, it's, still, it's still the previous case in which the patient, well, of course, we have to think of tuberculosis, lymphoma, sarcoidosis. This was a case of histoplasmosis. This other patient in July, 2018, he took a test because of another reason uh, he had a normal chest, and in March of 2019, he was complaining of fatigue, cough, fever. This is a miliary pattern. The patient, the patient is here on the right. 
and we can see all of its all of the patients CT with a miliary pattern, which is classical, multiple pulmonary uh, bilateral pulmonary macronodules, and the same patient has all these hypoechoic lesions with several hypoechoic lesions. Just to finish, we can, well, histoplasmosis may affect the adrenal gland, so there is adrenal involvement uh, with bilateral adrenal masses. We also have always have to bear in mind histoplasmosis. Take home messages, histoplasmosis has multiple forms of radiological presentations. There is no pathognomonic sign of histoplasmosis. The communication is key for differential diagnosis. Sorry, I went over my time and I thank you all for your attention. Let's invite our last speaker in this session, Dr. Cáceres, microbiologist, specialist in diagnosis, epidemiology and fungal identification. He worked in Cooperación para Investigación Biológica Medellín in Colombia. Okay. Boa tarde. Muito obrigado, Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Alessandro. I will speak Spanish. So today I will talk about the development for diagnosis of histoplasmosis and some strategies beyond diagnosis. So this is my disclosure. We talked about this all, the, all day. You know that the diagnosis of histoplasmosis has many lab techniques. We could group this between those that do direct diagnosis and indirect diagnosis. When we talk about direct diagnosis, we refer to those techniques that show me how it is. That's microscopy and culture, where we can grow it in a specialized media, culture media. Please stop the timer. So I was saying, we have this group where we try to show the presence of the fungus, but we also have indirect methods, which are mainly based on the identification of the fungus that could include biomarkers and also detection of genetic material. It's important to say that direct methods help us confirm more strongly the diagnosis of the infection, but it has some limiting factors, while indirect methods are able to provide us faster diagnosis with the limitation that it doesn't prove diagnosis. I think that once again, we've summarized all those tables. We know that there are many different forms, different lab methods. Every lab method will have a different performance depending on the clinical form of the disease. And there is no perfect test. There is always a certain degree of uncertainty and possibility of diagnostic error. And this is why where the combination of different lab methods will help us increase accuracy or the possibility of defining the disease in a patient. Talking a little bit about the pros and cons regarding the pros, we have microscopy and culture methods. The advantage is that they help us prove the diagnosis. And if you talk about microscopy, microscopy can be a rapid method. On the other hand, biomarkers talking about antibodies and antigens have the advantage that they are very accurate. They are non-invasive. They can be rapid. 
and we are talking even about point of care in the case of histoplasma antigen detection and dna is also highly accurate and it can also be a rapid method now when we talk about the cons of these methods in the case of microscopy and culture we have the issue of sensitivity and the sensitivity will depend on many different aspects as the quality of the specimen the lab processes and the expertise of those who process the isolate and culture the more the most limiting the most important limiting factor is turnaround time and sensitivity and regarding biomarkers the main limiting factors cross reactions with other fungi that cause systemic endemic mycosis and the availability of this kit regarding dna detection the most important limiting factor is related to lack of consensus regarding protocols to be used and the lack of diagnostic kits here i'd like to summarize some of the products available in the market i'd like to show you the products approved by the eu or by the fda and even some that are available in the us under the approval of clia for antibody detection systems we have many methods available we have had them for many years they are based on immunodiffusion, immunodiffusion and complement fixation. Regarding to DNA detection systems, we have just one kit available, but it's important to say that this molecular biology kit is for the detection of, or for the identification of culture. It cannot be used to process biological material. And in the case of the antigen detection systems, we have some available some commercially available elises also lfa and better d glucan can also be used so beta glucan is not a specific it's an antigen that is present in a large number of fun of fungus and many fungus species talking more about antigen now i think that so we know already what is available we have this first product that has been shown to be highly sensitive and is specific to diagnose histoplasmosis. It's been validated in Colombia and other countries, and it has the approval of the EU, and it has also been approved by the FDA. There is something that is very important to make the diagnosis faster. This is where natural flow based technologies have uh, make a difference and let's look at this second product that has already been mentioned today it uses urine samples it's a lateral flow device that can give you results in around 40 minutes without previous treatment of the samples we also have the opportunity to assess this in the lab looking at high analytical performance as has been mentioned by a previous speaker, the analytical performance is comparable to ELISIS. And we have a third company, which is also providing reagents or methods for histoplasma testing. It's a new company. They have an ELISA-based device. One validation published last year saying that analytical performance is very good regarding its sensitivity, but it has some issues regarding specificity and accuracy. Additionally, they are offering a lateral flow device, but so to date, there are no external validations. So in order to use this device, we should have previous validations before implementing it. So this is what we were talking about all day and this is what is available for histoplasmosis diagnosis more focused on diagnosis of patients and what are the applications antibody detection so we have these two papers western blot to detect antibodies with very good analytical performance to diagnose histoplasmosis and also forms associated to hiv 
The results are pretty good. And you can have a second test with over 90% analytical performance. It could complement other tests that are similar in terms of detecting uh, cases. We also know that there are some experiences using antigen testing for diagnosis of histoplasmosis in other animals. We have some studies who look at the test both in dogs and cats. Under the One Health umbrella, because histoplasmosis is not considered a zoonosis. It is a disease in other mammals, but you don't have transmission of histoplasmosis from animals to humans. But knowing that it can be found in pets can be an indicator for risk of exposure to humans. So let's talk a little about a little bit about One Health now. As we know, so we have diseases that are found in humans or that humans can acquire from animals or or from the environment. As we know, histoplasmosis is a saprognosis. We get it when we are exposed to the fungus in the environment, and we have novel approaches to detect it in the environment. Now I'll talk very briefly about some future directions. We know that clinical diagnosis, well, for that we already have highly specific and sensitive and accurate methods that are helping us make diagnosis of this disease in HIV patients. We know that molecular methods have the advantage that can be used in non-fresh uh, samples, for instance, in paraffin embedded tissues. And we have also had developments in RT PCR and LAMP method, which is a PCR uh, method that is simpler and also using uh, Maltitov and also some progress in next generation sequencing, making analysis of the microbiome and with that diagnosis of histoplasm infection. Talking a little bit now about environmental detection, we know that some protocols have validated PCR to detect histoplasma in the environment. Now I'd like to give you a real life example, the courtesy of my call from the disease branch. This is the investigation of an outbreak where 23 Boy Scouts were in a camping at a camping weekend in Louisiana in the USA. And after that, half of the boys had symptoms compatible with histoplasmosis. On December 2018, a, they, this lab received urine samples from this boy, around uh, 30, 13 uh, samples and antigen testing were performed. This is very much related to what Rosely talked about today. Since these are acute forms not associated to HIV, the concentration of antigen is very low, very close to the cutoff point, particularly when we compare with antigens we have in HIV positive people. Unfortunately, in this investigation of outbreak, we didn't have access to the serum, so we couldn't do antibody testing for ethical reasons because these were minors. And an interesting part of the study was to perform the molecular analysis of the environment. And there they found that a total of seven analyzed samples in two histoplasma capsulatum DNA was found. So with all those tools, we could solve the outbreak. We knew that there were some exposures that had been previously uh, described for histoplasmosis. This was the first outbreak reported in the state of Louisiana. And there they used antigen detection and molecular methods to confirm the exposure and the outbreak. So to conclude, it's always important to consider the power of the diagnostic test because they may help us detect the disease and they help us also control diseases. But if we do not have something powerful, all we will have is a stain 
But if we have something more powerful, we will be able to identify the danger, which is a number of uh, a number of ferocious of fierce wolves. Take away messages. We have to bear in mind that the diagnosis of histosplamosis is very complex. So we have lack of disease awareness, lack of clinical suspicion, lack of disease burden, and we know that the use of different diagnostic methods is important for better di detection. We know that there are many endemic regions for histoplasmosis. What we need now is to have more histoplasmologists on those areas that are endemic using all the available tools for detection and to help our patients. Thank you very much. Bom, convido os palestrantes, Dr. Diego Fauci, Cáceres, Dr. Tiago. I invite all speakers to come on stage or questions from the audience. Any questions? I'd like to ask Tiago, if a pulmonary nodule has calcification inside it, which makes it easier for a suspicion of histoplasmosis, does it make it easier to suspect of histoplasmosis or TB? Unfortunately, he's off the mic. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Calcification helps us to differentiate a nodule that is benign and inactive from a nodule that could have some activity. For example, a calcification such as popcorn, the, the popcorn pattern, either very central or per peripheral, it's a residual disease. Whatever caused this nodule is inactive. When we have eccentric calcifications or irregular calcifications, then we say, well, this is a nodule which may be neoplastic or inflammatory, but which we cannot say is residual. So the question is between tuberculosis and histoplasmosis, from, based on the nodule, we can't. So this, we can say this is a nodule when classification is a residual nodule, be a histoplasmoma or, but it helps you make a distinction from a tumor. Some metastasis calcified, well, classification, a tumor for inflammatory disease, when the primary lesion is a lesion that causes calcification, for example, osteosarcoma, then we become uh, worried. But calci pulmonary calcification is so frequent, so frequent, that when we see a calcification in a nodule, we may think that that calcification already existed and the nodule is... Uh, any disease that is causing the nodule is simply by chance growing together with that nodule and the nodule is not part of the disease. And I uh, stress that a calcified nodule we see not every day, but many times we see it. So if there is a nodule that is calcified, we can even think that it's a mere coincidence. I'm trying to summarize the fact that calcification in a lesion, it doesn't help much. It helps you say that if it's residual or active, and if it's active, then we have to check. What about chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis? Is it similar to tuberculosis in terms of the budding aspect, the budding tree aspect, 
Well, the budding tree is the presence of secretion in the airway. The airway, aside from the, the well, in the alveolar ducts and necrotizing chronic histoplasmosis produces secretion in that cavity. The cavity is in contact with the airway. The patient coughs and that secretion, just like it happens in the tuberculosis, will happen in histoplasmosis as well. So when we see the nodule, the budding tree, we always, now we don't no longer think that all budding tree nodules are tuberculosis. A question to Diego, why didn't you try? Something that calls my attention for a long time why has hasn't anybody tried to see what happens in uh, respiratory histoplasma such as alveolar lavage what is the prof what is the cost the performance well if you have antigen information mira vista has been doing antigen detection for more than 30 years. And what they show is that antigen detection is good for diagnosis of acute histoplasmosis, particularly the pulmonary forms associated to outbreaks. With the new kits, well, we don't have information because part of validations were done in people living with HIV. And because these are the forms that are more frequently diagnosed many times, diagnosis of acute pulmonary diseases are usually diagnosed later on. So I think these kits have been available for five or six years. That's different from 30 years experience. We have to make this evaluation. The same with other clinical forms, for instance, histoplasma meningitis, which is started being reported, for example. Summing up, we know that it works. This is the kit that has been in the market for longest, but Getting respiratory samples is not very easy. Thus, people rather detect urine antigen and complement it with serology. Since we know that the antigen in very early stages will be circulating, and after two or three weeks, then it goes down, then and then we start seeing antibodies. We have to do it, and it should be part of the list of priorities. That's it, so, someone wants to add? I would like to add to that question. What about CSF? Because some forms of neurological histoplasmosis, I've done it. I'd like to hear from you. Yes, Mira Vista, which is one that has been longest in the market, has shown that the CSF antigen test, but it has to be evaluated. And meningitis is also very important in children because we have had this in Colombia in infants younger than one year. And in these younger infants less than one year of age, meningitis was found uh, in the CNS forming in other people. In Tucumán, Argentina, they are reporting that they see a lot of histoplasma meningitis. And that's where you have to evaluate the performance of this test. We have other things, for example, the test has been evaluated for you and we have to, if you implement it, if you use it for CSF, we have to know whether it has to have some pretreatment. It's not just have these samples there. So the test hasn't been uh, developed for that. So we have to validate it for CSF use. Could we have LFA testing 
in Brazil because it's been tested only abroad for validation purposes, maybe have a multi-center study using LFA testing, just has, as has been done for cryptococcosis. Yes, because we have an important work by our group before the technical note was published, Dr. Ernesto Vidal participated of this group in Guyana, and we did cryptococcosis uh, LFA test, and then it started to be used in the healthcare system. And with all these presentations today, we want to know about that. Well, you put me in a uncomfortable position, but anyway, these are validations that are required. Previous validations in serum and urine, this is available. It has good performance for urine and serum testing, but we have, what I think is important is to check if the test has the performance uh, that is uh, mentioned by the manufacturer, what we saw in COVID pandemic, the performance is not the one you see the insert. So we always have to check that. Talking about PCR lamp, where you don't need thermocyclists, Dr. Ernesto, do you have any experience while it was only conventional PCR you use in your study in Sao Paulo? With lamp, no, but Lutz went through a period of standardization, first with conventional PCR, then with nested, and also with real-time PCR. But results were similar with nested and uh, real-time PCR. We have data in the literature showing that real-time PCR can be a slightly more accurate, but experience with nested and histoplasmosis in blood is greater than with real time. So most of protocols today use that. And you get fungal DNA from a blood sample or culture. And this is a difficulty. Not everyone, not everyone is integrated to get the culture. We get the fungus straight away. So this is a limiting factor. Yes, in the Lutz Institute protocol, we need 10 mils of blood total. Questions from the audience? I'd like to ask a question regarding images. You talk about the nodule. What about the lymph node? Is it the same reasoning or lymph node calcification is already suggestive? Lymph node, the mediastinal lymph node. It doesn't help a lot. We know that in histoplasmosis, you do have calcification in lymph nodes, but there are many other diseases that cause calcification in the lymph nodes. For instance, occupational diseases, silicosis, sarcoidosis may lead to calcifications, TB to already treated lymphoma, mediastinal lymph nodes uh, also calcify after lymphoma treatment. So calcification in mediastinal lymph nodes or in any other lymph nodes, in any other sites, these calcifications this tell us more like, well, depending on the kind of calcification, this is a residual disease. It's no longer an active disease. But not only that, we may have a lymph node with calcification, but which is still active. So in histoplasmosis, we see calcified lymph nodes, definitely, but it doesn't help radiologists a lot really, because there are many other diseases in the differential diagnosis that also cause calcifications. I gave you these examples, TB, sarcoidosis, silicosis, and maybe in uh, a treated lymphoma. So calcification doesn't help a lot, really. It helps when it's clearly residual. It just tells us that it's residual. It won't tell us that which is the disease. And a question to Caceres. Could you please talk about the limitations of the antigen test and crossed reactions? You've mentioned them, but could you further elaborate on that? Crossed reactions, particularly the one that has been found is for paracoxis depend 
the, on the test, you may have 25 up to 100% cross reaction limitations. It's important to take into account that antigen levels go down with treatment. So previous exposure, so ex exposure previous to treatment increases the risk of false negative results. We have to take that into account. Previous exposure and indirect methods, antigens and antibodies, often when we are in doubt, we recommend present to have matched samples for the detection of antibodies. But if you have negative results, we have to reconfirm doing a second test. If you already know that the patient ha is on antifungal treatment, we should look for a second choice, for instance, antibody detection or try culture of a infectious focus, because we know that with antifungal treatment, if we test again, we will once again have a negative result because we know that antigens go down. Blastomyces, the Miravista test, which is a polyclonal antibody, well, there they report more cross reactions. Imis is not the case because it's a monoclonal. Coccidiosis, no cross reactions. I would like to make a comment, something we've mentioned before. I think Diego asked that question earlier today regarding monitoring of patients during treatment. We don't have much access to tests only for research purposes that we don't use it. But Diego, is there any recommendation, any idea of when to monitor these patients? Is it the patient, the patient who is failing and maybe in four or six weeks, we will see a drop in fungal load. Do you have any specific idea on that? As I said, as a recommendation, well, that's not clear. What we know is the experience from Dr. Witt with ELISA. And in Colombia, we can use this in-house test and the CDC in-house test. Well, the protocol had established dates for follow-up of these patients. And what we saw in the Colombia protocol is that after one month, the patients who were well, we couldn't find antigens anymore. It was negative. Now, when we look at antigen peaks, generally, the main problem was bioavailability of itraconazole. And when we measured serum levels of itraconazole, we didn't see any itraconazole. And, and that's why the patient didn't have a good outcome. I think Therizium mentioned something about the guidelines around after six months, we have to make a decision whether we're going to discontinue treatment or if there is a suspicion of relapse recurrence. And the protocol in Colombia, we don't have so much, so many TB cases. Some patients were worse, but antigen tests were negative. Then we searched for something else. Maybe it's a different disease. So absence of antigen tells us that this is not histoplasma. We should look for a different disease. Your question is important. Talking a little bit about lymphadenopathy, non-calcified lymphadenopathy, to give you an idea that lymphadenopathy is not important histoplasmosis. Lymphadenopathy is especially an acute disease with or without lesions in the lungs, but mediastinal, active mediastinal lymph nodes, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes with signs of activity in the CT scan. Histoplasmosis is part of the differential diagnosis. It is important. It's not that it is specific for histoplasmosis, but as we could see, it leads to significant lymph node, mediastinal lymph node disease, 
it's always a possibility. And I highlight here the issue of fibrosing mediastinitis, which is the complication of this lymph node disease that may improve or not, that may continue leading to severe calcifications. A patient who had no treatment, no history of lymphoma, and you see calcified lymph nodes with lymphoma, well, then we rule out because it's extremely ra uh, rare for a non-treated lymphoma to be calcified. Actually, I had there were questions too, but I think the uh, the audience has preference. Questions with Dr. Vital. Vital, what do you think is the preferential clinical specimen for PCR aside from tissue, whole blood, large volume, buffy coat, serum, plasma, or you don't, or we don't know? That's one question. The other to Diego Cáceres. Should we expect? the l antigen levels to be zero in order to start therapy? Yes, that is super important. From Based on what we've seen in the healthcare routine, it seems like whole blood is a sample that can, uh, is a specimen that can contribute even though uh, this could seems to be one of the variables. Collection, early treatment, and then assess the extracted uh, material. This way, I think the performance is better as compared to other procedures. And taking advantage of this question, I question a lot thinking about uh, others, other samples like sputum. In the case of Guatemala, Professor Rodriguez, they had a good performance of PCR it's in sputum for histoplasma. If we are in a time in which we value the sensitivity of lung, which uh, at about 50% with patients with disseminated tuberculosis and severe disease, it seems that his, the differential diagnosis should follow a line of uh, not such demanding objectives in terms of sensitivity. This means to add value to a sample that could be point of care, that could have some uh, faster collection. If you think about antigen, if we think about cryptococcus and the antigen, the sensitivity for the scar, sput sputum is 80%, but we have 98% at the tip of our fingers, so we don't use it. Perhaps an antigen to hide histoplasma in a patient with disseminated disease, couldn't the sputum be a biological sample or a specimen that could add? Our experience in the blood lab is a PCR sample. The blood is a very complicated sample to work with, obviously, and I will correlate with something. Uh, if blood were a good sample or a specimen, cultures would always be positive. So, uh, Perhaps we expect these to be in the blood. Blood has many inhibitors. You have to treat it, and that the, uh, at the end of the day, the probability of detecting microorganisms, whatever they are, especially fungi, 
they are present in very low amounts in the blood. So I am an older person and for respiratory diseases, especially if there is a lesion, we measure it with PCR and that uh, path, uh, not, and pathology. So if you want to do it in the, well, our experience with blood was very good. We took patients that were very immunodepressed and we have to run many samples for that to, to for the PCR to work. Regarding the antigen, can I be, I have to be sincere. So papers show curves and curves have more than two measurements. The important thing is to make measurements and many measures to know what the pattern is because sometimes when we have just two measurements, it's a straight line. Now, when we have three, this straight line turns into a curve. And if you don't have, if, if you make more measurements, you have a better shaped curve. I think we have to make many measurements to see the, how the antigen that is present, how it is in relation to previous antigen levels, if it's gone up or down again. We have to know more, but from what we know is that the trend is that the antigen levels will go down. This has been seen in previous follow-ups. I have the same opinion as Dr. Todella. I was, well, they put together a multiplex for diagnosis of TB, histoplasmosis and cryptococcosis and pneumocystis. Blood? No way. Only respiratory samples. Well, it's been published uh, like one month ago. And it's really interesting how they managed to do this multiplex because they can really separate fungi from CTIs. From what I learned in Spain is when we really want to put together a molecular test for histoplasmosis, we should work with respiratory sample. It's easy to get. You do a induced disputum, a bronchoalveolar lavage, it's easy to perform. Only in those really ill patients who are intubated, but then we use antigenuria, but in samples for PCR test, what is recommended is bronchoviolar lavage, mainly. I agree. And in any disease where you have a direct specimen or sample, you have to use it. But this issue of blood, maybe it has, it can be used in some specific cases in severely immunosuppressed patients with disseminated disease who will have a very high fungal load, where you need an accessible sample. As in any PCR, going through a standardization process and test the sample, as was done at Lutz Institute, I think that's a choice. But for this population, it could be extrapolated to other populations. Any further questions? Diego. We talk a lot about crossed reactions. We know that histoplasmosis and blastomycosis in North America have areas of convergence. They are present in the same areas. And here in South America, histoplasmosis and, and paracoxidomycosis happen, are present in the same areas. Has it been shown already that it's not really cross reaction, but Co infection. Well, regarding co infection, blastomycosis and histoplasm in Brazil, and maybe here in Brazil, paracoxidomycosis and histoplasmosis. When I was in Medellin, I had a patient 
who was a, a, a native Colombia, he had a co-infection, but it's been many years ago. We know the limitations of the test, which can be crossed reactions, but we have to know where the patient is coming from, the clinical manifestations. It's not only the test. If we are in doubt, the antibody test can also help us. I think that while, for example, new antibodies are not developed that are more specific, ruling out crossed reactions, because it's something that takes very long, and we have to work with what is available. Always take into account the correlation with epidemiology, clinical manifestations, but it's always possible that we can have co-infection. We shouldn't say that it's impossible because it can happen. Just to add to that, Marcos, in a study where we assessed antigen testing, we recruited enrolled patients with HIV from large urban centers. That's why the possibility of co-infection with paracoxidiosis was less, but undoubtedly that would be a possibility when you have convergent areas with both diseases occurring in the same area. Just one message. We had a cultural activity for seven. I asked them to have that earlier. I know that everybody is very tired, so that we started around 6.20. So 6.20, we'll have a cocktail be served, and musicians will come, and we will have a Shoro music show. If you do not know what Shoro is, this is probably the best there is in Brazilian music. I hope you like it. If we have no further questions, we close. Can I ask a question? Cross reactions. I wouldn't be so worried about cross reactions because the treatment is virtually the same. The important is that you have a fungus, it's like a better glucon. We have a fungus there. What should I do? Broad spectrum antifungal, because this is important. I wouldn't be so worried if you have this kind of cross reaction. We see this work in Guatemala. When a patient has a positive antigen, I would do blood culture before starting treating treatment with antifungal. Then, if it's positive, if the culture is positive, let's try to see what the strain is, and maybe later you can do a sequencing and check if it's uh, what kind of histoplasma it is. We can also do PCR with using an isolator. A patient with positive antigen you may later confirm what the disease is. I'd like to listen to the opinion of the panelists in hyperendemic areas. HIV patients, very low CD4 counts, who are in a hospital without suspicion of histo disseminated histoplasmosis. Requesting urine antigen tests for screening purposes vis a vis early diagnosis. Is a screening strategy warranted? Low CD4, no suspicion of disease. We have to answer that question. We already have some initiatives like that going on. We have to try to understand if it's worth it thinking that these patients have a risk, is screen them, and then what we will do with the results. We will treat them preemptively. We will do workup and look, actively look for disease with CT scans, for example. We don't have an answer to this question, not in whom do the screening and then what to do with the screening result. I agree with you, Diego, regarding the screening in asymptomatic people 
There are many different groups while working on that to answer this question. But I would say that in patients who are in a hospital who have symptoms, we should do that. Because what we know is that usually in these patients, 20 to 30 percent are positive. I think that in this setting, we should do this screening. Well, these pulmonary uh, nodules are so common in terms, I'm speaking from, from the radiologist's lens. If we do screening and the CT, there will be nodules, certainly, especially an HIV patient with a low CD4 who's had other infections. So just to... Uh, I'm saying it as a radiologist, there will be a nodule and they are quite common in many nodules. And what we see in them and in a specific, there's a specific case I'd like to tell you. It was a colon neoplasm. They had, uh, the patient had four lung nodules. Uh, four were removed, two were metastasis, two were histoplasmosis. So it's a case and I have it, uh, I'll never forget it because it's very illustrative. We see so many nodules every day in the most, uh, in, in a great variety of clinical spectrum, spectrums. And for us, what is frequent is a nodule, which is maybe, is not calcified and they come to us for another reason reason the nodule sh is shown we 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 schedule biopsy and two or three weeks later the nodule has decreased so it is a very frequent type of situation what i think is that the ct in the context of a positive test could help when there is a more uh, clear disease, a blatant disease, well, like a, a patient with a neoplasm and had metastases. Well, well, anyway, we see it very frequently. Vital, I was here thinking, if we think from the point of view of pathogenesis, most cases, now it says that most patients with HIV need the result of a recent infection and not a reactivation. Some authors even discuss whether there is this. Uh, well, if we think of the pathogenesis, the fungus is disseminating itself. And then you capture this urine antigen. So I think this work is very much justified. It needs to be done, but there's a, it's a huge perspective and the, out, the outcome is very favorable favorable for you to do preemptive treatment. Because if we think about the, patho the pathogenesis, then it justifies it because once it disseminates, you will have a urine antigen. Yes, these cases have happened. We have gone through that. Patients who for one reason or another benefited from this antigen, uh, they, they didn't have a compatible clinical condition, but they had a biomarker at 13 CD4. Where where can you go? I think then the similarity with tryptocosis will, well, that's uh, for the time being, that's the management to be done. Can we close? I will close with one question. Screening is something we think a lot about in Guatemala. And I really think that nowadays in the situation of worldwide mycology, we need to give the labs the main role. The labs must be protagonists. And we de it depends on to what extent uh, the, we have good training if the infectologist is used to very complicated patients, cancer, HIV, they can ask 
for it. But some many times we see doctors in centers in Guatemala who never suspected of histoplasmosis, and it's impossible to diagnose if the lab is not proactive, if we don't think of something reasonable. Unfortunately, well, in the Guatemala series, 20% of the people had opportunistic infections. It means that patients with less than 200 CD4 have an infectious process. Well, I think it's a very serious statement. The lab must be uh, must have a main a, a main role to diagnose these types of patients and design algorithms for diagnosis according to the situation of their professionals and their hospital. That's my personal opinion. Good, good evening, everyone. Shall we go to our cultural activity? Thank you so much for this wonderful panel and all the contributions this afternoon.